Hello, I'm Jennifer Joy, author of The Elizabeth Conspiracy. If you love mysteries and romance, then I hope you'll enjoy this audiobook. Please stay to the very end where you'll get a glimpse inside the process and research that you won't find anywhere else except here on this channel. Happy listening! The Elizabeth Conspiracy, a Pride and Prejudice Variation, Mysteries and Matrimony, written by Jennifer Joy, narrated by Stevie Zimmerman. Chapter 1. Rosings Park, Kent. By what evil plan did birth and circumstance conspire to grant the most beautiful homes in England to the most disagreeable of its inhabitants? Elizabeth Bennet could not fathom a satisfactory answer, but felt the injustice of its prejudice fully as she walked through the loveliest park she ever had occasion to explore. The first blooms of spring promised fragrant blossoms in a tasteful array of colour, in stark contrast to Lady Catherine de Bourgh's gaudy display of wealth in her Rosings home. How different the humble flowers were to the haughty woman and her equally proud nephew, Mr Fitzwilliam Darcy. Elizabeth's shoulders tensed at the mere thought of his name. Lady Catherine had made her disapproval of Elizabeth obvious the first night she had attended with her hosts, the Collinses, at Rosings. Elizabeth's uncles were in trade, and the tainted connection to the working class had lowered her in the great lady's eyes, as she made clear by her probing questions into the Bennet's family life. It had been one month ago now, but Elizabeth remembered the interrogation clearly. "'You do not play or sing? Unthinkable! "'Oh, I assure you the idea is easy to grasp with a little imagination. "'You do not draw, either? How is this possible?' Quite easily, your ladyship. Your mother never took you to London to benefit from the masters. How appalling! What a men to rocks and mountains. I should rather learn from nature than a self-proclaimed master. You were raised without a governess. Five daughters without a governess. I never heard of such a thing. And now you have. I am honoured to be the first lady of your acquaintance to have survived thus far, without the guidance of a governess. What? All five of you are out in society? The younger ones before the elder are married? Very odd. Did such a limited view promote sisterly affection between you and your younger sisters? I rather think not. Why should they be denied society's amusements and the pleasures of youth until the eldest are inclined to marry? Growing defiant with Lady Catherine's list of impertinent questions, of which every answer Elizabeth gave fell short of the grand lady's expectations, Elizabeth's humour rose to her rescue when Lady Catherine inquired of her age. With a saucy smile, she had answered, "'With three younger sisters grown up, your ladyship can hardly expect me to own it.' Lady Catherine had gasped and huffed. Mr. Berg, Lady Catherine's only daughter, had sighed and tapped her fingers against the table in boredom. Mr. Collins, Lady Catherine's rector, and the relative who would eventually inherit Elizabeth's childhood home, had followed Lady Catherine's lead, as he always did, to such a superlative degree, one of the servants had thought he had choked on his cream broth. Only Charlotte, Mrs. Collins, as Elizabeth had to call her in public, had dared to smile, though she had sense enough to do so discreetly, so as not to draw attention to herself. A fortnight after that memorable dinner, Lady Catherine's nephews had arrived at Rosings. Colonel Richard Fitzwilliam was everything agreeable and charming, and Elizabeth enjoyed his company. She could not say the same for Mr Darcy, who seemed determined to dampen any hint of gaiety in the room with his taciturn manners and surly expression. Elizabeth shook her head, stretching her neck from side to side to ease the dull ache forming at the base of her skull. The day was too fine to spoil with unwelcome company, even if they were only in her mind. And so she dismissed Mr Darcy and his pompous aunt with another shake, determined to enjoy the gifts of spring in the beautifully kept park. Sunshine poured through the tree canopy, casting playful shadows over the grass and melting the stiffness in Elizabeth's muscles. A gentle breeze carried the sweet scent of early blooms and the musty earth through the air, reaching out with silky fingers to caress her cheeks 
and lift her bonnet enough to send a chill down her spine. She shivered and grasped the letter she held tightly in her hand, as if her touch could warm her dear eldest sister's words. Jane's last letter, though full of information, meant to be lively about their London relatives with whom she currently resided, lacked her usual spirit. Jane had been in London for three months, and Mr Bingley had not called. Elizabeth felt her sister's heartbreak in the forced cheer covering the pages. Footsteps behind her, hushed by the thick carpet of grass, gave Elizabeth pause. Pressing her eyelids closed, she said a silent prayer that it not be Mr Darcy. He had an uncanny way of interrupting her walks about the grounds. Tucking Jane's letter away and forcing a smile, she turned and was relieved to see Colonel Fitzwilliam. Her smile grew in genuine pleasure. The Colonel grinned widely and in one elegant gesture swept his hat off his head in a melodramatic bow. "'Good day, Miss Bennet. I have been making the tour of the park, as I generally do every year, and intend to close it with a call at the parsonage. Are you going much farther?' "'No, I should have turned in a moment,' Elizabeth answered, eager for a distraction from her weightier thoughts. They walked toward the parsonage, where she was staying with her cousin Mr Collins and Charlotte, "'Do you leave Kent on Saturday?' she asked, desirous for news of Mr Darcy's departure. Over a fortnight in his miserable company was sufficient for Elizabeth. When they met, which was often, Mr Darcy rarely spoke. He had certainly never apologised for his insult to her at the Meryton Assembly six months before, though a gentleman would have seen to it ages ago. Then again, a gentleman never would have looked her in the face as he had and said— she is tolerable, but not handsome enough to tempt me. I am in no humour at present to give consequence to young ladies who are slighted by other men. As if she had not had her pick of gentlemen with whom to dance. Elizabeth had joked about it with her family at Longbourn. It had lessened the sting. But her vanity nursed a well-deserved grudge against Mr Darcy, and the less she saw of him the better. Colonel Fitzwilliam looked at her askance. "'Oh, yes, we shall depart on Saturday, if Darcy does not put it off again. "'I am at his disposal. He arranges the business just as he pleases.' "'Of course he did. "'A man so full of his own importance would take great pleasure in ordering others about, "'although why he should wish to extend his stay at Rosings was a mystery to Elizabeth. "'He did not seem to have a close attachment to his aunt or to Mr. Berg. "'Something in Jane's letter came to mind at the Colonel's mention of business.' Miss Bingley had made it painfully clear that Mr Darcy's sister was intended for Mr Bingley. Miss Darcy's dowry would be far more generous than Jane's. Did Mr Darcy see marriage as nothing more than a convenient business transaction, and would thus separate Mr Bingley from Jane for his own sister? Given Mr Darcy's pride, Elizabeth doubted he would condescend to allow his sister to marry into a family known to have earned their fortune in trade. Oh, the horror! There only being one way to satisfy her curiosity on that particular point, Elizabeth said, I imagine your cousin brought you with him, chiefly for the sake of having somebody at his disposal. I wonder he does not marry, to secure a lasting convenience of that kind. But perhaps his sister does as well for the present, and as she is under his sole care, he may do what he likes with her. I dare say he will have a say in whom she marries. Not so, said Colonel Fitzwilliam. "'I'm joined with him in the guardianship of Miss Darcy.' "'That was not at all the reply she had expected, "'nor had he answered her question. "'But Elizabeth was intrigued and determined. "'Are you indeed? "'Pray, what sort of guardians do you make? "'Does your charge give you much trouble? "'Young ladies of her age are sometimes a little difficult to manage. "'And if she has the true Darcy spirit, "'she may like to have her own way.' "'As she spoke,' She noticed how intently he observed her. "'Why do you say that?' he asked, with a stiff smile. Though he hid it under a guffaw, she heard the alarm in his tone. Convinced she had touched on a sore subject, very near the truth, she said reassuringly, "'Oh, you need not be frightened. I can only base my assumptions on the conduct of my own youngest sisters. I have heard very little of Miss Darcy, other than her being a great favourite with some ladies of my acquaintance.' "'Mrs. Hurst and Miss Bingley. Do you know them?' "'I know them a little. Their brother is a pleasant, gentlemanlike man. 
He's a great friend of Darcy's. Oh, yes, Elizabeth said dryly. Mr Darcy is uncommonly kind to Mr Bingley and takes a prodigious deal of care of him. Colonel Fitzwilliam took her sarcasm kindly, or he chose to ignore it. With a chuckle, he said, Care of him? Yes, I believe you're right. Darcy does take care of him in those points where Bingley most wants care. From something he told me in our journey hither, I have reason to think Bingley very much indebted to him. But I ought to beg his pardon, for I have no right to suppose Bingley was the person meant. It is all conjecture. Now she was getting somewhere. What is it you mean? she asked, sensing that the Colonel's news had some bearing on Jane's current unhappy state. It is a circumstance which Darcy, of course, would not wish to be generally known. If it were to get round to the lady's family, it would be an unpleasant thing. The hair on Elizabeth's arm stood on end. You may depend upon my not mentioning it, she prompted with a small smile, clasping her hands together so the Colonel would not see how they shook. What Darcy told me was merely that he congratulated himself on having lately saved a friend from the inconveniences of a most imprudent marriage. Without mentioning names or any other particulars, I only suspected it to be Bingley, from believing him the kind of young man to get into a scrape of that sort, and from knowing them to have been together the whole of last summer. Elizabeth's stomach twisted, and the wind chilled her to the bone. She folded her arms, one hand over the pocket containing Jane's letter, as if swearing an oath to protect her absent sister's interests. Slowing her breathing and her pace, Elizabeth feigned a disinterested attitude. It was not easily done, not when her whole body trembled in loathing toward one man, Mr. Darcy. Chapter 2 Did Mr. Darcy give you his reasons for this interference? Elizabeth held her breath, "'straining her ears to hear over the buzzing sound vibrating between them. "'I understand there were some very strong objections against the lady.' "'Measuring her breaths against the nausea churning in her stomach, "'Elizabeth asked pointedly, "'And what arts did he use to separate them?' Well, "'He did not talk to me of his own arts,' said Colonel Fitzwilliam. "'He only told me what I have now told you.' "'Elizabeth could not answer without giving herself away.' and so she walked on, her heart swelling with indignation with every step. They passed the grove into a clearing, offering a spectacular view of Lady Catherine's home, the home where Mr Darcy currently resided. What had been impressive bathed in golden sunlight minutes ago was a contrast of blinding light shining off the glass and deep foreboding shadows. Colonel Fitzwilliam looked over at her. "'You are very thoughtful,' She lowered her arms, shaking them at her sides to ease the tension stiffening her limbs. Her gratitude toward the Colonel for revealing Mr Darcy's true character, to know her unflattering assessment of him since their first meeting had been justified, gave her the strength to calm the bite in her tongue and remove her fingernails from her stinging palms before she replied. "'I am thinking of what you have been telling me. I cannot agree with your cousin's actions.' Why was he to be the judge? She flung her arm outward, wishing it were Mr Darcy and not merely the air she struck. You are rather disposed to call his interference officious. I do not see what right Mr Darcy had to decide on the propriety of his friend's inclination, or why he felt himself capable of determining in what manner that friend was to be happy. Her words snapped with rebuke, and Colonel Fitzwilliam looked rather appalled. Taking a deep breath and forcing her shoulders down, she continued in an airier tone. But as we know none of the particulars, it is not fair to condemn him. It is not to be supposed that there was much affection in the case. Oh, how it pained her to admit as much, when her heart had already weighed the evidence and found him condemned. Colonel Fitzwilliam chuckled. <laughs> that is not an unnatural surmise, but it does lessen the honour of my cousin's triumph very sadly. Elizabeth understood his attempt to lighten the conversation, and not trusting herself to continue on the present subject without revealing too much, abruptly changed it until they reached the parsonage, where Colonel Fitzwilliam was received warmly by Charlotte and Mr Collins. The Colonel's call was brief, 
there being little in the way to converse with Mr. Collins and Elizabeth being too disturbed in her own mind to lend her normal liveliness. Maria, Charlotte's younger sister, dedicated herself to smiling prettily, to the exclusion of conversation. Charlotte did her best to soften the ridiculousness in her husband's excessive praise of his esteemed patroness and the improved looks of Mr. Berg. When he sermonised about the finer points of the running of Lady Catherine's household, of which he was clearly an expert, more so even than the great lady's own nephew, the colonel shifted his weight on his chair forward, seeking an opportunity to depart as soon as Mr. Collins gave him leave, or paused for breath. Elizabeth made her way to her room before the front gate shut behind Colonel Fitzwilliam, eager to think without interruption of the evils Mr. Darcy had committed against her most beloved sister, for Elizabeth knew for a certainty there could be no other gentleman in all of Christendom who would allow as much influence over himself as Mr. Bingley did Mr. Darcy. And to think she had credited Miss Bingley with his separation from Jane. She ought to have known a darker force was at work. Had not Mr. Darcy's pride and vanity manifested themselves at their first meeting? She had been given sufficient motive to dislike him then. But, oh, how she despised him now! She could not think his name without the acidic taste of bile stinging her throat. He had ruined every hope of happiness for the most affectionate, generous heart in the world, at least for a while. Elizabeth could not say how lasting the evil he had inflicted would last, but she would not rest until she found some way to undo his work. It would bring her pleasure to lift her sister up from the ashes of despair while watching him fall from the pedestal upon which he placed himself. Charlotte's light knock on her door interrupted Elizabeth's schemes of reuniting Mr Bingley to Jane. "'Lizzie, are you quite well?' Charlotte asked, stepping into the room and closing the door behind her. Elizabeth stopped pacing to sit on her trunk at the end of her bed, Charlotte seating herself by the window opposite her. Too full of vengeful thoughts and the need to act in behalf of Jane, Elizabeth picked at her fingers and fidgeted. "'Lizzie, what is this about? I've never before seen you so agitated.' Charlotte reached forward, setting her hand on Elizabeth's bouncing legs, only to be sent back up when Elizabeth's knee popped against it. Elizabeth was one trembling mess she knew. Even her voice shook as she answered. "'I have heard the worst news.' Jane's letter crinkled in her pocket. "'Oh, how I despise Mr. Darcy!' she exclaimed, Jane's tear-stained cheeks as clear in her mind's eye as if she were in the room with her and Charlotte. Charlotte sat back in her chair like one struck. Raising her hand to her chest, she said, well, "'You cannot mean it, Lizzie. I had rather thought Mr. Darcy preferred you.' Elizabeth scoffed. "'I suppose I am to feel honoured. He and Colonel Fitzwilliam call often at the parsonage. I do not think it is because they enjoy my company in particular, nor that of Maria or Mr. Collins. Elizabeth rolled her eyes. Charlotte's lips pinched in disapproval, but she did not know his great sin. She would soon see reason. Lizzie, appearances are often deceiving. I know Mr. Darcy insulted you, but he's been very attentive of late. You cannot punish him for ever because he offended your vanity. In fact, I would not be surprised if he makes an offer for you. He would not dare. Surely he must know I could never accept him when he has ruined Jane's chances of happiness with Mr. Bingley. Charlotte's jaw dropped. What? she whispered. Elizabeth shared the entirety of her conversation with Colonel Fitzwilliam. Charlotte shook her head slowly from side to side, her mouth still agape. Oh, it must be awful for you to endure being wronged so completely. Were it only me, I could endure it. But Jane is everything good and lovely. The colonel said there were strong objections to the lady. Elizabeth shook her head violently and threw her hands up in the air. I cannot imagine what those objections could be. Her manners are captivating, her mind improved, and her understanding is excellent. I dare Mr. Darcy to find a kinder, more loyal young lady in all of England. 
she would cover over his faults, where he would expose her to the cruelties of disappointed hopes, and he calls himself a gentleman. Being of a practical mind, Charlotte said, I agree that Jane is everything lovely. Perhaps, could Mr Darcy's objection be with other members of your family? Her suggestion gave Elizabeth pause, but she quickly discounted it. I will own that father has some peculiarities, but he possesses abilities which Mr Darcy need not disdain, as well as a respectability he will never reach. Charlotte pinched her lips again. Elizabeth knew her outspokenness sometimes chafed on Charlotte's sensibilities, but he had brought it upon himself when he had interfered with Jane. "'Perhaps not Mr. Bennet,' Charlotte said. "'Mother.' At the thought of her, Elizabeth's confidence gave way a little. Stiffening her shoulders, she said, "'Any gentleman with eyes to see past his own nose would observe that appearances often misrepresent the lady who covers over faults with love and good nature, rising above them with a grace and honour he completely lacks.' Charlotte arched an eyebrow at her. Elizabeth was curious to know her friend's thoughts, but dared not ask, lest she utter anything in the way of a compliment to Mr Darcy's character. Elizabeth could not bear that. With a sigh, Charlotte said, "'We are engaged to drink tea at Rosings this afternoon. "'I cannot go.' Elizabeth squeezed the tense muscles at her neck. Her pulse pounded against her forehead, making her temples ache, and the pressure building behind her eyes unbearable. Charlotte dropped her chin. You put me in a difficult position, but I cannot in good conscience insist you accompany us, knowing what I do. Mr Collins will be apprehensive of displeasing Lady Catherine when she learns you have remained at home. I will do my best, but I expect you will hear about it for days to come. Elizabeth squeezed her friend's hands between her own chilled fingers. You are the best friend I could wish for, Charlotte. Thank you. With a resigned smile, Charlotte said, At least you will not have to hear Mr Collins' excessive praise of every dish, of Mr Berg's improved looks, or the cost of the glazing in front of the house. Elizabeth chortled louder than she needed to, several hot tears escaping. There is that, she said, forcing a smile, and hoping Charlotte would credit her tears to laughter. Her friend knew her better than that. Squeezing her hands, Charlotte stood. I will leave you now, but I shall send the maid up with a tea tray and my bottle of laudanum. I do believe the events of the day have plagued you with a headache which prevents you from attending us to Rosings. Charlotte thought of everything, and Elizabeth was indebted to her for it. She did not care to ever see him again. Leaning against the wall of her room, she sank down to the floor. Hugging her knees, she soaked her skirts with bitterness and anger until she went numb. Chapter 3 Fitzwilliam Darcy planted his feet on the gaudy Turkish rug in his Aunt Catherine's drawing-room, as firmly rooted in place physically as he was in every other sense. Her arguments were for naught. He would never budge. "'You will marry Anne,' Aunt Catherine repeated, raising her head haughtily, her steely grey eyes boring into him. She could glare all she wanted. His mind was made up. His cousin Richard had wisely stayed in the shadows, of which there were many in the room, clearly not wanting to be called upon for his opinion in the matter. It was a good tactical move, one worthy of a colonel in His Majesty's army. Though Anne was the centre of the controversy, she stared off at something only she could see, her arms hanging limply from her sides, Mrs Jenkinson, Anne's companion, comforted her charge, thoughtlessly patting her hand. Anne did not seem to notice. Once Aunt Catherine had begun speaking about their supposed engagement, an agreement Darcy did not recall ever entering, Anne had grown remarkably silent, the louder and more insistent her mother's voice grew. She would be of no help, as usual. Darcy folded his arms over his chest, every muscle in his body tensing, as he lowered his chin to look his aunt directly in the eyes. "'I am not, nor have I ever been, engaged to Anne.' 
A hint of colour burned Aunt Catherine's cheeks. It has been arranged since your birth, she insisted, as she had since Anne had reached her majority several years before. Again, Darcy looked at Anne for any reaction other than boredom, for a sign to show her wishes in the matter. Not that it would change his mind, but as a gentleman he at least had to take her into consideration when it was their future Aunt Catherine wished to arrange. Aside from an exaggerated sigh, Anne gave no indication of speaking for herself or offering to free Darcy of an engagement that never existed. He pinched his lips and exhaled slowly, resenting the time he was forced to waste by repeating himself. If any agreement was made, it was not done by me. I am capable of choosing whom I will marry, and I thank you to allow me to make my own decision. Aunt Catherine stretched taller in her baroque chair, her knuckles turning white as she grasped the top of the cane she used more for show than for her need of it. Her complexion was as pale and controlled as the white hair piled high on her head. The only crack in her cold exterior was the shake in her voice. Anne's health is much improved. The doctor said only yesterday she is fit and fully capable of seeing to the responsibilities of a married lady. She knows her duty and will see it done to your credit. Richard coughed from the shadows. Anne no longer stared off into nothing, but focused her eyes on the hands Mrs Jenkinson patted in her lap. Her face glowed red like the velvet chairs in the dining room. Her nostrils flared, but Darcy held little hope she would inconvenience herself by defying her mother. Aunt Catherine continued. Does she not look well, Darcy? Anne glared at him. No matter how much her health had improved, she was still the most selfish creature he had the duty by relation to know. She could never tempt him. Had she or anyone else in the room known who had the power to tempt him, they would be appalled. It had caught Darcy quite by surprise as well. With Elizabeth Bennet firmly in mind, her lively eyes sparkling with wit, and her petite form rounded in all the right places, he said, "'I will own that Anne does look much improved, "'and I congratulate you for giving her the medical attention "'she deserves to live a fuller life. "'However, I seek more than a match made of obligation, "'and I wish nothing less for my cousin.' "'Aunt Catherine exhaled impatiently, "'a derisive snort escaping her. "'I never would have dreamed "'that my sister's child could be so selfish. "'The grounds are manicured, "'the menus are made, the sermon is written.' "'And Anne's dress is ready. "'Had I not believed you to be a gentleman of your word, "'I never would have made such extensive preparations.' "'He refused to feel guilty. "'Any preparations you made were your own doing. "'I have never given you reason to hope I would one day marry Anne. "'I have given no encouragement.' "'He widened his stance and tightened his arms over his chest. "'Who did she think she was?' to attempt to influence him contrary to his wishes. He was not Bingley, who did not trust his mind enough to decide his future without the assistance of his friends. Darcy knew his mind. He knew what he wanted, whom he wanted. And it was not Anne. He had already delayed his and Richard's departure from Rosings to allow him more time with Miss Elizabeth. His calls at the parsonage and her calls at Rosings had convinced him of her keen intellect and superior mind. Contrary to the view he had voiced months earlier to Bingley, her beauty had grown on him. Her humorous impertinence had blossomed in his mind into witty independence, a trait so opposite to the characteristics encouraged in Anne by Aunt Catherine, who presently rose from her throne-like chair. Aunt Catherine narrowed her eyes, examining him from the top of his curly hair, to the tips of his polished hessian boots. When she had done, she sat in her chair calmly, sending shivers up and down Darcy's stiff spine. She would not make it easy for him to go against her. "'What has brought about this change, I wonder?' She thrummed her pointy fingernails against her chin, her eyes never wavering from his person. Darcy held still, knowing that any movement would be interpreted as a weakness. There has been no change, as I never agreed to the arrangement. 
You would dash your cousin's hopes. Anne has never given me reason to believe her hopes lie with me. He looked at her again. A word, a reaction, anything would be a welcome contribution to his argument. Anne rose, clutching Mrs Jenkinson to her side, as if too weak to stand on her own. In a voice barely above a whisper, she said, Please excuse me, mother. If we are to receive company for tea, I must rest. She brushed past Darcy, bobbing a feeble curtsy, a smirk twisting her face at her ability to use her sickness to her advantage. She received no opposition from her mother, who was too set on her own purpose to bother with the manipulations of her daughter. Anne's wake stirred the tension in the room, mixing it with her unpleasant aroma of herbs and camphor. Aunt Catherine heaved herself out of her chair, stabbing the carpet with her cane, as she closed the space separating her and Darcy. She stood closely enough, he could count the lines she attempted to conceal with powder on her face. You do realise what you stand again by marrying Anne? All of this, she said, as she spread her hands out and waved them over the room, would be yours, along with her sizeable dowry. You would become one of the wealthiest men in England, with properties to add to your coffers. Imagine the influence you stand to gain amongst your peers, with such wealth to add to the prestigious name of Darcy. To her, marriage was nothing more than a business negotiation. His hands tightened into fists, and he struggled to control his breath. I am not in need of money or property. Undeterred, Aunt Catherine said, And what of Georgiana? You have denied her the influence of female companionship for far too long. Have you no care for her future? Darcy saw Richard stiffen out of the corner of his eye. His own exhaled breath shook, but he was proud of how even his voice sounded. There is no one in the world more important to me than Georgiana. Whomever I marry, as you have pointed out, will exercise influence over her, and I intend to make certain it is to her advantage. Anne has known Georgiana since birth. There is no one more qualified to see to the needs of your sister. Richard and I will be the judge of that. Now, if our interview has come to an end, I should like to change out of my riding clothes into something more suitable for our guests. He stood face to face with Aunt Catherine, neither of them willing to budge nor admit defeat. Richard moved to join him, giving Aunt Catherine an excuse to harumph as she walked regally back to her chair. Like a queen barking orders, she said, I expect my nephews to reflect well on me amongst my guests this afternoon. I will not allow for us to be reduced to a source of mockery to a certain ungracious young lady who delights in poking fun at her superiors. That would be Elizabeth. Darcy bowed, concealing his grin, until he and Richard had left the room. He was decided. In two days more, he would depart from Aunt Catherine's company. He would delay his stay no longer. Today, at tea, he would request a private audience with Elizabeth on the morrow, before departing for London, to make the necessary legal and household arrangements for the new Mrs Darcy, at which point his aunt would no longer allow for him to set foot on the grounds, let alone cross her threshold. Chapter 4 Darcy stood as their guests arrived, shifting his weight from side to side and wiping his palms against his breeches. Why was he nervous? Any young lady would be honoured to receive his attention. He took a deep breath, and lifted his chin, a posture he knew showed him to advantage without being overtly vain. Mr Collins entered first, his face glowing with the ruddy shade, flattery and self-importance lent to his complexion. Following closely behind him was his wife. Darcy knew Mrs Collins to be a great friend of Elizabeth's, though he could not account for it when their natures were so distinct from each other. Mrs Collins was practical to the exclusion of initiative, while Elizabeth had rejected the security a marriage of convenience to Mr Collins would have offered her and her family as the inheritor of her father's entailed estate. Not a common reaction from a young lady with an uncertain future, but one to be admired all the same. 
had she hoped Darcy would offer for her? Looking at Mr Collins as he fawned over Aunt Catherine and Anne, Darcy had to agree Elizabeth had chosen wisely, although the clergyman had, on a couple of occasions, attempted to make his cousin regret what she had lost by refusing his offer. It was poorly done, his wife being present to hear it in front of her sister, Miss Lucas, as well as himself and Richard. To Mrs Collins' credit, she had smoothed over his inappropriate comments with an offer of tea and a change in the subject of their conversation. If she had held any illusions of a happy marriage, she did not seem to regret their loss. Miss Lucas came in last, and the butler closed the door behind her. Darcy's eyes searched the room, knowing himself incapable of missing Elizabeth's entry, when his sole purpose in attending his aunt's tea was to request a private audience with her. He bided his time impatiently. Aunt Catherine would consider her absence as a personal snub against the house de Burg. She would ask. Darcy was not disappointed. "'Where is Miss Elizabeth?' she asked. Their guests, not having been given leave to sit yet, stood before Aunt Catherine, clutching their hands and bowing and curtsying uncomfortably. Mrs Collins nodded her head in a supportive gesture to her husband, who for the first time in Darcy's memory seemed to suffer from a lack of an expansive explanation. Mr Collins bowed deeper before Aunt Catherine, his corset squeaking in protest. My deepest apologies, uh, your ladyship and Mr. Berg. Uh, my cousin is unable to attend to us this evening, as she is suffering from a headache. Her affliction is common among delicate ladies, and I pray she recovers so she may benefit from the influence of your superior company. Elizabeth Delicate. Darcy had much to learn of her, but was confident Elizabeth's health was no more delicate than Mr. Collins. Aunt Catherine harumphed. Her upbringing has put her at such a great disadvantage. I wonder if she recognises the value of a close association with a family firmly established in the first circles. Darcy had no patience for a discourse on the advantages of rank in society. The words he had been practising in his mind to say to Elizabeth demanded a voice, or he would burst. Muttering his apologies, he departed from the room, leaving shocked stares and gaping mouths behind him. They need not have been so astounded. He would have had little to share in their conversation, and they soon would have forgotten his presence entirely between Aunt Catherine's imposing counsel on how better to run their household in accord with her standards, Mr Collins' empty compliments, and Richard's pleasing charm. Crossing the dark antechamber, Darcy declined the butler's offer to send for his greatcoat when it became apparent that Darcy was going out of doors. Intent in his purpose, he walked across the great lawn in the direction of Huntsford Parsonage. The late afternoon sun shone through the trees, inspiring him with hope. Elizabeth was everything enlightened and happy. She would be a worthy match for him and a good influence on Georgiana. He arrived short-winded, only considering that he should have waited to knock until he had caught his breath when the maid answered the door. What a sight he must have been, his skin damp and his breath coming out in puffs. She did not deny him entry when he inquired about Miss Elizabeth, instead scurrying about her activities to disguise the shock his call at such an hour and on an unmarried lady he knew to be unattended would naturally cause. Undeterred, for all would be well once their engagement was announced, Darcy entered the parlour. He saw Elizabeth sitting in front of the window with a book beside her, the last of the afternoon's rays glowing softly around her. He had not believed himself capable of the tender emotion she stirred within his breast. Tendrils of mahogany curls framed the features he had grown to cherish, from her wide forehead and fine eyes to her curvy lips and pointed chin. She stood when she saw him, raising one hand to her temple and clutching her novel to her chest with the other. "'Are you well from your headache?' he asked, recalling Mr Collins' excuse for her absence. He ought to have known only an illness would keep her from him. She did not look at him when she replied, "'I am well enough, thank you, Mr Darcy,' in a clipped tone, 
suggesting she was not completely recovered. He did not wish for her to remain standing, and yet she neglected to offer him a seat, an oversight caused by her headache, no doubt. He sat down, and was content to see her follow suit. When she made no indication of engaging him in conversation, his limbs grew too restless to remain in one attitude. He paced in front of the chimney, his heart pounding in his chest, the words he had practised in his mind, refusing to pass his tongue, though he opened his mouth several times to speak. His palms, slick with sweat, betrayed his nerves in a way he had never before been unable to control. Taking a deep breath and straightening his shoulders, for he was certain of her reply, he began, In vain I have struggled. It will not do. My feelings will not be repressed. He had her attention now. He had known she would appreciate heartfelt honesty above poetry for such a momentous declaration. With her brown eyes searching his, infusing him with courage, he said, You must allow me to tell you how ardently I admire and love you. He paused to calm his heart and gather his thoughts. She remained speechless, and it occurred to him that perhaps she required an explanation. The blush covering her cheeks was sufficient encouragement for him to continue. It is many months now, almost since our first meeting, that I have admired you. It had been during her stay at Netherfield Park when he had first felt his heart was in danger. He had looked forward to her conversation, and her attentiveness to her ill sister had won his admiration. Elizabeth's gaze remained fixed on the floor, but he saw her brows furrow. Did she believe herself unworthy? He could reassure her on that point. Despite the differences in our positions in society, the inferiority of your birth, the indifference of your father, the vulgarity of your mother, and the mockery of all things proper by your younger sisters, I am willing to overlook all of this, because I recognise in you a lady who has risen above her circumstances, who has used the adversities presented to her as an opportunity to improve. They were well matched in that regard. Just like himself, she would excel in any endeavour to which she put her mind. He complimented her freely, and yet she still did not look at him. Had he overwhelmed her with his declaration? He imagined she kept her face down to disguise her tears of joy. Finally she spoke. Her voice was not clouded by tears as he had supposed. In such cases as this, it is, I believe, the established mode to express a sense of obligation for the sentiments expressed, however unequally they may be returned. Darcy froze, the smile he wore feeling foolish now. Surely he misunderstood her. She continued, If I could feel gratitude, I would now thank you, but I cannot. His stomach sank to his toes, and he leaned against the mantelpiece, his eyes riveted on her in disbelief. When Elizabeth finally looked up at him to speak, her eyes were bright and her words snappy. I have never desired your good opinion, and you have certainly bestowed it most unwillingly. I am sorry to have occasioned pain to anyone. It has been most unconsciously done, and I hope will be of short duration. The feelings which, you tell me, have long prevented the acknowledgement of your regard can have little difficulty in overcoming it after this explanation. Darcy's breath caught in his throat. She rejected him. Her reply left no room for doubt, and yet Darcy found it difficult to accept. He pinched his lips together, not trusting himself to speak a word, until he had gained some measure of understanding and composure. She would repulse his offer, without so much as an explanation, when she ought to be flattered. She could not, by her own admission, even express gratitude for the honour bestowed upon her. He clenched his hands at his side. Elizabeth, the only lady he had opened his heart to in a declaration, had rejected his offer so coldly, the only warmth in the room was the anger rising within him. Chapter 5 Forcing a calm Darcy did not feel, he said, And this is all the reply which I am to have the honour of expecting. I wish to be informed why, with so little endeavour at civility, I am thus rejected. But it is of small importance. He shrugged. 
he would not allow her rejection to pain him, any more than his father's constant indifference had. He was Fitzwilliam Darcy, an expert at concealing emotion. He was only ashamed he had been so mistaken in Elizabeth to expose his weakness. She stood, the familiar scent of her rosewater filling him with bitterness. This rose had thorns, but he did not back down. He stood like a wall before her, ready for the attack. And it came. I might as well inquire why, with so evident a design of offending and insulting me, you chose to tell me that you liked me against your will, against your reason, and even against your character. If I was uncivil, is that not some excuse for incivility? But I have other provocations. You know I have. Her flushed cheeks and fiery eyes added fury to her accusation. If he knew of other provocations, did she believe him stupid enough to propose before addressing them? He had in every way acted like a perfect gentleman in her company. She continued. Had not my own feelings decided against you? Had they been indifferent, or had they even been favourable? Do you think any consideration would tempt me to accept the man who has been the means of ruining, perhaps forever, the happiness of a most beloved sister? Elizabeth spoke of her sister as if she had loved Bingley, which was preposterous. Had Darcy not watched them together? Had he not observed how quiet her demeanour was toward all the gentlemen in the room, including Bingley? And when he had, on occasion, seen a becoming blush on her cheeks, it was more likely to have been caused by the heat in the room than from Bingley's attentions. Miss Bennet had not regarded his friend with any more interest than she had her ridiculous cousin, Mr Collins, with whom she had also danced and smiled. Darcy's silence encouraged Elizabeth to continue, and he listened with one ear on her unjust accusations, while justifying his own conduct in his mind. Her knuckles were white, where she grasped her book like a shield over her heart. But it is not merely this affair on which my dislike is founded. Long before it had taken place, my opinion of you was decided. Your character was unfolded in the recital which I received many months ago from Mr Wickham. She paused, no doubt expecting a reaction. Darcy would not give her the satisfaction of one, not for a lowly scoundrel such as Wickham. She pressed. What can you have to say in your defence, Mr Darcy? In what imaginary act of friendship can you defend yourself, or under what misrepresentation can you impose further on others? Misrepresentation? Impose? Darcy despised disguise of any sort, and he resented the imposition of others in affairs which need not concern them. That Elizabeth Bennet would dare mention Wickham, depicting him as the victim against Darcy's villainous abuse, made his blood boil. You take an eager interest in that gentleman's concerns. Who that knows what his misfortunes have been can help feeling interest in him, she asked defiantly, ignorantly championing a man wholly undeserving of her sympathy and defence. Darcy scoffed. His misfortunes? Yes, his misfortunes have been great indeed. And each of them the consequence of Wickham's own foolish actions and irresponsibility. Elizabeth huffed. And of your infliction, she exclaimed. You have reduced him to his present state of poverty, you have withheld the advantages, which you must know to have been designed for him by your own father. You have deprived him of the best years of his life, of that independence which was no less his due than his desert. All this you have done, and yet you treat his misfortunes with contempt and ridicule. Darcy was not ignorant of Wickham's ability to garner the support of whomever he chose. He had successfully fooled Darcy's own father, who had chosen to believe him over his own son, time and again, despite the proof Darcy offered. But that Elizabeth, the woman he had been foolish enough to trust, chose to give credit to Wickham's slanderous story of woe, and thus believe himself capable of the wrongs of which she accused him, burned his soul. Stepping toward her, he ignored the pull of her closeness, taking comfort in the rigid control he exercised over himself. Nothing she said now could hurt him. His defences were firmly in place, and he knew them to be impenetrable. 
he had only to blame himself for letting his guard down, when experience had taught him to know better. And this is your opinion of me. I thank you for explaining it fully. My faults, according to this calculation, are heavy indeed. But perhaps these offences might have been overlooked, had not your pride been hurt by my honest confession of the scruples that had long prevented my forming any serious design. These bitter accusations might have been suppressed, had I with greater policy concealed my struggles, and flattered you into the belief of my being impelled by unqualified, genuine inclination, by reason, by reflection, by everything, just as Wickham had successfully done. Darcy's stomach twisted in disgust toward the man who had been given every advantage and had thrust it in Darcy's face with derision and mockery. He hated that he had spoken from his heart, only to have his words used against him unfavourably. Perhaps he had not spoken as eloquently as he should have, but he had been honest, unlike Wickham. Continuing, he said, "'Disguise of every sort is my abhorrence, nor am I ashamed of the feelings I related. They were natural and just. Could you expect me to rejoice in the inferiority of your connections, to congratulate myself on the hope of relations whose condition in life is so decidedly beneath my own?' Did she not recognise what he was willing to give up and endure for her? Why should she punish him for speaking the truth? Elizabeth's eyes shot daggers at him, and her voice cracked like a rifle. You are mistaken, Mr Darcy, if you suppose the mode of your declaration affected me in any other way than as it spared me the concern which I might have felt in refusing you had you behaved in a more gentlemanlike manner. Her words struck him to the core, he was nothing if not a gentleman. She continued, and Darcy heard through the fracture in his carefully placed armour. You could not have made me the offer of your hand in any possible way that would tempt me to accept it. From the very beginning, from the first moment, I may almost say, of my acquaintance with you, your manners, impressing me with the fullest belief of your arrogance, your conceit, and your selfish disdain of the feelings of others— were such as to form the groundwork of disapprobation, on which succeeding events had built so immovable a dislike. I had not known you a month before I felt you were the last man in the world whom I could ever be prevailed on to marry. Her chest heaved violently with the emotion she let loose on him. In Darcy's mind, his voice trembled as badly as she had shaken everything on which he based his confidence. Nonetheless, his training did him credit. A cold, detached tone he would sooner credit to a stranger than to himself, said, "'You have said quite enough, madam. I perfectly comprehend your feelings, and have now only to be ashamed of what my own have been. Forgive me for having taken up so much of your time, and accept my best wishes for your health and happiness.' He had meant to have the last word, and leave with his dignity intact. He had not meant to apologise, nor express any remorse in his feelings toward her. He had been reprimanded in the worst way for his honesty and vilified by a man unworthy of Elizabeth's friendship. He let himself out, walking past the wide-eyed maid, with no destination in mind. Chapter 6 Darcy walked until he had to rub his arms against the cold night air. It was with blessed relief that he heard his aunt's carriage rumble down her gravel drive toward Huntsford Parsonage, conveying her callers away from Rosings. Not wishing to see or be seen by anybody, he made his way quietly across the entrance hall and up the carpeted stairs to his Uncle Lewis's study. It was a room that had been left alone since his death ten years before, and it still contained the best stash of brandy in the house. Richard was already there, sitting in front of the fireplace with a glass in his hand. He greeted Darcy. "'Where in the devil did you run off to?' Darcy stood in front of the fire, holding his hands out to soak in its warmth. "'Nowhere in particular,' he answered, rubbing his chest and turning. And "'From the looks of you, you would have been better off staying with our aunt's guests.' Darcy could not bring himself to agree with his cousin, although Richard was correct in his assumption. The thought of her refusal warmed him more than the drink Richard offered. How dare she misunderstand him so completely! And to believe Wickham's word over his own— she could not have insulted him more thoroughly. She had called his conduct 
ungentlemanly. Richard watched Darcy through narrowed eyes, inspecting him as closely as he did a horse for auction at Tattersall's. Darcy did not care for his scrutiny, so he turned toward the fire, his stiff fingers now wrapped more comfortably around his glass. "'I do not suppose you've chanced upon Miss Elizabeth?' Richard asked. A storm rose in Darcy's chest at the mention of her. He cast his bothersome cousin a glare over his shoulder. "'Why do you ask?' Try as he might, he could not return her hatred as vehemently as she had bestowed it upon him. That she did not understand his character, that she chose to believe the worst of him, had struck him harder than any blow. His buffoon of a cousin struggled not to smile as he watched Darcy's discomfort. Darcy could never tell him where he had gone and what he had done, or he would never hear the end of it. No reason, Richard said, rubbing his chin. Miss Elizabeth enjoys long walks in the park, and I thought she would wish to take in the fresh air before nightfall to ease her headache. I only thought it very likely your paths should naturally cross. Darcy fell silent, and his limbs went numb. What had he done? If it became known he had called on Miss Elizabeth unattended, the consequences would be disastrous. He squeezed his eyes shut, and kept his back to Richard. The last time he had felt like such a fool... Wickham had nearly managed to elope with Georgiana. Fortunately, Richard did not press for conversation. Unfortunately, he seemed content to hear himself postulate on Elizabeth's finer qualities. Miss Elizabeth would be quite the catch for any man. You try it then, thought Darcy ungraciously. Richard continued. Aside from her amicable humour, I find her conversation engaging and her manners pleasant. Her rebuke of Darcy's character had been so thorough, he had difficulty remembering her smile. Richard did not know when to stop extolling the virtues of the last lady in the world of whom Darcy wished to hear. He continued, Aunt Catherine's inability to intimidate her speaks well of how she would manage in high society. If Richard thought she was such an exemplary lady, he could have her. Perhaps Miss Elizabeth would spare Richard's pride when she refused his offer too. What did she seek? What could another gentleman offer that he could not? When Darcy said nothing, Richard continued. I hope you do not mind, but I took advantage of the opportunity to make her aware of your finer points when I saw her earlier today. Darcy scoffed. According to her, he had no redeeming qualities. What did you say? he asked, suspecting she had twisted Richard's compliments into faults. I gave her food for thought, and given how pensive she became upon my revealing your kind act toward a good friend, I have no doubt she will draw a favourable conclusion. Darcy's stomach sank. His heart vibrated in his ears. What did you tell her? I didn't mention names outright, but I suggested how you used your influence over Bingley to separate him from an unworthy lady with too many objections against her, thus saving him from an uneven match and a life of unhappiness. Clearly pleased with himself, Richard's smile quickly turned to consternation when Darcy groaned. I wish you had not interfered on my behalf. I assure you the lady does not think well of me. Her name, which he had pronounced tenderly to himself numerous times before now, refused to pass his lips. Richard blustered. Nonsense! She would be very fortunate indeed to win the heart of a man such as yourself, as you would be to win her. You may consider it an interference, but you will soon thank me for it. The irony of the situation struck Darcy a bittersweet blow. It was his own resentment of Aunt Catherine's interference that had carried him with a purpose to Huntsford Parsonage, and now his meddling cousin had it in his mind to match him with the one lady who would not have him, due in large part, to his interference in her beloved sister's future hopes. A new sensation made him shift his weight from one foot to the other, as his justifications tottered without the conviction he had given them before. Had he been wrong to give his opinion when Bingley had asked it of him? No, surely not. How was he to know Bingley would give more weight to Darcy's counsel than to his own? Only Darcy had known Bingley was not as decisive as he needed to be in matters of the heart. Darcy had known his gullible friend would trust his judgment 
and act in accord with his opinion. Darcy had known what would happen, and had given little thought as to how it would affect Miss Bennet, believing her indifferent. Had he been wrong to interfere? He felt uncertain, and he quickly decided to stifle the unpleasant emotion with action. Setting his empty glass on the table beside the decanter, he said, "'We leave on Saturday, as planned.' That gave him two days. Two days to prove her wrong about his character, clear his name, and leave with his head held high for London. Richard inspected him again. "'You have no reason to delay our stay further?' Since you were so gracious to speak well of me to the Collins guest, I require your assistance. She is under the mistaken assumption I have dealt treacherously with Wickham. Richard bolted out of his seat, reaching for a sword he did not wear. That devil! His smooth tongue has convinced others more acquainted with you of the wrongs he claims against you. It's no wonder he got to her when his manners give a more favourable impression than you apparently gave her. What do you mean by that? Darcy snapped. Exactly what I said. You cannot be bothered to please everyone, and you care not what society thinks of you. You've always been that way. Darcy had never seen this as a fault before, but she had. And why would I care what others think of me? He grumbled. He wished he cared not of her opinion of him, but he did. Too much so. Richard smacked him on the back. I do not mean to criticise, only to explain why a lady such as Miss Elizabeth would have a more favourable impression of Wickham than of you. However, she possesses a keen intellect, and will soon see who the true gentleman is. Darcy winced. Gentleman. He could not allow her to continue to think his actions ungentlemanly. His pride demanded she see her error. Collecting his thoughts, and ignoring the unpleasant emotions tormenting him, Darcy focused on Richard. Wickham is stationed at Meryton, and I have reason to believe he might exercise an unwholesome influence over her sisters. I feel it my duty to reveal to her the truth of his dealings, so she might warn her father in a way in which I am incapable, without causing offence or exposing my sister needlessly. You trust Miss Elizabeth's discretion? Darcy nodded reluctantly. After the verbal thrashing she had bestowed upon him, he could not openly compliment her. Richard nodded his agreement. What do you want me to do? Will you attest to the veracity of my account? She will believe you where she may not wish to believe me. Richard squeezed his shoulder, looking him in the eyes with a mixture of pity and determination. Darcy fully expected him to ask the question. He could not answer with a lie. Yes, he loved her, though for the life of him he did not know why. That will be easy enough answered Richard, furling his brow and visibly weighing his words. What? asked Darcy. It is nothing you will not find out soon enough, Richard said, adding boisterously, I will not allow that scoundrel to sully your name when your dealings with him have been nothing but honourable. Were it not for your interference, I would have run him through with my sword after what he attempted with Georgie. I will not allow him to interfere with the happiness of my favourite cousin. Would he had not interfered? Darcy did not trust himself to speak, so he squeezed his cousin's shoulder and departed from the room. He had a letter to write. Chapter 7 The words poured off the tip of Darcy's quill as he relived the pain all over again in an attempt to make her understand, without telling her directly, that no matter how hard he had tried to garner the approval of his father, he had always preferred Wickham with his ability to say precisely the correct thing, whether he meant it or not. It had not taken long for Darcy to learn the hurt was bearable when he ceased to care. He had been content until the day she had called him on it. She had refused him when he had asked her for a dance, showing him in her refusal that his words had affected her, that she did indeed care. And for the first time in a long while, Darcy had cared too. When she had shown up with a muddy hem to nurse her sister at Netherfield Park, his admiration grew until she had filled his every sense. He could not walk by a rose without thinking of her and the smell of her rose water. He imagined the feel of her hair as he traced his fingers down the satin curtains in his bedchamber. Her lively laughter, 
intoxicating in its sincerity, fueled his hope enough to convince himself that her inclination ran deeper than their verbal debates and common interests. Even as he penned the words, he had little hope it would change her mind about him. But it was that tiny spark, a burning ember which would not be crushed, that spurred him on. At least he would defend himself against her unjust claims. It pained him to do so, but he acknowledged his role in separating Bingley from Miss Bennet. As difficult as it was to open old familial wounds, he found it infinitely harder to accept he may have acted incorrectly, that his interference was not that of a gentleman looking out for the best interests of his friend, but of an intrusive cad interfering in the happiness of a couple who may have been in love. He remained unconvinced of Miss Bennet's feelings toward Bingley, as well as Bingley's, for allowing himself to be so easily separated from her. But he could not account for the guilt he felt, had his actions been in the right. He sealed the letter and readied himself for bed. Doubt unsettled him, and no matter how many times he tossed and turned, he could not sleep until he rose to write another letter. Elizabeth sat stunned on the window seat in the parlour until the sun went down, and the chill reaching through the cracks around the glass seeped into her bones. And still she felt too numb to move, until she heard the carriage conveying the Collinses and Maria home. She wiped her cheeks, pressing her cold hands against her hot eyes, and made her way to her room before she was seen. She could not erase from her mind the shock on his face, as she had completely and irrevocably refused him. He had deserved every criticism, and given his stunned expression before his injured pride turned to anger, Elizabeth was certain he had never in his lifetime had his flaws so plainly pointed out to him. What a hypocrite! Did he not realise that if he was willing to overlook the same complaints he presented to her in his condescending proposal, perhaps Mr Bingley might have done the same? She bawled her fists and threw herself on top of her bed, burying her face in her pillow, as another stream of hot tears stung her eyes and choked her throat. The shuffling steps downstairs echoed in her head painfully loud, and the flame of her candle burned too brightly, so that she snuffed it out. The pressure in her head grew so unbearable, she squeezed her temples between her hands for some relief. She groaned when someone knocked on the door, and she groaned again when the door squeaked open, and Charlotte said her name aloud. Elizabeth felt Charlotte's cool hands against her forehead. Lizzie, do you wish for me to call for the apothecary? You are unwell. Elizabeth shook her head, her vision bursting with fireworks. Have you taken the laudanum? Charlotte asked. Thoughts hurt, but shaking her head hurt worse. No, she whispered. Elizabeth cracked her eyes open, and she saw Charlotte set her candle down on the bedside table. I do not see the bottle. Where is it, Lizzie? Elizabeth stirred, but Charlotte pressed her down. Do not move. You are unwell, she said in a soft voice. Through the lightning storm in her head, Elizabeth had one coherent thought. Pocket, she whispered, praying she had been loud enough, for she could not bear the sound of her own voice, like a trumpet call trapped between her ears. Charlotte went over to the dresser, where Elizabeth's reticule lay, and pulled out the bottle. "'I'll have Molly make a tea immediately. I have some news, but you are in no condition to hear it until the morning.' Elizabeth was not even curious. The ache in her head consumed her. The beverage was bitter, but it dulled her misery. Elizabeth did not remember much else of the night, but when she awoke the following morning and splashed her face with water, the fog in her mind cleared, and she saw the pained look in his eyes again. Darcy slid the letter which would correct all the faults she had enumerated against him, save one, into his pocket. He could not explain his influence over Bingley, nor justify his interference. All he could do was own the role he had played in their separation, which he did honestly, and hope Bingley would receive his letter and act in accordance with his own feelings. He glanced at the window before departing from his room. The rising sun pushed against the morning fog rising off the lawns, powerful in its determination to clear away the last vestiges of winter. 
Darcy did not know where she would choose to walk in the park, but he had no doubt she would choose the paths he was not known to frequent. It bruised his pride to think it, but he knew it to be true. At least he would have done everything possible to clear his name, and with the help of Richard, he had no reason to doubt she would come to a more favourable opinion of him. He closed the door of his bedchamber, taking care to step lightly and make little noise. He had one purpose. Give her the letter, clear his name, allow her time to confirm his side of the story with Richard, and leave on the morrow for London, where the distance would enable him to see the situation objectively, without the muddle of emotion to cloud his judgment, or the sight of her to remind him of how foolish he had been to care, to love. Having reached the bottom of the stairs without interruption, Darcy's heart leapt into his throat when Richard's burly voice said behind him, "'Where are you going?' His question echoed in the entrance hall. Darcy turned, glaring openly at his loud cousin, and held his finger up to his lips to prevent any further outbursts. Reaching into his pocket, he held up the letter and pointed to the door leading out of doors. He would not be deterred from his goal. He would walk the entire park in his search of her, if need be, but he would deliver his letter that morning. Richard joined him at the bottom of the steps. You need not trouble yourself, Darcy. She will be here shortly. Darcy forgot to be quiet. What? he asked. Surely Richard spoke of someone other than Miss Elizabeth. He could not imagine a circumstance where she would be willing to call at Rosings while he dwelt under its roof. And maybe I should have told you last night, but you were so agitated. You told me what? Miss Bennet is to stay here at Rosings as Anne's guest. Richard smiled, obviously pleased with the arrangement. Darcy felt as if the wind had been knocked out of his lungs. Richard smacked him on the shoulder, sending him forward. Is it not perfect? I know you like her a good deal more than you have ever allowed yourself to like anyone. We will clear your name against Wickham, and you will have the opportunity to show her what a fine man you are. Maybe we can extend our stay until Miss Bennet returns to London, at which point it would only be natural and convenient for all involved to offer her the use of your carriage to convey her safely to town. He wiggled his eyebrows and openly schemed, with no idea how miserable Darcy felt. By what cruel plan did fate and circumstance conspire to force her company on him? By what unjust turn of events had she agreed to come to Rosings? Did she plan to gloat on his failure or use it against him? Darcy clutched his stomach. If she sought to use his misstep to advantage, she would be sorely disappointed. Perhaps it was better he had not given her the letter after all. He tucked it back into his pocket, determined to throw it into the fire. Only she could not have agreed to it. She had not been present at the tea. By now, Richard had gone from extending their stay at Rosings and an agreeable coach ride to London to a proposal she was sure to accept by the time she departed for her home at Longbourn. Darcy was in no hurry to repeat the offer that had been so disgusting to her. Interrupting Richard, he asked, "'How did this come about? Aunt Catherine has made her disapproval of her clear since the first night she dined at Rosings, and gloated in the retelling of it. "'It was Anne's doing. When she heard of Miss Bennet's headache, she suggested that the parsonage was too stuffy for her, and since it would not do to have her return home ill, she offered for her to stay here, out of the goodness of her pure, unselfish, disinterested heart. The sarcasm in Richard's tone was not lost on Darcy. Anne never did anything for anybody unless she stood to gain from it. What is she up to? Darcy asked. Richard shook his head. I know not, but so long as we are here to check Anne, we can turn her plan to our favour. Darcy doubted that. How did she get Aunt Catherine to agree to it? If he could appeal to his aunt discreetly, he might get her to change her mind. That was a clever piece of work, really. Anne used Aunt's desire to impose upon others by mentioning how one as neglected as Miss Bennet stood to benefit from a closer association with them. And Mr Collins, on seeing an opportunity to further his intimacy with his esteemed patroness through his cousin, encouraged the idea 
expounding on the many disadvantages of Miss Bennet's upbringing, until our dear condescending aunt was moved to see Miss Bennet as a most unfortunate creature, in need of her wholesome influence and charitable guidance. She would have no choice but to accept the invitation. Darcy closed his eyes and tried not to pity her, while at the same time drawing gleefully wicked comfort that she would be every bit as miserable as he during her stay at Rosings. Saturday was only one day away. He could stay out of her way for one day. Chapter 8 Elizabeth read Jane's cheerless letter four times before she could put him out of her mind. The haughty man was not worth a kind thought, although when she let her defensive guard down an inkling of guilt gnawed at her conscience. She had been, perhaps, overly pointed and direct. Her one consolation was that a man so proud as he would have shrugged off her insults, deemed her unworthy, and moved on. He would marry an heiress, with nothing to do but dedicate herself to living up to his impossibly high expectations. They would be miserable together, an exemplary societal couple. Elizabeth thought to find comfort in his future misery, but she did not. Unsettled, she did not react how she should. Elizabeth decided it best to put him out of her mind entirely. He would leave Rosings Park on the morrow, and she had no reason to believe she would ever see him again. Praise the heavens and all she held dear. Her headache was gone, but a dullness lingered over her senses from the laudanum she had taken the night before. She looked at the liquid in the bottle. Molly had not given her very much. It was nearly full, but it had been enough. Grabbing the bottle with the Meriton apothecary's label stuck to the side, Elizabeth went downstairs to the dining room, where Mr. Collins, Charlotte and Maria sat around the table, breaking their fast. With a nod from Charlotte, Molly placed another setting at the table beside her. "'Are you much improved this morning, Lizzie?' asked Charlotte. Elizabeth set the laudanum on the table and pushed it toward her friend. "'I am, thank you. I do not think I shall need this any more.' Charlotte pushed it back, her eyes flickering over to Mr Collins, who happily spread butter over his roll of bread. "'You may need it again.' Uneasy at Charlotte's manners, but determined that nothing ruin her day, Elizabeth smiled. "'I dare say there is enough laudanum here for me to suffer a fortnight's worth of headaches.' Maria set her fork down and leaned across the table with a sideways glance to ensure Mr Collins was too engrossed in his morning meal to overhear what she wished to say. "'Take care not to drink too much.' She glanced again at Mr Collins and dropped her voice so it was barely audible. "'I read in the newspaper about a lady who took too much laudanum. She never woke up.' Maria sipped from her teacup and nodded solemnly. Elizabeth inwardly applauded Maria for reading the newspaper when most households believed a lady's sensibilities too delicate to read current events. You need not worry about me. I am much improved and shall not require any more. Aside from a dull ache behind her eyes and a numbness at the top of her head, Elizabeth did feel better. Some fresh air and a day without seeing him would put her to rights. She pushed the bottle back toward Charlotte and frowned when Charlotte pushed it back. Mr Collins lowered his butter-coated roll and addressed her. "'It was a pity you could not join us, Cousin Elizabeth. We spent a pleasurable afternoon in her ladyship's company. It will please you to know how well Mr Berg looks. She is a most charming young lady, far superior to the handsomest of her sex. There is that in her features which marks the young woman of distinguished birth.' Charlotte gripped her teacup. Had it been Elizabeth, she would have tossed the contents at Mr Collins. Maria said, Mr Berg is perfectly amiable. Lady Catherine praised their doctor for her improvement. Did you know he brings all of Mr Berg's medicine from London? Mr Collins added, Her ladyship never purchases from the Huntsford apothecary. To Charlotte, he said, I feel it best to follow suit, my dear. You saw how poorly Mr Berg's appearance suffered under his care. I would hate for the same to befall you or anyone else in our household. Charlotte sighed. It must have been difficult to run her household within the strictures placed upon her by her husband, 
who insisted on imitating his patroness. "'If you feel it best,' she said, not taking issue. Charlotte always had yielded to avoid conflict. There were times Elizabeth admired her for it, but more often than not she wished her friend would voice her complaints and improve her situation. For the next quarter of an hour, until Elizabeth could finish the food on her plate and effect her escape out of doors, Mr Collins regaled her with an account of the proportions of Lady Catherine's drawing-room and her generosity to them at the parsonage. With the comparisons he found between the two, one would think he lived in a house as grand as Rosings Park. Elizabeth had been prepared to see him in his glory, but she could not help fancying that in displaying the good proportion of the room, its aspect and its furniture, he addressed himself particularly to her, as if wishing to make her regret what she had lost in refusing him. He could have spared his breath. In his excitement, Mr Collins did not swallow all of his sausage before he added, "'Her ladyship was so kind as to select the furnishings in our humble home "'that her taste is as superior as Mr Berg's countenance.' "'Maria nodded in agreement, "'where Elizabeth's youngest sister Lydia would have rolled her eyes. "'To be certain, Elizabeth felt like rolling her own eyes, "'and was in great danger of doing so "'if Mr Collins mentioned Mr Berg's improved looks one more time. "'My dear,' said Charlotte, "'You forget Lizzie was not present at the tea yesterday. "'She knows nothing of Lady Catherine's invitation, "'nor your encouragement to accept it "'by complimenting the intricacies and efficiencies "'of the de Burgh household and its residents. "'She spoke in a factual tone, "'with no hint of the sarcasm Elizabeth would have employed. "'It had not occurred to Elizabeth "'that Mr Collins had a particular reason "'to praise all things de Burgh. "'Elizabeth reached under the table and squeezed her friend's hand for saving them from a good hour's worth of discourse. There were times when Charlotte reminded Elizabeth so much of Jane, with the way she selflessly looked out for everyone's interests ahead of her own comfort, it made her miss her sister all the more. What she would give to see Jane happy and reunited with the gentleman she loved. "'Of course! How sensible you are, my love!' Mr Collins said to his wife, before turning his attention to Elizabeth, saying, "'We have the best of news!' He rubbed his hands together and tried not to look too pleased with himself. Elizabeth waited, wondering if she was expected to guess what the great news was, when he delayed in its telling. Finally, he said in one breath, "'You have been invited to stay as Mr Berg's personal guest at Rosings. I am certain I do not have to tell you what an honour has been bestowed upon you.' That was all. Elizabeth needed no time to think of a proper reply to the preposterous offer. I will have to thank Mr. Berg for extending her hospitality to me, but I came here as Charlotte's guest. It would be ungrateful for me to accept another's invitation, when the purpose of my visit is to spend time with my dear friend. Surely Mr. Berg would not deny me of Charlotte's company. You cannot refuse her, Mr. Collins squealed. Why ever not? "'Elizabeth asked in astonishment. "'She would never agree to dwell under the same roof as him. "'She shivered at the thought. "'Lady Catherine would take your refusal as a personal affront. "'She's not one to be refused.' "'Like aunt, like nephew,' Elizabeth thought. "'Mr Darcy had survived, and she was certain Lady Catherine would too. "'Aloud, she said, "'I find it odd that Mr Berg would extend her friendship to me, when only one more week remains of my stay in Kent, before I must join Jane in London. As for Lady Catherine, I was under the impression her ladyship did not approve of me. Why should she agree to receive me as a guest in her home? Lady Catherine believes she can use her influence to improve you. She aims to take you under her wing, and thus offer you all the advantages of a young lady in the first circles, Charlotte said, with one eyebrow raised. She knew Elizabeth could not care less about the upper circles. Maria spoke. "'I would love such an opportunity. You must promise to tell us all the details,' she said, masking her disappointment with an overly eager smile. Lady Catherine's attentions would be of much more benefit to a young lady who wished to receive them, a lady like Maria. "'Would not her ladyship prefer Maria?' "'Surely she stands to benefit far more than I do from Lady Catherine's patronage,' 
Elizabeth argued. Mr Collins said through pinched lips, Mr Berg requested your company specifically. We cannot go against her and her ladyship's wishes. I have asked the maid to pack your things so you are ready when her ladyship sends her carriage. Nothing could convince Elizabeth to go to Rosings willingly. She could manage Lady Catherine and her insipid daughter, but he was still there. And if I refuse? Charlotte sighed. You would only provoke the two women who have the most influence over us at the parsonage. You would leave in a week and soon forget them, but we would be reminded of your cut against their household daily. Elizabeth's heart sank to the floorboards. Then I have no choice in the matter, she mumbled. Mr Collins beamed, the ambitious glint returning to his eye now that he saw she would not defy his patroness. You must think of the advantages to be enjoyed by your family in accepting the friendship of a lady so highly respected in society. No doubt he had meant his comment to include her sisters, but it was plain with the way he rubbed his hands together that he planned to gain from the arrangement as well. Elizabeth left the laudanum bottle on the table. If she was to spend the rest of the day in the same household as Mr Darcy, she would need to keep her wits about her. Chapter 9 Darcy watched his aunt's carriage roll up the drive from his bedchamber window. He had not thought she would come. Aunt Catherine made it difficult for anyone to refuse her, but he knew her capable of refusing an offer most young ladies would go to great lengths to secure. She must have another reason for complying with the invitation to Rosings. Footsteps and scuffles up the stairs paused at the top of the landing before continuing down the hall in the opposite direction to Darcy's room. He was grateful they would not be close. She had robbed him of too many nights of sleep as it was. He sighed deeply. It was only one day. If he was careful, he need not see her until it was time to dine. He reached into his pocket and felt the smooth paper of his letter protected inside the lining. He had not been able to burn it, but his doubts about her character prevented him from marching down the hall and presenting it to her without further delay. Why had she agreed to come to Rosings, if not to make him suffer on purpose, or out of interest in her own personal gain? He had been wrong to expect a favourable reply to his offer of marriage. Had he been wrong about her character too? Was she no better than the money-grubbing, social-aspiring, prominent seekers in the town? Richard barged into his room. "'Aunt is in the drawing-room. You should go to her,' he said, adding an urgency to his words by blurting them out before pausing for breath. "'What could she possibly want with me? She ought to be receiving her guest. Only Aunt Catherine would make a recipient of her hospitality feel the weight of privilege of having been invited to Rosings by making her wait to be received in her room.' Richard shrugged his shoulders. Really, he could be quite useless. Annoyed, Darcy brushed past him in an ill humour on his way to see how his aunt further wished to impose on him in the one day remaining of his stay in her home. Darcy trudged down the stairs, the pounding of his boots echoing through the entrance hall, before he entered the dark antechamber leading to aunt's most opulent and thus favourite room. He froze in place, and his breath stuck in his throat, at the sight before him, it was too late to turn on his heel and make a retreat. She was here. Miss Elizabeth stood in the centre of the Turkish rug, while Aunt Catherine walked in a circle around her, her cane in one hand, and an eyeglass inspecting her quarry in the other. Turning her eyeglass on him, Aunt Catherine said, "'Darcy, what are you doing here?' He clenched his fists, instantly angry at his cousin. You did not send for me. How had Richard phrased it? Darcy could not remember the exact words, only the impression Richard had meant for him to understand. Aunt Catherine raised her eyebrows. Why should I when I am receiving a guest? However, since you are here, you can welcome Miss Bennet to Rosings with me. Miss Elizabeth turned to face him, and he bowed. Her chin was set at a defiant angle, and her cheeks had the same high colour he had last seen during his ill-fated call at the parsonage. 
she chewed on the corner of her plump lips. As he rose, his eyes tangled with hers. She was angry and embarrassed. Darcy wanted to double over, feeling as if he had been kicked in the stomach. Why was she here? Why was his aunt determined to treat her so poorly? One thing was crystal clear. Miss Elizabeth did not wish for him to remain in the room any more than he wished to stay. But his legs refused to budge. He could not depart in good conscience. He would be the gentleman, and then he would take his leave. I am certain you have much to discuss. Would you not be more comfortable in your chair, Aunt Catherine? Seeing Aunt Catherine settled on her high-backed throne, he waited for her to signal for Elizabeth to sit. But she did not, leaving Darcy with no other option but to return to Miss Elizabeth and hold out his arm, ashamed at his aunt's indecorous conduct toward her guest. Miss Elizabeth hesitated, but she hovered her hand over his forearm to make certain he understood she did not wish for his assistance as he led her to the settee, perpendicularly placed by his aunt's chair. The hair on his arm stood on end with her fingers so near, reaching for her. If only she had not chosen to believe Wickham over him, she might have rested her hand against his arm. She might have looked up with her warm brown eyes and brightened the room with her smile. He bowed, taking one step away from her and toward the door, saying, I hope you enjoy your stay at Rosings, Miss Bennet. The grounds in the park are second to none. You are not leaving, Aunt Catherine snapped, adding, You must join us unless you have something better to do. Darcy could think of nothing better to do than throttle his cousin for sending him here to witness his aunt's shameful lack of manners. Every glance Elizabeth gave him was full of a menace so strong he could almost feel it striking his cheek. Even now she challenged him, daring him to prove her wrong about her accusations of his character. Aunt Catherine was not helping. What she must think of his family... Aunt Catherine turned her attention to Miss Elizabeth when he sat opposite them. "'Surely you are aware of the great honour of being invited to my home. I have made no secret of my opinion of your faults, but I have decided to overlook the negligence of your parents. It is to be expected with a mother who married above her station that she be ignorant in the ways of the gentle class, raising her offspring without the advantages of a proper gentleman's daughter. However, I am not so unjust as to hold you to account for her error. You are handsome, and if you take my knowledgeable counsel to heart, you will benefit greatly and be in a better position to influence your poor sisters. Darcy gripped the side of his chair. He took no pleasure in his aunt's cutting, condescending remarks toward Miss Elizabeth's family and station. Miss Elizabeth was quick to rise to her mother's defence. I assure you, your ladyship, my mother has always been attentive to my sisters and me. While our drawing or embroidery will never invoke praise, we have never felt neglected. Aunt Catherine replied, How is it possible for your mother to be attentive if you have no accomplishments to recommend you? She looked genuinely astonished, as did Darcy. How could a mother willingly bestow attention on a child who did nothing to earn it? He could call to memory every single approving look from his mother. So few were they. Must love be dependent on one's accomplishments? I dread to think what a cold, meaningless existence such an upbringing would inspire. My mother has faults, as I may point out all people do, but she has always been affectionate, Elizabeth answered. Darcy felt hollow. He knew nothing of the affection of which Miss Elizabeth spoke with confident authority. He had earned high praise from his tutors, but he could not recall having ever earned an embrace from his mother. Aunt Catherine chuckled. Affection! And how has that helped you become an accomplished young lady worthy of your station? You are undeniably a gentleman's daughter, and yet you have none of the basic talents common to a lady. You do not draw. You do not play the instrument very well. By your own admission, you have not benefited from a governess, as far as I have discerned, you have no accomplishments of which to speak at all. Miss Elizabeth smoothed her hands over her skirts, but Darcy saw the tremble in her fingers. She did not deserve this. 
Before he could regret speaking in her defence, he said, Miss Bennet has dedicated her attention to an accomplishment of far greater value than the vain skills of the average lady. She has improved her mind through extensive reading, as encouraged by her own father. She can speak with authority on a variety of subjects, making her contribution to any conversation most valuable. Miss Elizabeth did not look at him, but she had not taken offence at his words. She stared at Aunt Catherine's cane, her lips parted, and a furrow wrinkling her brow. Aunt Catherine scoffed. She voices her opinion very decidedly for one so young. That is not an accomplishment, Darcy. What gentleman amongst our circles would want a wife who would embarrass him at the dinner table? His heart stubbornly answered, I would. Chapter 10 Elizabeth kept her eyes fixed on the top of Lady Catherine's cane, though she was more aware of the space he occupied beyond the gold ornamental knob topping the walking stick. Had Mr Darcy just defended her, and not just defended her, but paid her one of the highest compliments he could have given of her character in front of his snobbish aunt. He had praised her mind. Unwilling as she was to think kindly of him, she avoided his gaze. One amiable comment could not undo the insults he had showered upon her only the day before. No, he had not apologised, and until he did, she had no reason to extend him a favourable thought. Lady Catherine continued. Unequal matches cannot lead to advantageous unions. Not only do they suffer, but their children suffer as well. Miss Bennet is proof of that. Elizabeth's body felt hollow, but she held herself erect. Mother would never be good enough for those born into their rank. She would forever be a tradesman's daughter, who had married better than many believe she had deserved, and they made sure she knew it. They made sure her daughters knew it. They were the reason Elizabeth had cultivated her mind, so she would always be one of the cleverest people in the room. She could defend herself skilfully and with dignity. Something a watercolour painting, the keys of a pianoforte, or the stitches in an embroidery hoop could never do. Mr Darcy surprised Elizabeth by speaking again. For a man a few words, he would soon exhaust his supply unless he took greater care. I would never presume to speak authoritatively on what makes a union advantageous and happy, but I cannot believe a clever mind would be detrimental to it. If anything, it would give the possibility of establishing a common ground on which to base a long-lasting friendship and an eternity of meaningful conversations. Elizabeth held her breath and clamped her mouth shut. He had spoken the words she had long believed in her heart to be true. She was tempted to look at him, but she dared not pull her gaze from where it was fixed. His understanding of a matter so dear to her soul disturbed her greatly. That it was contrary to what she knew of his character made her doubt. And doubt was dangerous when he wielded the power to ruin her and her sister's happiness, a power which he had already abused with his interference with Jane and Mr Bingley. Lady Catherine harumphed and jabbed her cane against the floor. My daughter has taken an interest in you, and so I will undertake to educate you myself to please her. You stand to benefit greatly from our association. Was Elizabeth supposed to thank the great lady for her patronage? Elizabeth could not bring herself to do it. But for Charlotte's sake, she bit the retort on the tip of her tongue. She would endure Lady Catherine and Mr. Berg's superior company and forced education for the benefit of her friend. It was only for one week. She could endure anything for one week. Lady Catherine narrowed her eyes, no doubt displeased that her guest did not regale her with the compliment she expected to hear for her exemplary display of generosity on behalf of a poor, neglected lady. She said, To benefit fully from your time here, I suggest you write to your family to inform them you intend to extend your stay by another six weeks at the least. Elizabeth's cheeks burned. Mr Darcy stood. Aunt Catherine, Miss Bennet is a lady. If you invited her as your guest, I suggest you treat her like one, instead of an object of your charity. Did he believe her incapable of speaking for herself? Elizabeth pursed her lips and breathed in sharply through her nose. 
She could handle Lady Catherine without Mr Darcy's help. Thank you very much. Crossing her arms and raising her chin, Elizabeth lowered her voice and looked evenly into the lady's steely grey eyes. I am to return to London in one week. My family expects me. That is no time at all. Care you nothing for the wishes of a young lady so limited in company? She specifically requested you. Will you deny her? Absolutely, thought Elizabeth. She doubted Mr. Berg rarely suffered from want or disappointment. After one week she would tire of Elizabeth's company and wish her gone. Lady Catherine raised a trembling hand to her temple and shook her head. Mrs. Collins spoke so highly of you before you accepted her invitation to stay at the parsonage. I am very disappointed. A little disappointment never harmed anybody. In fact, it was often referred to by her own father as character building. Lady Catherine peeked at her to see if her act was working. Elizabeth almost laughed. She had too many sisters and a contriving mother at home to fall for that pretty trick. I had thought Mr Collins to have better taste in his choice of a wife. I will have to have a conversation with Mrs Collins about the sort of friends she keeps and pray for her sake she improves upon better association. Elizabeth took a deep breath to calm her pounding heart. It was just as Charlotte had predicted, and Charlotte's predictions were usually right. Elizabeth would not allow her friend to suffer because of her supposed impertinence, not when Elizabeth would never spare another thought toward Rosings and its residence once she left Kent. Mrs Collins can hardly be held accountable for my actions and the expectations of my family. I am certain I can extend my stay for two weeks more without causing inconvenience to my relatives in London and my father at Longbourn. More than two weeks I cannot offer you. That would be three weeks as Mr Berg's guest at Rosings. Only one day in Mr Darcy's company. It would not be easy, but Elizabeth felt confident she could manage. Lady Catherine huffed, but she insisted no further. Mr Darcy stared at her, as if attempting to solve a puzzle. She could have returned the same look to him had she wished it. The man was a puzzle to her too. It was impossible to understand her. Miss Elizabeth had borne Aunt Catherine's insults with dignity, never returning insult for injury, though Darcy knew her capable of insulting in such a manner the recipient of her ire would thank her for the compliment. It was obvious she was not pleased to receive Anne's attention, or that of Aunt Catherine, and yet Darcy was certain she had agreed to extend her stay merely because he had attempted to speak for her, and she would suffer from her own stubbornness. But Darcy could think no less of her for it. He would have done the same. To have a choice taken away from him after it had been suggested he was incapable of making a good decision would have been such a blow to his pride. He would have acted exactly as she had. He ought to have held his tongue. He could have spared her two additional weeks in a household that would only bear her faults and expose her to criticism at every turn. Aunt Catherine and Anne saw her as inferior and nothing would change their opinion. He knew how horrible that felt. She had enumerated his faults so clearly the day before, it had been impossible for him to ignore her claims. That was why he had written a letter, a letter he had yet to deliver. Darcy did not understand Miss Elizabeth's reasons, but he had seen no suggestion of ambition in her manners. If he was correct in his estimation of her character, as he usually was, she sacrificed her own happiness for the benefit of another. Mrs Collins was his guess. A trustworthy trait, indeed, and one worthy of his confidence. He would give her the letter today. Aunt Catherine dismissed them, and Mrs Jenkinson met them in the entrance hall. She appeared to have been waiting for Miss Elizabeth. The letter would have to wait. He could not be seen exchanging correspondence with an unmarried lady without compromising them both. Without losing a step, he bowed toward Mrs Jenkinson and continued across the floor to the stairs. Mrs Jenkinson's threatening tone echoed over the marble. You will not get away with it, miss, she hissed. Chapter 11 Darcy glanced over his shoulder 
one foot poised on the first step, and the other turned toward the two ladies. He listened closely, but Elizabeth did not have the raised voice of one with impaired hearing. He could not hear her reply. Mrs. Jenkinson scowled at her, and that was all the encouragement Darcy needed to intervene. He was halfway across the entrance hall when she must have seen his disapproving glower. Assuming a humble pose, she thought better of continuing her conversation with Miss Elizabeth. Darcy heard the welcome sound of the housekeeper with her clanking keys before he saw her. Mrs. Beaton approached the two ladies with a large smile and eyes trained to miss no detail. "'Miss Elizabeth, if it is agreeable to you, her ladyship has arranged for me to show you around the house and grounds,' she said. It was kind of Mrs. Beaton to give Aunt Catherine the credit for her thoughtfulness. Miss Elizabeth looked grateful that it had been the housekeeper, and not him, who had come to her assistance. If only he could give her his letter. Mrs. Jenkinson took advantage of the opportunity given her to retreat into the drawing-room, while Mrs. Beaton took Miss Elizabeth into her capable hands, giving Darcy a nod as they passed, to signal she was in charge, and all was well. All may be well in the entrance hall, but it would not be well for Richard as soon as Darcy found him. He would strangle the lout. Darcy found the ingrate penning a letter in his bedchamber. "'Aunt Catherine did not send for me,' Darcy said, as he crossed the room and stood by the window near the writing desk, giving Richard his sternest look, the same one he had given Mrs Jenkinson moments ago. Richard grinned. "'I never said she did.' That you assumed so is hardly my fault. How many times had he used the same argument to get out of scrapes when they were growing up? Darcy crossed his arms. You allowed me to believe a lie. You could have corrected me. Richard poured sand over his letter. And allow you to miss an opportunity to see the one lady to make you smile? I think not. Darcy opened his mouth to object, but Richard interrupted him. I saw it with my own eyes, Darcy. Do not attempt to deny it. Unable to contradict the truth of which Richard so painfully reminded him, Darcy said, I wish you would not involve yourself in affairs of no concern to you. He could never tell Richard how deeply he had been cut by that particular lady. Nor could Darcy tell him how the sight of her squeezed his heart and wrenched his gut because he did not know how to stop admiring her. Oh, if only he could stop. If only he had never met her. It was the cruelest punishment he had ever endured to see her and know how she held him in contempt. And yet, he held an inkling of hope. He had no right to it, nor any reason on which to found it. But his mind could not triumph over his obstinate heart. It refused to give up. Richard poured off the sand and folded the letter, standing with a light-hearted laugh. You look like the devil. He clapped Darcy on the shoulder, adding, Believe me, if I did not feel my interference was necessary for your future happiness, I would not bother. But you are my favourite cousin, and my closest friend, and I will see you happy yet. Richard was worse than his own heart, unwilling to listen to reason. He was also a much better friend than Darcy deserved. Glancing at the letter on the table, Darcy said, Promise me not to involve Georgiana. I will not allow her hopes to rise, only to be dashed in disappointment. You know how dearly she wishes for a sister. Guilt consumed Darcy, adding to his wounded pride and making him utterly wretched. As much as he had tried to gain the favour of his parents, he had at least benefited from their presence in his life. Georgiana, on the other hand, had never known their mother, and their father could not look at her without being reminded of the wife he had lost. Darcy blamed himself for her loneliness. He had not known how to give her what she had so desperately needed. He had given her the governess most highly recommended to him, and sent her to the school the daughters of the finest families attended. But he had failed to give her what she most needed, making her vulnerable, and exposing her to Wickham's false promises and empty hopes. Darcy shook his head. Regretting the past would do nothing to change what had happened. All he could do was learn from it, and avoid repeating the same mistake again. Georgiana was safe with their aunt, Lady Matlock. Richard's smile faded. 
I would no sooner disappoint her than I would you. Call me a romantic fool, but I want to see you settled and content. And you are certain Miss Elizabeth is the one to make me happy? Darcy scoffed. Richard chuckled and shook his head. Never before have I known a lady to be so completely suited to you than Miss Bennet. Both of you are so much alike. I must assume that if she can make you happy, then you will make her happy too. Richard looked at him gravely. You must make her happy, Darcy. Shower her with gifts and poetry if you must. Find out what pleases her most and do it every day. Richard made it sound easy. Darcy had thought he knew how to make a young lady, to make her, happy. What did she want that he could not provide? His Pemberley estate was envied by his peers. He had a healthy income and the respect of his tenants. He could give her every comfort a lady could possibly wish for. And she had refused it. She had refused him. His need for her to understand he was innocent of the injustices she believed against him far outweighed the risk he took in sharing the truth with her. He had to give her the letter. It was imperative she read it. Squeezing Richard's shoulder, as bothersome as he was, his heart was bigger than all of Pemberley. Darcy excused himself to search for Elizabeth. Richard shouted after him, "'Go after her, man! Do not rest until you have won her heart!' Stepping into the hall and closing the door to prevent others from hearing Richard's vain cheer, Darcy heard the slow, mournful notes of Mrs Collins practising on Mrs Jenkinson's pianoforte. Mrs Collins had the distinct ability to make any song sound like a dirge. He did not need to peek into the room to know Mrs Jenkinson would be sleeping in the chair by the instrument, lulled into slumber by the melancholy tune. Not much time had passed since he had left Elizabeth with Mrs Beaton, and he had a good idea what Elizabeth would wish to see first. He made his way to the library, knowing it to be her favourite room in any house. It was his too. Miss Lucas read in a monotone, from a tome, while Anne warmed herself in a window seat. Elizabeth was nowhere to be seen. Charging down the corridor, before Anne could ask him why he appeared so agitated, he searched through the ballroom, the portrait room, the billiard room the Baroque suite of rooms Uncle Lewis's ancestors had remodelled to receive Queen Elizabeth. He stopped counting the rooms when he had searched through twenty and walked down the endless halls in the wings of Rosings. Darcy had been certain he would find Elizabeth, but when over an hour had passed and his damp shirt stuck to his back from running the length and breadth of Aunt Catherine's extensive home, he finally found her and Mrs Beaton, when he paused in frustration by one of the many windows adorning the corridors. Completely unaware, he had been frantically searching Rosings. They walked tranquilly across the landscaped courtyard toward the conservatory. Were it not such an undignified gesture, Darcy would have smacked his forehead. Elizabeth's love of the out-of-doors, her humiliating reception by Aunt Catherine, and her desire not to see him, would naturally encourage her to inquire about the garden buildings away from the house. Weaving through the corridor and down the stairs, glancing out of every window pane so as not to lose them, he set foot on the courtyard just as they entered the warm glass house. He groaned. He was already sticky from his search. He would not gain her favour if he smelled offensive, and his face shone like Mr Collins under a layer of sweat. Darcy slowed his pace, holding his arms out for the wind to dry his skin. Should he have taken the time to change his shirt and coat? Bending his neck, he sniffed, and decided it absolutely necessary for him to stand by a bloomed lily or some shrubbery equally potent. With a plan and a purpose, he crossed the courtyard, his eyes intent on the conservatory's open glass doors. A row of potted palms with thick leaves separated him from her. She stood below the peak of the domed iron and glass roof, where a fountain trickled water from a vase held up by Venus, adding calm and humidity to the serene setting. Darcy was about to move forward when, with a gleeful smile and a captivating laugh, Elizabeth raised her palms to the ceiling and twirled in a circle. The ribbons of her bonnet swirled loosely around her, and when she flung her head back, it flew off to land at Darcy's feet, she did not stop twirling, for which Darcy was grateful. She looked so happy. 
The sight of him would have put a damper on her joy. Mrs. Beaton saw him then, showing with a glance at Elizabeth's bonnet and a raised eyebrow that she expected him to return it to its owner. Very well, Mrs. Beaton, thought Darcy, acknowledging her unspoken petition with a nod. Mrs. Beaton smiled, telling Elizabeth about how one of Sir Lewis's ancestors had designed the building in homage to her favourite pet canary, and how his family had always had a special talent for gardening. She drew Elizabeth deeper into the building, far enough that Darcy could fetch the bonnet without being seen. The straw was warm from her. A simple arrangement of rosettes on the side was the only adornment. Darcy breathed in their scent, her rose water tormenting his senses and filling him with sweet melancholy. Lowering the bonnet a safe distance from his nose, he stepped forward as a servant rushed into the giant bird cage. Miss Bennet, the maid called. Mr. Berg wishes to see you now. Mrs. Beaton said, You must not keep her waiting. Any time you wish to see more of the grounds, it would be my honour to show you, Miss Bennet. I can arrange for the gardener to accompany us. Or perhaps Mr. Darcy would wish to join us next time. She looked pointedly at Darcy, who now stood in open view in front of the palms, holding Elizabeth's bonnet. Elizabeth's smile faded when she saw him, and he briefly considered retreating behind the palms, just to see the contented glow return to her face. With nothing left to do but hold out her bonnet, he said, This fell, as if she did not already know it had fallen. He pinched his eyes together in an effort to keep some of his wits about him. When he opened them, the corner of her lips twitched, and he added, To the ground. He clamped his mouth shut, deciding it best not to speak any more. How fortunate of a place for it to fall. It would be horribly inconvenient to fetch it from a gable or a rooftop. She reached forward, her fingers brushing against his, so that she pulled her hand back as if he had burned her. He grasped for her bonnet before it fell to the ground again. No easy task, with her standing so close, the beauty of the finest blooms paling in comparison to her beauty, and the perfume he would forever remember as hers, scrambling his senses so that he fumbled like a fool. He caught the bonnet, enclosing his hand around the brim firmly, and holding it out to her again, only to see that he had crushed her rosettes and part of the brim in his overly enthusiastic grip. "'I apologise," he said, tugging on the flimsy straw in an attempt to straighten what he had mangled, and managing to make it worse. Chapter 12 Elizabeth watched Mr. Darcy's clumsy fingers pluck and pull in a vain attempt to straighten the crushed straw of her bonnet. He did not look so high and mighty, fumbling the delicate rosettes between his strong hands. Elizabeth had not noticed before, but Mr. Darcy did not have the smooth, pale hands of a gentleman unaccustomed to physical labour. Hmm. Odd he did not think himself above such things. But his tanned skin and the calluses snagging and scratching against the brim of her bonnet suggested differently. When the bunch of rosettes gave up its fight against Mr. Darcy's ministrations and fell to the floor in crumpled defeat, laughter bubbled from her throat of its own accord. His cheeks coloured, and his wide shoulders slumped under the weight of undeniable failure. It should have tempered her laughter. She was not so cruel as to humiliate him more than she already had. But the image of Mr. Darcy knocked off his pedestal of pride by an old straw bonnet was one she would not soon forget. She tried to close her mouth and smother her giggle, but ended up coughing for her effort. Mrs. Beaton, who stood beside her, lifted her hands to cover her smile. The maid looked firmly at the floor, clasping her hands together and pinching her lips, lest she do something so inappropriate as show her humour at the ridiculous situation before them. Elizabeth doubted laughter was often heard in the grand halls and opulent rooms of Rosings. It was not a place of cheer, but of triumph, power and control, much too dignified for laughter. Mr Darcy held her bonnet out to her with his head bowed. "'My apologies, Miss Elizabeth,' he said, in such a grave tone, Elizabeth had to wonder if he believed he had destroyed her only bonnet. 
he took himself much too seriously to be so distressed over a bit of straw. "'I see that trimming bonnets is not one of your many talents, Mr. Darcy,' she said, rescuing her bonnet from his grip. He challenged her unfavourable opinion of him with a hearty peal of laughter, such as she had not believed him capable of producing. Elizabeth had been ready to follow the now impatient maid to Mr. Berg, but the rich baritone bellow drew her in like a flower facing the sun. She stared at a man more handsome than the finely crafted marble statues of Greek gods scattered over the grand house. At any other time, she would have rolled her eyes at herself for making such a comparison. She fanned her face. The heat must have overwhelmed her. Mr. Darcy held his large hands before him, the hair curling at his neck and forehead clinging to his damp skin, just as his coat clung snugly over his wide shoulders. Elizabeth recognised the need to look away. It was foolish to think one laugh capable of changing the character of a hateful man. Even the villains in the novels she read laughed. Not like Mr. Darcy did, but that was beside the point. He had wronged Mr. Wickham and separated Mr. Bingley from Jane, offences not easily excused. Catching her breath, she forced her jaw up and turned her attention to the maid, who waited not so patiently for her on the other side of the glass doors. Elizabeth needed to leave before she had another complimentary thought toward the undeserving Mr. Darcy. His laughter was soon replaced with such an awkward awareness of his display of happiness. She wanted to reassure him that laughing at one's mistakes was often the fastest way to rid oneself of the embarrassment experienced by making a misstep publicly. But how could she comfort a man she had vowed to hate? Confused by the contrary insights he displayed, she bobbed a curtsy. He looked as relieved to watch her go as she felt in departing. She shook her head to clear her mind of him. When that did not work, she squeezed her eyes closed, upon which the upward curl of his lips, the crinkle at the corner of his eyes, and the dent in his firm chin appeared with startling clarity in her memory. She opened her eyes, fearing what the night would bring if what she had seen was any indication of her forthcoming dreams. To find something so beautiful in someone so disagreeable distressed her greatly. Lizzie! Charlotte's voice pulled Elizabeth into the present. The maid could have led her into the woods, and she would not have been aware of it. Shaking her head once again, Elizabeth greeted Charlotte, grateful to her friend for pulling her out of the quagmire of her imagination. The maid twiddled her thumbs while Elizabeth stopped to greet her friends. Mr. Berg could wait another minute. I cannot stop for long. Mr. Berg wishes to speak with me. Elizabeth explained, rolling her eyes to show her friends that she would rather stay with them. Charlotte's eyes dashed over to the maid. Promise me you will be cautious, Lizzie. Mr. Berg is very clever. Before Elizabeth could ask her what she meant, Charlotte grabbed Maria, saying, Let us leave. And with a final cautionary glance at Elizabeth, she departed. What did Charlotte mean? Elizabeth's interactions with Mr. Burke had been limited until now. She still did not completely understand why the lady insisted on inviting her to Rosings. Why her? Why so near the end of her stay at the parsonage? Elizabeth's concern increased with each step she took up the stairs, until the maid led her into an impressive sitting-room, replete in blue silk and gold braids. An intricately carved wood panel along one wall, the expansive rug padding the floor, and the cherubs painted on the ceiling added to the splendour of the room. Mr. Berg rose from the fainting couch, diminutive in the midst of the grand features of her sitting-room. Elizabeth would have dismissed her presence in a crowd, but on closer inspection there was something in the tilt of her chin and the flint-like hardness in her eyes that made Elizabeth recall one of her favourite verses of Shakespeare, Though she be but little, she is fierce. Taking Elizabeth's hands between her own, as if they were long-lost friends, Mr. Berg led her over to the couch and asked for a tray to be brought in. "'Do you find Rosings to your liking?' she asked, her manner smug. Of course she would know the answer. Taking Charlotte's warning to heart, Elizabeth answered cautiously. "'It is impressive.' Mr. Berg arched her neck haughtily. 
It is the finest estate in all of England, excepting perhaps Pemberley. You are very fortunate to be here as my guest. So I have heard repeatedly, Elizabeth said, not meaning to have voiced the words aloud. She added a smile to take the edge off her sarcasm. Mr. Berg's eyes narrowed. You do not agree? It was more a challenge than an honest question. I understand I am here to benefit from your instruction and that of Lady Catherine. Indeed, I feel much improved already after the lesson in Roman history I received from the walls in the bow-room. Her flippant retort earned a small smile, and Elizabeth breathed a sigh of relief to learn that her hostess possessed a sense of humour. Few homes can boast to have paintings done by Louis Laguerre, Elizabeth replied, and the intricate carvings of Grinling Gibbons in their Baroque bedchambers. Mr. Berg laughed a cold, calculating cackle that set Elizabeth on edge. I see you learn quickly, Miss Elizabeth. That is in your favour. What else have you learned? Elizabeth did not like to play these games. She would speak honestly and openly. I have learned I must be cautious with you, she said plainly. Mr. Berg's smile widened, but there was no glint of humour in her eyes. And rightly so. I always get what I want. Elizabeth sensed she was playing a dangerous game, at which she was at a terrible disadvantage. She asked, And what is it you want with me? Mr. Berg looked down her nose at Elizabeth, giving her the sinking sensation she had already lost the first round. In a firm voice, Mr. Berg said, I want you to replace Mrs. Jenkinson as my companion. Chapter 13 Elizabeth's cheeks stung with the insult. She was a gentleman's daughter, not of the working class. That Mr. Berg considered it appropriate, advantageous even, to offer Elizabeth a position beneath her station showed a selfish disdain for rank, of which Miss de Berg was all too aware and proud of her own, and a narrow-minded disregard for Elizabeth's future. She could think of no kind way to reply. Not even Mr. Darcy had offended her so deeply. Taking a deep breath, Elizabeth said with forced calm, "'You already have a companion.' She had thought Mrs. Jenkinson's threat to be strange and unfounded, but she had been wrong. At the time, had the elderly companion voiced it, Elizabeth would not have believed it for its absurdity. She ought to have given Mrs. Jenkinson more credit. Mr. Berg snorted. Mrs. Jenkinson, she is old and dull. She waved off her companion as if of no account, adding, For the first time in my life I feel alive, and I aim to live fully. I must make up for lost time, and I need someone who can keep up. Someone like you. Elizabeth dreaded to imagine how someone as egocentric and devious as Mr. Berg was proving herself to be would choose to live. She wanted no part of it. Appealing to Mr. Berg's conscience, if indeed she possessed one, Elizabeth asked, What would become of Mrs. Jenkinson? Mr. Berg shrugged. She is the younger sister of my deceased father, a widow who has been living off my mother's charity for long enough. Elizabeth could not believe what she heard. Surely you do not mean to cast her off completely. Where would she go? Mr. Berg answered with a sigh, signifying she could not care less about the future of her elderly aunt. I will arrange for her to stay in a cottage by the sea. She will be quite comfortable there. After living in luxury her whole life, Elizabeth believed Mr. Berg capable of sticking Mrs. Jenkinson in a workhouse, rather than setting her up comfortably on the coast. Elizabeth wanted nothing more than to end their discussion and distance herself from the despicable lady. Shifting her weight forward on the couch, preparing to take her leave at the moment the opportunity presented itself, she stated the obvious. I am a gentleman's daughter. I am not in need of a position. Mr. Berg replied snappily, you will when your father dies. Is not Mr. Collins to inherit? Elizabeth calmed her breath yet again, though she felt the blood rushing through her body and her pulse racing. My father boasts good health. It is very possible he will outlive all of us. Mr. Berg lifted an incredulous eyebrow. Elizabeth added, 
Aside from that, Mr. Collins has a home and a living here. Why should he hasten to cast us out of the only home my mother, my sisters and I have ever known? Not everyone was as cold and ungrateful as Mr. Berg. In fact, if anyone was ever known to be grateful, it was Mr. Collins, and Charlotte would ensure he treated them with consideration. The scheming narcissist raised another eyebrow. Mr. Collins is ambitious. He seeks prominence. I would not underestimate what he is capable of if I were you. The menacing tone in her voice in reference to Mr. Collins, a man who would praise a dish of boiled potatoes, and whose greatest ambition was to give his elegant little compliments an unstudied air, was laughable. Besides, Charlotte would never allow it. Mr. Berg continued. He was the one who told us of the negligence you suffered in your upbringing, crediting your ignorance in the ways of the world for your refusal of his offer of marriage. Mr. Collins had told Mr. Berg she had refused his offer. Do not look so shocked, Miss Elizabeth. I have my ways of discerning these things. He also told me your diary is not enough to tempt a gentleman. Mr. Collins talked too much. Elizabeth wondered what else Mr. Berg knew. As flippantly as she could manage, Elizabeth said, I do not want to marry the sort of gentleman to be tempted by a fortune. And how do you plan to recommend yourself to the sort of gentleman you seek? You are pleasant to look at, but you are hardly a beauty. And you, vainglorious shrew, are well on your way to being the ugliest person of my acquaintance. Aloud, Elizabeth said, I have never claimed to be a beauty, but I would hope it could be said about me that I possess character enough to treat others how I wish to be treated. Nobody would say you lack character, Miss Elizabeth. However, gentlemen do not want to marry women outspoken enough to question their indiscretions or challenge their intelligence in any way. I will own you are witty. It is what drew my attention to you. "'but you must admit you have no accomplishments in your favour "'with which to attract an advantageous marriage.' "'Elizabeth's muscles tensed, "'but she took pride in the control in her voice. "'I do not seek any more advantage "'than to marry for love and to live happily.' "'Mr. Berg scoffed again. "'She seemed to hold life and everything worthwhile in derision. "'That is what lovers are for. "'Husbands put bread on the table.' and clothes on a woman's back. The love of which you speak is only found in novels. Elizabeth clenched her hands together. I refuse to betray the man I will promise before God to love in the way you describe. Mr. Berg clucked her tongue and shook her head. Vows are made to be broken. The only value they serve is to keep a woman ignorant of the ways of her husband, complacently obedient for the sake of honour and appearances. Why would you wish to marry, and thus expose yourself to disappointment, when you could accompany me and live a life of leisure and luxury? You do not mean to marry, Elizabeth asked. Why should I, when I have a fortune of my own? If my mother persists, I suppose I shall marry Darcy to appease her. She can be so tiresome. It gave Elizabeth a touch of vindictive satisfaction to know Mr. Darcy did not intend to marry his cousin. He never would have offered for her otherwise. I do not intend to give up my freedom easily. Mr. Berg arched her neck and yawned. That was quite enough. Nor do I. I cannot accept your offer, Elizabeth said, standing to leave. She had only managed one step away from the fainting couch when Mr. Berg said, You are my guest for the following three weeks, Miss Elizabeth. That is sufficient time to think on it. Elizabeth did not need time to think about it. To accept a position to someone without the morals and values she respected was as bad as being asked to forever surrender her chance, no matter how small that might be, to meet a gentleman with whom she would willingly share the rest of her life, building memories with each other as their family grew and their love deepened. All the emotion she had contained rippled through her, and she could not leave the room quickly enough. Her eyes burned, but she did not stop to rub them until she had made it past the doorway and out to the corridor. She charged toward her room, her vision blurred, hot with anger. 
until her hand smashed against her face when she smacked against a wall-like obstacle. Her legs buckled under her, but whatever, or whomever, she had run into reached out to catch her, holding her in his arms and adding to her misery with his familiar sandalwood smell. Mustering every ounce of strength she had, Elizabeth willed her legs not to give in on her, nor her eyes to betray her before she reached her room. She refused to cry in front of Mr. Darcy. His hands held her arms still, even when she stepped away. "'Miss Elizabeth, are you well? How may I assist you?' He searched her face for answers she would rather die than give him. Yes, she was that determined. "'I am well, thank you, Mr. Darcy. I hope I did not ruin the polish of your boots,' she smiled. Humour masked a multitude of faults, and right now she needed it to get away from Mr. Darcy, away from Miss de Bourgh and her selfish machinations, away from Lady Catherine and her condescending cuts. Why had she agreed to extend her stay a fortnight? She huffed. She knew very well why she had done it. He stood before her looking concerned, when he had no right to act as if he cared for her, not after his horrible proposal, where he had enumerated her numerous faults. He did not take his eyes off her face to check his boots. He did, however, release his hold on her arms, leaving her colder than she had been in Mr. Berg's presence. If only... He cut himself short, looking at her with a piercing intensity that stirred something she was unwilling to feel within her, something that twisted her stomach, making her more wretched than before. He visibly struggled with whatever battle he waged in his own mind. Finally, he reached into his pocket and pressed a folded letter into her hand. She looked down at her palm, trying to discern where his touch began and hers ended. "'Pray be so kind as to read this,' he said gently, his eyes imploring hers. She could have borne his anger, but this kindness, it was contrary to everything she knew of Mr. Darcy, and it threatened to undo her before she could retreat to her room. She pulled on her hand, but it was too late. A drop, one single tear, betrayed her. It landed with a resounding splat on the paper, soaking into the page where he had written her name. There was no option but to leave immediately. "'Excuse me, Mr. Darcy,' she said, brushing past him and walking as quickly as she could, until she reached her room and shut the carved oak door firmly behind her. Chapter 14 "'What did you say to her?' Darcy demanded from the doorway of Anne's sitting-room. When he saw Mrs. Jenkinson, he took a step inside. It would be a cold day in Dante's Inferno before he put himself in a position of compromise with Anne. She fluttered her hands over her heart and widened her eyes. "'To whom?' Her feigned innocence only disgusted Darcy more. "'To your guest,' he said, not bothering to soften the bite in his tone. "'Oh, Miss Elizabeth!' She glanced at Mrs. Jenkinson, whose face was scrunched up in a wrinkled frown. Anne stifled a yawn. "'She shall accustom herself to the ways of our household soon enough. Given the liberties she has been allowed to take, Miss Elizabeth is bound to balk at the restraints by which a proper lady must govern herself.' Lowering her voice to a whisper, she added, "'I hear she often walks about the park unaccompanied.' Anne tusked and shook her head, as if enjoying the out-of-doors was a serious crime. Darcy crossed his arms. "'Has it become commonplace for maidens to be accosted in Rosings Park?' "'With the sheer number of servants Aunt Catherine employed, "'it would be difficult to walk anywhere unnoticed, "'or for any danger to befall a lady without someone preventing it.' "'Anne huffed. "'Of course not. "'The ruffians know better than to trespass on our property. "'But still, it is highly improper and reflects poorly on her upbringing. "'Only one of inferior birth would allow herself such liberties.' I dread to think of the improprieties allowed in such a permissive household. Her father must be an indifferent sort of man, and no doubt her mother is vulgar indeed. Darcy's limbs felt like lead, as his own words echoed like an unwelcome dream in his memory. Despite the differences in our positions in society, the inferiority of your birth, the indifference of your father, the vulgarity of your mother, 
and the mockery of all things proper by your younger sisters. I am willing to overlook all of this. How generous he had believed himself. Had the words sounded as ugly to Elizabeth as they did to him now? Given her reaction to his offer, undoubtedly so. Anne continued. It is a credit to Miss Elizabeth that she has risen above her circumstances as much as she has. She is intelligent, and I know that with a little guidance she will not shame her peers. I am willing to overlook all of this, because I recognise in you a lady who has risen above her circumstances, using the adversities presented to her as an opportunity to improve. Darcy recalled what he had thought to be the highest compliment he could pay to Elizabeth. Darcy felt sick. He had insulted the lady he claimed to love, and during an offer of marriage at that. Richard would call him a brute, and deservedly so. He had failed Elizabeth, turning an occasion which should have inspired joy and hope into an inquest where he had judged her deficient, but through his great understanding and mercy had said he would accept her anyway. How pompous he had been! His ego crushed, and his shoulders bowed with regret, a sentiment Elizabeth seemed to inspire within him of late. He determined never to fail her again. He would defend the lady who was not present to speak for herself, before his cousin. "'I wish she would not change,' he said, meaning it with his whole heavy heart. Anne scoffed. "'She will, if she wants to benefit from my patronage.' "'Miss Elizabeth does not need your patronage. She is a gentleman's daughter.' Anne laughed. <laughs> what? A gentleman's daughter? Would you marry her? He hesitated, and she noticed. Relaxing his arms at his sides and assuming his haughtiest air, Darcy said, She would not have me. She would raise as many objections against me as you have against her. Like Richard had done to him, Darcy would allow Anne to believe what she wished, without volunteering enough information for her to understand the truth. "'Against you?' she exclaimed, crossing the room to stand closer to him. "'Who would dare? Unless—' Anne tapped her finger against her chin. "'Unless she cleverly did so to strengthen your attachment through the devices commonly used by young ladies desperate to marry above their station.' She watched him carefully, too carefully— he wanted to point out that in birth they were equals. Instead, he scoffed. Not everyone is as captious as you are, Anne. If a lady such as Miss Bennet were to refuse an offer of marriage from a gentleman, I would credit her with enough honesty to believe she meant it. His hopes crumbled as he said it, for he knew it to be true. He had seen to that with his odious proposal. The letter might clear his character of Wickham's accusations, but Darcy now realised it was not enough. He had to answer for his own error. Anne poked a finger at his cravat. Her eyes were full of mischief, and she smiled like the child who had snatched the last piece of cake from the pantry. How interesting! You have fallen for her. Elizabeth's anger took a more pleasant turn toward curiosity at the letter in her hand, Mr Darcy's letter. That it contained a matter of importance, she was certain, for why else would he breach propriety to give an unmarried lady a letter penned by him? Its weight suggested an explanation of great length. With the accusations she had thrown against him, what else could it be? Her chin jutted forward at the thought. Gone was the humble man who had apologised when he had crushed her bonnet. In his place, was the arrogant Mr. Darcy she had met and come to know begrudgingly in Hertfordshire. In his immense pride, had he sought to enumerate on all of the points in which she was wrong, with the intention of making her regret her refusal? She would not put it past him. He had managed to have the last word before he left the evening before, and Elizabeth held no doubt his self-regard would demand he depart from Kent on the morrow in the same fashion. Very well, then. "'Let us see how Mr. Darcy will explain my error,' she said, as she settled in for an entertaining reading, which would, if anything, convince herself that she had indeed made the correct decision in refusing him. To think she had thought him changed, and all because of a bonnet. Lifting the page high, 
all the better to thumb her nose at the gentleman. She imagined him in all his haughty glory, reading the words on the page to her. And thus she began, the letter in her hand dropping to her lap after the first paragraph, with the weight of the information it contained. Her skin tingled, and her head felt light. She gasped many times, holding her fingers like a fan over her breast to calm her heart. The letter was not at all what she had expected. When she had finished devouring the pages, she held it closely to her chest, breathing deeply and focusing on the crushed straw of her bonnet lying on the trunk at the end of her bed. Her thoughts swirled in dizzy confusion. She had expected an explanation, but not this. True to his word, Mr Darcy did not repeat his offer, nor attempt to persuade her to reconsider her answer. Instead, he expressed how he wished for her to forget it. In her mind, Elizabeth knew it to be for the best. However, by the end of her first reading, she could not help but wish, for her own vanity's sake, that he not find himself able to forget her so easily. She shook her head. No, surely I was not so completely mistaken in his character, she said hoping the sound of her voice would offer some clarity to the conflicting views yielding to doubt in her own mind. She read the letter again, this time slowly and meticulously. Her whole body tensed in concentration as she picked apart every sentence, comparing it to what she had observed for herself, without the influence of anyone else's opinion. Mr Darcy openly acknowledged his interference with Mr Bingley and Jane, had he attempted to excuse his conduct, Elizabeth could easily have dismissed the rest of his letter. But he did not. He presented the facts as he had seen them, devoid of emotion or influence from Mr Bingley's sisters. Though her heart squeezed for Jane, Elizabeth could not discredit his observations, nor mark them as insincere. Had not Charlotte suggested that Jane ought to be more forthright in expressing her admiration, lest Mr Bingley believe her indifferent? Nor could she think ill of Mr Bingley for being influenced by a trusted friend when she had accepted a reputation-tarnishing story from Mr Wickham, a man who was practically a stranger. If Elizabeth could turn back time, she would have taken Charlotte's advice more seriously. She would have repeated it to Jane, who would have overcome her shyness at the risk of losing the man she had grown to love. Elizabeth would have told Mr Wickham to save his stories for someone more gullible than her. Guilt twisted her stomach, a sentiment Mr Darcy seemed to have inspired in her of late. She ought not to have judged him so harshly. All the anger she had directed at Mr Darcy for separating her dear sister from Mr Bingley had taken a sharp turn to point, at least in part, directly at Elizabeth. She had possessed an important piece of information, which she had neglected to pass on to Jane. She had forgotten how important appearances are when characters are yet unknown, and how deceiving they could be when a person's behaviour is misunderstood, as the rest of Mr Darcy's letter revealed. While he dealt in facts, which he offered his cousin to confirm, Elizabeth sensed the pain seeping through his words when he wrote of his father's preference of Mr Wickham and that evil man's, Elizabeth could no longer think of him as a gentleman, knowing what she knew, treacherous dealings with Mr Darcy's little sister, a young lady vulnerable in her ignorance. Unwilling to extend her pity to Mr Darcy for the wrongs he had suffered, he would not want it, nor could she completely forgive him until he apologised for his slights against her. Elizabeth extended her empathy wholeheartedly to Miss Darcy, who had been used very badly, who had given her heart to a man who only wanted her dowry to cover his debts. As Elizabeth read, she knew Mr Darcy's account to be true. The side glances merchants cast upon Mr Wickham when he entered their establishments were explained in clarity, as was his hurried account about Mr Darcy's unjust treatment of him in order to garner favour by use of the charming manners he possessed. Gripping the pages in her lap, Elizabeth shook her head and rubbed her cheek. Mr Darcy had appealed to her sense of justice in his opening words, and she found she could not deny him before the irrefutable evidence he provided. For one, he had called upon Colonel Fitzwilliam to confirm the truth of his admissions. Even more impressive 
was his willingness to share the damning details of Mr. Wickham concerning his sister, information which, in the wrong hands, would lead to her ruin. And to think, Mr. Darcy had trusted her with it. Chapter 15 Darcy tossed another waistcoat on top of the growing mound of discarded clothing piled on the chair in his changing room. The double-breasted green Marcella cast a sickly glow on his complexion, the embroidered yellow silk with brass buttons looked too festive for what would surely turn out to be a grim occasion. Maybe he should stick with the single-breasted cream-coloured satin. He searched through the mess of fabrics, frustrated that a simple matter such as dressing should provoke so much struggle and uncertainty. He had not heard Richard come in until he spoke. You should wear the blue waistcoat with the velvet coat collar. Richard's decisiveness irked Darcy. Why blue? He knew the answer as he voiced the question. Elizabeth often wore blue. She must like the colour. It suited her. Miss Elizabeth favours blue, said Richard. How loathsome it was to be told what was painfully obvious. But Darcy stifled his ill humour. He needed to be alert for trouble at dinner, and he needed Richard's help for Elizabeth's sake. With a nod at his patient valet, Darcy accepted the blue waistcoat, shrugging into the fitted kerseymere and fastening the cloth-covered buttons. Richard asked, "'Are you ready to leave on the morrow?' Darcy had wrestled with that very question since meeting Elizabeth in the corridor. His subsequent conversation with Anne had convinced him. "'I think we ought to extend our stay, if that is agreeable to you.' "'I'm at your disposal,' Richard said, with a deferential bow, which he no doubt thought would disguise his grin." "'How much longer?' he asked, his lips twitching. Three weeks. Darcy braced himself, knowing what would come. Richard did not disappoint. Lashing out with relaxed fists, he punched Darcy in the arm and ruffled his hair with callous knuckles, like they were children again. "'You clever dog, I knew it. I knew you would want to stay longer now that Miss Bennet is Anne's guest. "'If only it were that simple.' If only he had not proposed like a buffoon, insulting not only the lady he respected and admired above all others, but her family as well. And to have his own cousin demean Elizabeth's position in society by offering her a position meant for spinsters or ladies in reduced circumstances and no other option. "'What have you done?' Richard asked, his grip tightening on Darcy's arm. "'You assume I am the problem?' Darcy wrenched out of his grasp, not liking the bitter taste of regret on his conscience, but preferring it to the acidic sting of shame and guilt. Only his determination to amend the wrongs he had done against Elizabeth convinced him to stay. He had set Anne on her, Anne who had a lifetime of entertaining herself by seeing how far she could manipulate those around her to her will, who would ruin a lady for no other reason than to serve her selfish purposes. "'Of course I do,' exclaimed Richard. Why else do you think I would rather stay here with you than return to my barracks? I cannot trust you not to bungle your future with the haughty facade you use to intimidate others. If only it were merely a facade, Darcy mumbled. He seemed to be swimming in what-ifs lately, ever since he met Elizabeth. Richard gasped and clutched his cravat. Is that humble speech I hear? Darcy grumbled at him. It is no laughing matter. Squeezing his shoulder, Richard said softly, I know it is not Darcy, but I am more convinced than ever that Miss Bennet is the right lady for you. She makes you a better man. For that reason alone you must stay. He may as well have kicked Darcy in the ribs. The one woman he loved so much, his heart ached with longing at the mention of her name, was out of reach, and he had no one but himself to blame for it. The loss of her choked him. Only the ferocity with which he had vowed to protect her from Anne fueled his anger and allowed him to breathe past the grief. Anne aims to keep her as a companion, he said through clenched teeth. Richard sat in the nearest chair. He shook his head, running his thick fingers through his hair. Tell me everything you know. Darcy started his narrative. When Elizabeth had smacked into him in the corridor bravely holding back her tears, and ended it with Anne's insightful appraisal of his emotions. 
Richard rose, slamming his fist into his hand and declaring, I must change my coat before dinner. Darcy had expected a strong reaction from his military cousin, but not a change of wardrobe. Why, you look perfectly presentable. Richard said, Anne has declared war. I must dress for the occasion. You know, sent her a clear message that we are unafraid, nay, eager to engage in combat. Tis a pity you do not have a red coat. While Darcy appreciated Richard's enthusiasm, he could not risk making Anne a worse enemy. Tread cautiously, Rich. We have to assume Anne will use the knowledge she has about me against Miss Elizabeth. She is vulnerable here, and Anne is capable of making her stay miserable. We cannot allow it. Richard rubbed his chin and moved his jaw from side to side, visibly strategizing. You leave Anne to me tonight, he said, with a glint in his eye that made Darcy fear for Anne, almost. Richard was a force to be reckoned with when his hackles were raised. If anyone could take Anne down, it was him. He rubbed his hands together, adding, You just focus on your Miss Elizabeth. I will see to the rest. As if it were possible for Darcy to see anyone else in the room when Elizabeth was in it. What of Aunt Catherine? She is not blind. Darcy did not like being kept in the dark. Richard's mischievous grin only added to his concern. Richard considered for a moment. Aunt Catherine genuinely does not believe you would attach yourself to anyone other than Anne, unless the lady had a fortune and a title. Fortunately for you, Miss Bennet possesses neither. She is safe from Aunt Catherine. Unless she heard about my ill-received offer of marriage, thought Darcy. Then nobody would be safe. Elizabeth dreaded dinner, not because she feared the company she would have to keep, but she rather feared that one condescending remark from Mr. Berg would provoke such a reply as would give Lady Catherine an apoplexy when Elizabeth told her daughter just what she thought of her. She did not feel the need for Colonel Fitzwilliam to confirm the veracity of Mr. Darcy's accounts. She did, however, given the gravity of the contents of the letter, feel the need to reassure Mr. Darcy that his trust in her was not in vain. But how could she possibly do so with his aunt and Mr. Berg present? She had read the letter so many times she had committed it to her memory, where she would keep it safe. As for the letter itself, she had burned it, watching the pages char until they turned to ash and crumpled in the fireplace. Donning her favourite blue dress, Elizabeth checked her hair in the vanity glass, and reached up to smooth an unruly tendril. Though she saw her reflection, she hardly knew herself. How was it possible for her to so thoroughly despise a man undeserving of her premature judgment only hours before, when now she knew him to possess all the goodness she had claimed he lacked? She had been wrong. Not that Mr Darcy was perfect, not by any means, but he was innocent of the faults of which she had accused him boldly to his face. Garnering her courage, ready for the first evening of clever cuts and blatant condescension in the weeks to come, Elizabeth went down to the drawing-room, where she would wait until dinner was called. The hair on her arms stood on end, and she hesitated before stepping inside. Had she been out of doors, she would have hurried her pace to make it indoors before the thunder rumbled and the lightning struck. The air was so heavy it would certainly crack. She proceeded forward, "'stepping onto the red and gold Turkish rug cautiously. "'Looking past the gilded brocade chair with the high back, "'where Lady Catherine reigned supreme in her favourite room, "'Elizabeth saw Mr Darcy. "'He stood before the fireplace, "'his profile reflected in the immense gilt wood mirror "'with the royal Tudor crown above the mantel. "'He was handsome in a blue waistcoat that matched her dress. "'Beside him stood Colonel Fitzwilliam, striking an intimidating pose in his full army uniform. The image of both gentlemen, one powerful in his controlled expression and firm stance, the other dressed for battle and alert, was both comforting and disturbing. "'Do you expect Napoleon to join us for dinner, Colonel?' she asked, in an attempt to lighten the tension in the room. Colonel Fitzwilliam answered with a forced smile that failed to reach his eyes. "'Far worse!' Darcy must have seen her confusion. He added, 
Our worst enemies are often those closest to us. The colonel mumbled, and those we are obliged to claim as family. As if on cue, Lady Catherine entered the room in a swirl of swooshing silk, followed closely by Mr. Berg and Mrs. Jenkinson. Chapter 16 Elizabeth glanced across the table at Mr. Berg, seated between her mother and Colonel Fitzwilliam, and wondered how such a diminutive woman could create so much turmoil. Elizabeth doubted Mr. Berg had revealed her plans to replace Mrs. Jenkinson to her male cousins, unless it suited her purpose to do so, leaving Elizabeth to suppose the conniving lady had yet another scheme in progress amongst those seated in the dining room. Lady Catherine took her responsibility to educate Elizabeth in the elevated ways of a proper lady in society, seriously. It was torture, seated as Elizabeth was, beside Mr. Darcy, without any opportunity to speak to him, to reassure him, to thank him. Three weeks is no time at all, but you shall benefit greatly from Anne's company. She is exemplary in deportment. If your daughter is the archetype to be imitated, I fear for society. Now that Anne's health is improved, she will dedicate herself to improving her drawing, her skill at the pianoforte and her needlework. I gather from the way your daughter rolled her eyes that she has other, more nefarious uses for her time. A young lady without these accomplishments, which any female raised properly with a governess would naturally possess, cannot expect to receive an offer of marriage. On that point you are quite mistaken, your ladyship, for I have rejected two such offers, Elizabeth thought with a sigh. Without the benefit of my instruction and Anne's influence, you would have to marry beneath your station. I hardly think Mr Darcy is beneath my station, but you will never understand the compliment you just paid me, because I will never tell you. I will tell no one. Of course, even a tradesman would wish to marry into a fortune. Lady Catherine concluded with a sip from her wine glass. Before Elizabeth could think of a witty retort, Mr Darcy said, You forget love. Some people are fortunate enough to marry because they recognise in each other the one person in thousands, perhaps the entire world, who challenges them to become a better version of themselves, who can communicate with a look more than most manage in a torrent of words, who inspires hope with a smile, and both comfort and chaos with a touch. Elizabeth stared in front of her. How did he so clearly express what she most desired? She so badly wanted to look at him, but knew she must not. It would tell him too much, and she was not ready to admit how wrong she had been. Not quite, and certainly not in front of Lady Catherine and her pernicious daughter. Lady Catherine scoffed. Oh, love is a fickle emotion. You will not be remembered by future generations of Darcy's for having married for love, but rather for the advantages you can give them by marrying well. Mr. Berg simpered. Family always comes first. Mrs. Jenkinson glared at Elizabeth, as if she were a willing conspirator, seeking to oust the elderly lady from her position, and deserving of the punishment she inflicted on the piece of game hen she mercilessly sawed her knife across. Were Mrs. Jenkinson not so involved in her own worries, she would have seen that Mr. Berg's comment had nothing to do with her, and everything to do with Mr. Darcy. Mr. Berg added, Do you not agree, Darcy? with a pointed look at Elizabeth. Elizabeth's hackles rose in instant rebellion. Mr. Berg knew. How? And more important, how much did she know? Obviously enough to torment Mr. Darcy. Elizabeth set her cutlery down before she was tempted to throw them at the vicious woman seated across from her. She refused to be used as a pawn. Colonel Fitzwilliam distracted his aunt by complimenting her on the meal, the pattern on the fine china, the high polish of the silver, and generally anything he could to keep her from noticing the uncomfortable triangle of accusatory glances cast about her table. At least, that is what Elizabeth supposed, and she was grateful. Like a vulture eagerly flying in circles at the sight of blood, Mr. Berg taunted her prey with haughty smiles and sharp glances. 
Elizabeth felt the tension radiate from Mr. Darcy in waves, and if looks could kill, Mr. Berg would have slumped lifeless over her plate. Elizabeth hated her. She despised Mr. Berg for adding to Mr. Darcy's burdens, as if he did not have enough of them. She detested how easily the evil lady cast off one dependent on her kindness, as was Mrs. Jenkinson and she abhorred the smug confidence with which Mr. Berg assumed she would get her way. And Elizabeth hated knowing that unless she was extremely cautious, she would end up playing into Mr. Berg's cold, calculating hand. As if Aunt Catherine's condescending comments during dinner were not humiliating enough, she insisted Elizabeth play for them in the music room, making free with her criticism and remarking how proficient she would have been with the instrument, although Darcy could not recall ever hearing his aunt play. Elizabeth bore it well, though the mischievous glint in her eye betrayed the witty retort she had in mind, but would never speak aloud. Darcy admired the way she used humour to cover over faults. He did note a particular care with Anne, and Darcy was grateful for it. The second Elizabeth underestimated his cousin was the moment Anne would attack where it hurt the most. She would snatch Elizabeth's freedom away without a second thought. Darcy would not allow it. He leaned against the instrument, pleased when he saw Richard do the same on the other side. Together, they would keep her out of Anne's clutches. She was so lovely, his chest ached. Candlelight caressed her face, casting its warm glow over the sun-kissed skin Darcy's fingers longed to trace. She held her head high, even when her fingers stumbled over the ivory keys, and Aunt Catherine harumphed aloud at her error. Dozens of life-sized portraits of long-deceased de Burgs lined the walls, observing her, watching for her to make another mistake. And yet, her courage only rose to the occasion. Not since Georgiana had played for him could Darcy recall a better performance. Anne sauntered over to them, seating herself beside Elizabeth on the bench. "'Perhaps if I turn the pages, Elizabeth will not skip so many notes.' Elizabeth's nostrils flared, and Darcy supposed she did not take kindly to Anne's free use of her Christian name, as if they were friends. Darcy did not like it one bit. "'How kind of you, Miss de Berg, she answered, emphasising the formal name. Anne's eyes narrowed, and she pinched her lips together. Richard teased her. Oh, "'Why the sour expression, cousin? Would you rather give Miss Bennet the benefit of your example by displaying your talents?' Darcy bit his tongue and cast Richard a warning glance. Anne had no talents, having used her illness as an excuse not to exert herself in any sort of worthwhile accomplishment. Elizabeth focused unwaveringly on the sheet of music before her. Anne glared at Richard, a look he happily returned. Leave it to the soldier to engage in open battle. As quickly as Richard had provoked Anne's ire, her expression transformed turning Darcy cold. "'You have given me the most splendid idea,' she began, turning to Aunt Catherine and addressing her. "'Mother, we simply must allow Elizabeth the opportunity to display her improved accomplishments. We must have a ball at Rosings.' Richard applauded. "'What an excellent idea. I do hope Miss Bennet will agree to grant me the first dance. I dare say she will be popular with the gentleman, and so I must request a turn on the dance floor while I have the opportunity.' Darcy understood his strategy. Agreeing with Anne would confuse her. "'Might I claim the honour of the dinner set, Miss Bennet?' he asked, to which he was delighted to see a dimpled cheek smile at him in an affirmative reply. Aunt Catherine did not look so pleased. "'Miss Bennet's stay with us ends in three weeks. Unless she is willing to extend her stay further, I do not see how we have sufficient time to arrange for a ball.' She looked at Elizabeth, who continued playing a lively tune. I've already written to my family and do not wish to inconvenience them by changing my plans yet again, she answered. Anne played to her mother's weakness. If anyone can do it, it is you, mother. What a wonderful way for us to celebrate my improved health and display the effectiveness of your patronage on a neglected country miss. Your attentions ought to be recognised and praised. Aunt Catherine resembled a trout from Pemberley's pond as she opened and closed her mouth. She never refused her daughter, but it was clear she dearly wanted to. 
Anne continued. And to ensure your efforts are not overlooked, we shall invite the Bennets, so they may see how much Elizabeth has benefited from your tutelage and my association. They will be our guests of honour. Every eye will be on them, and your prized pupil. Darcy saw raw panic flash across Elizabeth's features, but she continued playing. Darcy could say nothing against the Bennets, lest he offend Elizabeth and encourage Anne, but every fibre in his being protested the suggestion. Aunt Catherine and Mrs. Bennet would get along like vinegar and oil. Mr. Bennet would ridicule everyone for his own enjoyment. Miss Bennet would attempt to establish peaceful conditions, when there was no possibility for them. The youngest Bennet sisters would make spectacles of themselves under the critical eye of their hosts, and Anne would tug on everyone's strings like a master puppeteer. Mr. Collins may wish to receive them at the parsonage, Darcy suggested. Anne scoffed. Why would they wish to cram into the parsonage when they could stay here? Aunt Catherine shook her head. Three weeks is no time at all. We may invite the Bennets to Rosings for a dinner party. Darcy's triumph was short-lived. Anne said, But, Mother, would you not prefer to invite all the gentry within riding distance to witness the announcement of my engagement? Darcy growled. Take care, Anne. I will never bend to anyone's will but my own. She hissed. We will see about that. Rising from the bench, she trapped Darcy between herself and the bulky instrument and said, Is it not about time we made my engagement to Darcy public? It has, after all, been an arrangement of long standing between you and your dearest sister, whose name I bear. Darcy flinched when she patted his arm. This is ridiculous, Anne. Tell her the truth. Over my dead body, she replied with a smile, fluttering her eyelashes. Richard pried Anne not so delicately away from Darcy's side, under the pretext of discussing the matter further with Aunt Catherine. Elizabeth had stopped playing. Darcy knew his heart would break into a million pieces if he looked at her, but he could not avoid her. It was worse than he had thought possible. Her eyes sparkled with tears, and she breathed in deeply to hold them back. This is not going to end well for either of us, is it? She whispered, balling her fingers into a fist. What is your plan? How may I help? A smile was absolutely inappropriate given the circumstances, but Darcy's admiration for her spirit soared. Hers were not tears of defeat, but a testament to the depth of her emotion. They were comrades in arms, to fail meant the loss of freedom for her and the loss of every hope, no matter how small, of winning her heart for him. Failure was not an option. Chapter 17 Elizabeth tossed and turned all night. Her mother and her youngest sisters were experts in getting their own way, but they were never malicious in their desires, nor did they attempt to interfere directly with the futures of others, as Mr. Berg did, unless an unmarried gentleman was about, then all bets were off. Snuggling deeper into the warm blankets, Elizabeth pondered how to proceed over the next three weeks. She wondered how Mr Darcy would avoid an unwanted engagement. A couple of days ago, she would have thought the match perfect. Now, however... Well, he was no longer the enemy she had thought him to be, and the way he had stood beside her as she played, rather horribly, had infused her with courage, even if her fingers tangled every time he had smiled at her. Rolling onto her back, Elizabeth sighed when she heard someone out in the hall. Was it nearly morning already? Another noise, very clearly a feminine sob, had her holding her breath to hear better. A servant would be cautious to reserve her tears for the confines of her room, lest she wake the household earlier than their normal hour to rise. Lady Catherine was not the sort of woman to cry where she could be observed, and Mr. Berg was too divested of normal human emotion to possess something so common as remorse or sorrow. That left Mrs Jenkinson. Curiosity compelled Elizabeth to leave the comfort of her bed. Grabbing a shawl, she wrapped it around her shoulders, the knit covering most of her nightgown. She opened her door and peeked down the inky hall, a white apron and cap of a chambermaid identifying the source of the cry Elizabeth had heard. There being nobody else about, she lit a candle 
and made her way to the maid. The girl wrung her hands in her apron, looking down the length of the corridor to Lady Catherine's suite. The trim on the girl's cap shook, and she stifled another sob with her hands. Extending her arm out to comfort her, Elizabeth asked, "'What has happened to distress you? Pray allow me to help you.' The girl shook her head, still hiding behind her hands. Another door down the hall opened, and Mr Darcy stepped out, his white shirt loosely tucked into his breeches. Elizabeth looked away, her face blooming in a burning blush at his undress, and clutching her shawl more tightly around her when she remembered it was the only thing separating her from indecency. "'What are you doing awake at this hour?' he asked her briskly. "'The same as you, I suspect,' she answered too snappily. Embarrassment often brought out her irreverence. If he had not noticed her attire, or lack of, before, he certainly did now. From her toes to where she held the shawl with a throat-strangling grip at her throat, he saw her standing barefoot in nothing but her nightdress, with a flimsy piece of fabric thrown over her shoulders. The maid sobbed again, and Elizabeth felt foolish for worrying about herself when something had caused great distress to the girl. Mustering her pride, and willing herself to look at nothing but Mr Darcy's forehead, she said, "'I heard a disturbance, and came to see if I could be of assistance.' He asked the chambermaid, "'What has happened? Here, have a seat.' He led the girl to the nearest chair, and Elizabeth chastised herself for appreciating the width of his back, and admiring the sculpted form under the thin silk of his shirt at a time like this. Shaking her head, and avoiding any more glances at Mr. Darcy. They were quite dangerous, you know. Elizabeth asked the maid, Now then, is that better? The girl visibly shook, and once again she looked down the corridor in the direction of Lady Catherine's rooms. In a whisper, Elizabeth strained to hear, the maid said, She's dead. Mr. Darcy, who had leaned in to hear the trembling figure, now stood erect with a large sigh. I had thought my Aunt Catherine would outlive us all. The maid shook her head. No, not her, sir. Elizabeth was puzzled. Well, surely it is not Mrs Jenkinson, she asked. She prayed it was not the elderly woman, for a lot of the strength of her argument against Anne's plan was that she already had a companion. Again the maid shook her head. No, miss, she said, burying her face in her hands. It is Mr. Berg. Elizabeth reached out to steady herself against the wall. Mr. Darcy paced, his hands in his hair. This is very bad. We must wake Richard. What about your aunt? You must tell her. Darcy lowered his hands to his side. Let us see to the maid first. She has suffered quite a shock. But I am certain a cup of tea in the kitchen will do much to restore her. After sending her off, he pulled Elizabeth deeper into a shadow and spoke with quiet urgency. Let us pray there is nothing suspicious about Anne's death, or you and I will find ourselves in the middle of a murder investigation. Shock lent strength to Elizabeth's limbs. Me? I have only just arrived. Her words trailed off as she realised how convenient it would be for her, a recently arrived guest with a motive against Mr Berg, to suddenly find the source of her problems dead. Anne told me her plans for you. I had decided to extend my stay so Richard and I might interfere in your behalf. Her legs wobbled unsteadily. How very gallant of you. Gallant, really. Could she not have thought of a better word? And then she gasped as the thought struck her. You do not think I killed her, do you? Could she not have died as a consequence of her illness? She knew it not to be possible as she said the words. She was too much recovered from her illness to have succumbed to it. Mr Darcy looked at her with his piercingly dark eyes. He had not answered her other question. Do you think I did it? she repeated. His answer was immediate. I do not believe you capable of such treachery. Elizabeth knew herself to be innocent, but she was relieved to hear Mr Darcy say as much aloud. He continued, You heard the threats my cousin brought up against me last night. 
Now that Anne is gone, I have no way of knowing how my aunt will react to the distressing news. If retaliation is what she seeks, we are in grave danger. Fortunately, she is unaware of Anne's dealings with you, and we must keep it that way. Elizabeth's heart leapt into her throat. But that puts you in harm's way, and you are every bit as innocent as I am. Their eyes locked, and she felt his sadness consume her. Do you really believe that? he asked. Before she could answer, a deep voice down the hall said, What is all this commotion about? A soldier needs his sleep if he is to be prepared for battle. Colonel Fitzwilliam joined them, his expression lightening when he saw Elizabeth. Ah, I see you are keeping good company. Though might I suggest, for the preservation of your reputations, that you not meet at such an indecent hour and in such a state of undress. Elizabeth clutched her shawl. Mr Darcy scowled at his cousin. You know me better than that, Richard, and you will need all the charm in your possession to appease our aunt. Anne is dead. The colonel stopped short. Anne is dead? His shock turned to concern in an instant. You had better pray Aunt Catherine discerns her death to be of natural causes. You've not told her. Mr Darcy shook his head. Good, it is for the best. I leave this to me. Anne had no hold over me, nor do I benefit from her death. However, the pair of you would do best to keep out of Aunt Catherine's sight until the worst is over. Especially you, Darcy. Mr Darcy grasped the Colonel's arm. If I am accused, you will protect Georgiana. You must promise me. Elizabeth could not help but think his reaction a bit dramatic. Why would Lady Catherine accuse her own nephew? Would she not rather avoid the scandal? As if he had heard her thoughts, Darcy turned to her. With Anne's death, I not only avoid an unwanted marriage, but I inherit Rosings and all its property. What? How is that possible? Would the estate not be passed on to one of Sir Louis de Bourgh's relatives? In his case, an entailment might have been a blessing. At least it would have kept his home in his family. But he left it all to Aunt Catherine to do with as she chose once he saw they would have no more heirs other than Anne. His eldest sister had two sons who died at a young age, and Mrs Jenkinson, as you know, is childless. He trusted his only daughter to carry on his legacy. But why you? I am the son of my aunt's most beloved sister. For her, there is no greater reason. Aunt Catherine has never recovered from my mother's death, and I fear her mourning for Anne will last until her last breath. Elizabeth sank into the chair the maid had occupied. A large inheritance. That was motive enough for any man to hang, even Mr Darcy. Chapter 18 Staying out of Aunt Catherine's sight proved to be much easier than Darcy had imagined. His own character did not allow him to simply disappear when there was much to oversee, and so he quietly made arrangements while Aunt Catherine ensconced herself in Anne's room with their maids and Mrs Jenkinson. Darcy sent for the coroner. Even if there was to be no inquest, they would require a coffin. He had the servants prepare the yellow parlour for the guests, who would come to pay their respects before Anne's burial. He sent a letter to Anne's London doctor, alerting him to the situation and inquiring into possible causes of death based on the little he knew. That note he sent by messenger should Aunt Catherine decide to lay Anne to rest in the family tomb at the end of the week, and should the doctor wish to determine a cause of death. Darcy supposed the gentleman would be every bit as shocked as they had been at the news of his patient's unexpected demise. Several times Darcy passed by Anne's bedchamber door. He paused to listen, but only heard silence. His concern for his aunt grew the longer she remained enclosed in the room. Darcy was in Uncle Lewis's study, partaking of a glass of liquid fortification with Richard, when Aunt Catherine called for the colonel. Darcy instinctively rose to join him. "'I will see to her, Darcy. You had best stay here. She will be relieved, I hope, that you have seen to the arrangements.' Richard stood in the doorway until Darcy sat back down. In his mind... Darcy knew his cousin was correct, that of everyone in the house, he was certainly the one with the most motive to have rid the earth of Anne. What disturbed Darcy the most was how little sadness he could muster for her. She had made so many miserable, 
and Darcy did not doubt but that she had made many enemies over the years. He did, however, pity his aunt. She was truly alone now. First, with the death of her beloved sister, Darcy's mother, Lady Anne. Next, with her own husband, whom she had married for the express purpose of having companionship and a large property. And now her own daughter, whom she had loved blindly these many years. The questions that had tormented Darcy all morning reared their ugly heads, and the air became too thick to breathe. What was worse, he had not seen Elizabeth since sunrise. Darcy left the stuffy study for his room. A chill gripped him in the hall as he passed the door to Anne's room. Death settled heavily over Rosings, leaving Darcy cold in the dim corridor. What had happened to Anne? As much as Darcy wished it to be true, he could not believe she had died from her illness. That she would take her own life was out of the question. That only left one other possibility. Anne had been murdered. Darcy had not yet entered his room when Richard departed from Aunt Catherine's side. How is she, Richard? he asked. Richard sighed, motioning for Darcy to follow him downstairs. Let us go out of doors for a moment. There is much to ponder. They crossed the lawn in the direction of the glass garden houses. Darcy flexed his shoulders in the afternoon sun, soaking up every inch of warmth into his black coat. Finally, Richard spoke. As we had suspected, Aunt Catherine is not taking this easily. She is uncommonly quiet, and I fear she has set all of the servants on edge. It is quite out of her character. Darcy clenched his fists. While he had mourned the loss of his mother, much more so than his father, the demands of society had prevented him from mourning properly. All the black crepe in the world could not cleanse his soul of the sorrow and the loneliness tears eventually granted him. He sympathised with his aunt for the days and weeks which would follow until enough time had passed for the ache to dull and the emptiness to fill. As he walked through the gardens beside Richard, he dreaded all the flowers that would soon fill the yellow parlour, their sweet perfume a painful reminder of their reason for being there. Darcy never kept vases of flowers in the house at Pemberley. He said, The doctor will arrive on the morrow or very soon afterward. He may be able to provide more insight than the coroner. Richard grunted, If Aunt Catherine agrees to allow him to examine the body. He stopped, raising one hand to rub his face his finger scratching over the stubble of his unshaven chin. I do not know what to make of it, Darcy. If Aunt had any doubt about Anne's death, she would have to allow the coroner to examine the body and perform an inquest. That she refused him entry when he came to deliver the coffin suggests she suspects nothing untoward. Not once during the day had Darcy heard his aunt raise her voice in her normal shrill tone, an occurrence which caused him no small amount of alarm. Richard continued walking, and Darcy was pleased to see the conservatory before them. While it had been a scene of embarrassment for him, it had also been the place where Elizabeth had first smiled at him. What he would give for a ray of her sunshine and happiness in the dreary confines of Rosings. Darcy felt a weight lift off his shoulders as he stepped inside the conservatory. The fountain eased his mind and slowed his pulse, until Richard said, "'Miss Bennet!' What a pleasant surprise to meet you here. He bowed to the lady who stood on the other side of the fountain, spinning on his boot heel and winking at Darcy as he did so. Had Elizabeth not been observing him, Darcy would have punched his cousin in the arm. Once again he had fallen into Richard's trap. Not that Darcy minded much. She did not wear a bonnet, a fact which disturbed him greatly, he hated to think he had left her without anything appropriate with which to cover her head. He would never forgive himself if she caught a chill due to his clumsy fingers. "'I do hope your bonnet was not beyond repair,' he said. Her eyes danced in mischief and twinkled like stars when she smiled. "'Why do you ask, Mr. Darcy?' He shuffled his feet. "'I do not recall seeing you with another bonnet.' "'You do not think I possess more than one bonnet?' "'What a poor creature you must believe me to be,' she teased. "'It is not that,' he began, "'not knowing how to continue without inserting his boot deeper in his mouth "'and struggling not to think of her, how he had last seen her, "'with nothing on but a nightgown and shawl. 
Mr. Darcy, I am in possession of more bonnets. I only thought it a kindness to remove the colourful flowers out of respect for Lady Catherine. Oh, he eloquently said, grateful for her consideration, and failing miserably not to recall the way her nightgown had clung to her figure. He reached up to loosen his cravat. Completely unaware of the discomfort she caused him, she added, That, and I thought it best to hide my remaining bonnets during my stay, to prevent you from crushing another. Richard roared with laughter, and while Darcy could not quite bring himself to laugh wholeheartedly at his own expense, he could not help but smile at the teasing manner with which Elizabeth greeted him. Darcy would forever be reminded not to take himself too seriously every time he saw a bonnet. Until women adopted a new fashion, humility would be forced upon him at the sight of straw and primroses. He covered his embarrassment and the heat covering his face with a deeper smile, shaking his head at his foolishness. That was a most unfortunate incident, and I fear my attempts to fix the mess I made only served to make it worse. I do apologise. Elizabeth tilted her head and arched an eyebrow, looking like an imp in need of a thorough... Darcy reined in his thoughts before he acted on his impulse and kissed her until she was breathless. An apology from Mr Darcy? I had not known such a thing to be possible. Darcy had not either, and yet he found the words surprisingly easy to utter. Her humorous reception of them made his admission easier to swallow. Richard cleared his throat loudly. I've taken a sudden interest in horticulture, and I see a splendid specimen requiring my examination beyond the potted lemon trees against the glass wall. Darcy followed his gaze to the opposite end of the building. Richard could not have placed himself farther away from them had he decided to depart from the room entirely. A poor chaperone at best. And Darcy felt the need for a chaperone. For the first time in his life, he did not trust himself. Chapter 19 Colonel Fitzwilliam hid behind a grouping of potted fruit trees and began examining the leaf that had captured his attention, looking up at Mr Darcy on occasion as if to say, Get on with it then. Elizabeth attempted to check her smile, but the blush covering Mr Darcy's face was too precious not to appreciate to the full. It brought her comfort to know that even the lofty families of the higher circles suffered embarrassment at the expense of their relatives. She and Mr Darcy were not so different after all. Mr Darcy motioned to a set of wicker chairs placed between two palms shaped like fans. She waited for him to speak, but took pity on him when she saw how he struggled. Perhaps she ought not to have teased him. Taking on the serious matter at hand, she asked, Were you very close to Mr Berg? He shook his head, saying thoughtfully, I never was and it pains me to admit I do not feel her loss any more than I would mourn over the loss of a stranger. She was difficult. Elizabeth smiled softly. That is a kind way to put it. It is unseemly to speak ill of the dead, and I would no sooner malign her name without her here to defend herself than I would while she was alive. Elizabeth respected that. I find it is more a courtesy for the living than for the dead, Lady Catherine loved her daughter, and I have no doubt feels her loss considerably. She was blind to Anne's faults, and I fear she is greatly distressed at her loss. Elizabeth imagined how her own mother would react if she had only been blessed with one daughter, and that daughter were to die before she could fulfil her maternal duty of seeing her happily settled. It would distress her immeasurably. And her mother had four other daughters, a sister nearby, and a husband to offer comfort. Lady Catherine had no one. Has she come out from Mr Berg's rooms? she asked. Mr Darcy sighed deeply. She has not. I have attempted to ease her burden by seeing to what arrangements I can. But she knew Anne and I were not on agreeable terms. It would not surprise me at all for her to demand I quit Rosings the moment she leaves the room. Elizabeth had her doubts. Surely you do not believe she would think you capable of causing permanent harm to your own cousin. I would think that at a time like this, she would rather keep you near. She is alone now. 
Mr. Darcy ran his hand through his thick, wavy hair, his familiar scent of polished leather and sandalwood soothing her senses and wreaking havoc on her pulse. I worry for her. She did the same thing when my mother died. They were very close. He swallowed hard. Elizabeth held her hands together to keep from reaching out to him. She had thought him indifferent, but the man sitting opposite her deeply cared for the people he loved. She had sensed his vulnerability in his letter, and now, seeing him grappling with his emotions, she was convinced he was not the cold, uncaring man he portrayed himself to be. "'I have not been able to thank you for your letter,' she began. Mr Darcy's eyes met hers, so she forgot what she had meant to say next. "'I hope you alerted your father to the dangers to which Wickham could expose your sisters,' he said. "'Not knowing what else to do with myself, I have spent all of my morning writing letters. I did write to my father, making sure there was no connection between your sister and Mr Wickham's indiscretion. I only hope he will take my warning seriously and act to protect my sisters.' She had also written to Jane, but had decided it best to leave out the news of Mr Berg's death. Elizabeth did not want to add to her sister's sadness by burdening her with more trouble. "'For your sister's sakes, I pray he does as well.' "'Mr Darcy, I—' Elizabeth stopped short. How could she possibly express the depth of gratitude she felt toward him for exposing Mr Wickham's sin for the protection of her own sisters at the expense of his pride? She felt his intense gaze on her, and she knew how important her words were to him. I have four sisters whom I love very much. If anyone were to attempt to threaten their happiness, and especially for their own selfish purposes, I fear I would not act as mercifully as you have done. Mr Darcy tightened his fists as if he wished to punch something. His eyes hardened, lending him a dangerous aspect that captured Elizabeth in the passion of his ferocity. You cannot know how many times I've wished to run him through with a sword, to pierce his heart as thoroughly as he broke my sister's. That was more in line with what her own reaction would have been. I burned it, she said, adding, I do not take the trust you have bestowed upon me lightly, Mr Darcy, nor the implications toward your sister, if the knowledge of her involvement with Mr. Wickham were to become known. I will not abuse your trust. My honour forbids it, as does my gratitude to you. She held his gaze steadily, determined he believe her unwavering resolve to keep his secret safe. He exhaled, whispering, I thank you. He shifted his weight, the muscles on the sides of his jaw tensing, as he rubbed his hands over the top of his breeches. Taking a deep breath, he said, Miss Elizabeth, I was not very kind to you at the Meryton Assembly. Since uttering those hateful words, I have attempted to justify them, blaming my concern for my sister, my own ill humour in attending an event to which I did not wish to go, and even the loudly spoken ambitious wishes of Mrs. Bennet. Elizabeth shook her head at the memory. Her mother had been overly pleased at the news of two gentlemen of fortunes attending the assembly, and had convinced herself that they had come to Meryton for the sole purpose of marrying two of her daughters. When Mr Bingley had asked to dance with Jane more than once, she was certain of it. My mother does not believe in keeping her thoughts to herself. It is, I believe, the greatest wish of every mother to see her daughters happily settled, Elizabeth said in her defence. Mr Darcy raised his palm in a gesture of peace. Please do not misunderstand me. I do not mean to criticise. While such open speech is frowned upon in society, I prefer honesty and openness above subtle manipulations and sneaky disguise. Perhaps Mrs. Bennet is wrong to speak her wishes aloud, but I find her to be sincere, and that is a quality I greatly admire. Given what you have observed of my relatives, I am certain you can see why. Elizabeth gawked open-mouthed at Mr. Darcy. Had he not thoroughly insulted her family only days before? And now he had not only found a quality to admire about her mother, but he had compared his own relatives to hers and found them wanting. She was speechless. He continued, You are correct to question my conduct. I did not act as a gentleman ought to have done, and for that I apologise. 
What could she say to that? Mr. Darcy had addressed her only remaining complaints against his character, in such a manner contrary to her previous impression of the gentleman. For yes, he was a gentleman, from his perfect wavy hair to the toes of his polished hessians. All she could do was admire him. And then guilt consumed her. While she had at the time had cause to reply as fiercely as she had done, she deeply regretted it now. She did not understand what had happened to effect such a grand change in Mr. Darcy. He was not the haughty man who had offered her his hand in marriage two days before. Smacking her palm against her legs, because apologising was all the more difficult to do when one knew oneself to be in the wrong, she said, I accept your apology on one condition. He sat forward in his chair, ready to jump to action. His eagerness both humbled her and softened her heart toward him. She continued, Pray accept my apology. He shook his head as if to interrupt her, but she continued, I misjudged you, allowing myself to be influenced by a stranger undeserving of my consideration. I spoke to you in anger of things which were none of my concern and which turned out not to be true in the least. It is my nature to lighten the burden of others with humour, and yet I was unkind to you. I am sorry, Mr. Darcy. It struck her that had she known the truth before Mr. Darcy had proposed, her answer might have been quite different. Her breath caught in her throat at the realisation of what she had forever lost. He had promised never to bring up the subject again, and she did not doubt Mr. Darcy would keep his promise. More was the pity. Not that she loved him just then, but perhaps she might have been able to. She watched his chest heave up and down, her words only adding to the tension growing between them. Not knowing what else to say or do, she chewed on her lip and clasped her hands together in her lap. Mr. Darcy, too, looked away. In a low voice, he said, "'May I suggest, if it is agreeable to you?' He paused, and Elizabeth's heart fluttered in her throat. "'That we begin anew?' She nodded, perhaps too eagerly. "'I should very much like to be your friend,' he said. Elizabeth's heart crashed back into her chest, but the disappointment she felt was softened by the promise of hope in his suggestion. Mr. Darcy may never propose marriage to her again. Indeed, her mind reeled to remember how she had hated him with a vengeance only two days before. But he was a worthy friend. Their eyes tangled, and only the sound of approaching boot heels pounding over the smooth stone of the floor pulled her out of the dark depths he permitted her to glimpse. For the first time she really saw him, his guarded reserve gone, she saw a man she was in immediate danger of loving very much. Colonel Fitzwilliam asked, What do you plan to do now, Miss Bennet? Will you return to your family in London a week hence, as you originally intended? It was a good question, and once she had spent a good part of the morning pondering. She glanced at Mr. Darcy. Did he wish her to stay? One could hope. I made the agreement to stay longer with Lady Catherine, and I suppose I should wait for her to decide if I should remain as her guest or not. She may very well wish me gone. Unless the great lady feared loneliness more than the constant reminder of having her daughter's guest in her home. The colonel grimaced. We will not know until she departs from Anne's side. It is kind of you to put yourself at her disposal. Mr. Darcy rose, as did Elizabeth, running her fingers over her skirts. He said... We should return to the house. I do not want to be away when Aunt Catherine leaves Anne's bedchamber. He held his arm out for Elizabeth to take, asking, Shall we? We shall. She rested her hand on top of his arm, his nearness filling her with the strength to face whatever lay ahead and, dare she say it, fondness. Chapter 20 The rest of the day passed much as the morning had, with everyone taking to their rooms, walking softly when they did venture out, and speaking in hushed tones, with anxious glances toward Anne's bedchamber. Darcy flinched every time he heard a door open or shut. He ran out to the hall several times, in the hopes of seeing his aunt. But hours passed, and she did not make an appearance. She even refused to see Mr. Collins, though he called several times. Sunday was bleak, 
Thick, grey clouds loomed over the dreary house. So many times had Darcy rushed out to the hall to see his aunt. He nearly missed her when she finally did depart from Anne's room. "'Aunt Catherine,' he said, as she breezed past him without so much as an acknowledgement, leaving Darcy standing alone in the corridor looking after her. Not even the maid looked up from the floor, but she followed her mistress into her rooms and shut the door firmly behind them. Darcy looked down the opposite length of the hall and saw his cousin. Richard shrugged his shoulders, but he could not hide the concern in his face. Aunt's cold reaction did not bear peaceful tidings. An hour later, she emerged from her suite, fully dressed for services, and insisted that her carriage convey the guests in her home to the parish church. She barked orders at the servants, and she allowed Richard to hand her into the carriage, but she said nothing to anyone else. Elizabeth clasped her hands tightly in her lap and chewed on her bottom lip. Richard cleared his throat several times, but seemed at a loss as to what to say. Darcy collected his arguments, for he was certain he would need them when his aunt eventually spoke. The longer her silence grew, the more certain he became of his need to defend not only himself, but Elizabeth as well. That was what concerned him the most. Mr Collins provided some comedic relief during services, being alternately overjoyed to see his patroness and grieved over her loss. He could hardly contain his elation when Aunt Catherine situated herself between his cousin and Darcy, although Darcy knew it not to be a gesture of favour, but of control. She had them on a short rein, and there was only one reason to explain her frigid oversight. Aunt Catherine endured the other parishioners' offers of condolences, with grave forbearance, pinch lips and curt nods, until she ushered their group back to the carriage. The house was within view when she finally deemed to speak. Her voice cracked like a whip in its sharpness. I wish to see all three of you in my drawing room before the quarter of an hour has passed. The carriage door opened and the footman helped her out, leaving Darcy, Richard and Elizabeth exchanging nervous looks. Fitzwilliam, I need you. Aunt Catherine exclaimed. Richard clambered out of the coach and rushed to her side with a bewildered expression. Darcy alighted, assisting Elizabeth out of the coach. In a whisper, she said, I've been on pins and needles all morning. It is almost a relief she has spoken. But what do you think she intends to do? Darcy had not the faintest idea, but the knots in his stomach predicted it would not be good. Whatever it is, I wish it done without delay. Anything is preferable to this uncertain anguish. Elizabeth seemed to take courage in his words, stiffening her spine and lifting her chin to the becoming angle that always made him want to kiss the tip of her pert nose. He focused on the bottom of Aunt Catherine's hem, disappearing through the entrance hall, to prevent himself from making an inappropriate and most likely unwanted gesture. Elizabeth looked at him differently now, though. She blushed whenever he offered her his arm, the pink blossoms in her cheeks lending a pleasing shimmer to her warm eyes. Could she ever love him as much as he adored her? He turned to her in the entrance hall and managed to smile, though he was certain it was a weak one. I will see you shortly in the drawing room. She tried to return her usual cheer, but her expressive nature was too honest to conceal her apprehension. He watched Elizabeth as she ascended the stairs, imagining how graceful she would appear at his home in Pemberley, that she would win over the hearts of his servants and tenants before a fortnight had passed, he was certain. She had won his in one evening. Precisely at the time Aunt Catherine had requested their presence, Darcy entered the drawing-room with Richard and Elizabeth. As was her custom, Aunt Catherine let them stand before her for a considerable time, before allowing them to sit in the three chairs facing her. Mrs Jenkinson sat on the couch, the empty space between the ladies a blatant reminder of Anne's absence. Aunt Catherine looked at each of them coolly before she spoke. You can be at no loss as to why I called you. Darcy's patience snapped. Would she prolong their suffering? As to that, Aunt Catherine, you were mistaken. She flared her nostrils and stabbed her cane with a crack that pierced through the rug on the floor. Anne was murdered. I'm certain of it. 
Darcy moved forward in his chair. What proof did you discover? he asked eagerly. Nothing happens in this house without my knowledge. My do- Her voice cracked, and she swallowed hard before she could continue. Anne's health was improving. For the first time in her life, she felt well enough to make plans of her own. We were to enjoy a London season together. Aunt Catherine grasped her cane with both hands, visibly struggling to maintain her composure. It pained Darcy to see her so nearly undone. However, he marvelled at how little his aunt knew of Anne's plans. Would she believe it? Elizabeth said, Please, Lady Catherine, if there is any way in which we may be of assistance to you, I am certain I not only speak for myself but for your nephews, when I beg of you to allow us to help. Aunt Catherine's eyes snapped to Elizabeth. You impertinent child! What makes you believe yourself more qualified to see justice served to my murdered daughter than me? Elizabeth was smart enough to know not to reply. In a voice Darcy had only heard Richard use with his own mother and his most beloved horse, Richard said, Tell us what you wish us to do, aunt, and we will see to it. Do you wish for me to fetch the coroner and the constable so they may do an inquest? No, I do not wish for strangers to roam around my home or to inspect Anne as if she were a commoner. The magistrate is taking the waters at Bath and will not return for another week. I aim to apprehend the murderer responsible for Anne's death and hand him or her over on his return. Him or her? A shiver ran through Darcy's limbs. Do you wish for me to send for an inspector? I know of a discreet man several of our peers have used with satisfaction, suggested Richard. Absolutely not. This is a family affair. I will not have a word of this spread, nor will I allow it to become fodder for the newspapers, when any fool would discern that the most likely suspect is my own nephew. She looked pointedly at Darcy. Darcy had prepared himself for the accusation, but that did not make it any less devastating to bear. He returned her piercing stare. He had nothing to hide. Him or her, aunt had said. So long as the strength of the evidence, which Darcy had to admit was damning, kept Aunt Catherine's accusations far from Elizabeth, he would endure his aunt's suspicions for her sake. He answered his aunt's challenge. I have never made a secret of my lack of feelings for Anne. I never hid my intentions to choose my own bride rather than marry her. Aunt Catherine snapped. I suppose you did not like it much when she suggested your engagement be announced at the ball. You would have had no choice in the matter but to marry her, once it became known to a crowd of people. He said calmly, I would have prevented her from making such an announcement in the first place. Aunt Catherine raised the pointy end of her cane at him, her face turning a startling shade of red. By all rights and purposes, you did just that! I did not kill Anne, Darcy growled through clenched teeth. It was growing impossible to keep possession of his control. Aunt Catherine lowered her cane. That is what I aim to determine before the week ends. You are the only son of my dearest sister, my beloved Anne. But do not think for a moment that our familiar connection will spare you from the hangman's noose if I determine you are guilty. She shook with passion. Surely, Lady Catherine, you must have more suspects in mind than Mr. Darcy, Elizabeth exclaimed. Oh, that she would remain silent, lest she draw more attention to herself, Darcy prayed. Aunt Catherine raised an eyebrow and scoffed. And why do you suppose I insist you stay until my investigation is complete, Miss Bennet? Or do you think I am capable of easily overlooking the fact that my only daughter died on the evening of your arrival at Rosings. I do not know if you had a motive against her, but I will find it if there is one. Darcy groaned inwardly. One word was all it would take for Aunt Catherine's suspicions to shift from him to Elizabeth. Darcy tried to draw his aunt's attention back to himself. What do you want us to do, then? Sit idly by while you determine our fate. If you have reason to believe Anne was murdered... Would your investigation not meet with greater success if you allowed us to assist you? 
Whether she gave him permission or not, Darcy was determined to find the truth. And give you the perfect opportunity to hide what evidence there may be, if you are indeed guilty. I'm not a fool, Darcy. Fitzwilliam is the only person I trust in this room, and I will guarantee his loyalty to me by offering him a reward he will not refuse. Richard balked. I cannot be bought. I will assist you of my own free will, because I do not believe Darcy guilty of committing such a horrible crime against our cousin, no matter what threat she made against him. It is in all of our best interests to find the person responsible and see justice served. Aunt Catherine dismissed his protest with a deprecatory wave. I have already sent the letter to my solicitor, so there is no need to be contrary, Fitzwilliam. However, your reaction pleases me greatly, and I trust you will not allow Darcy or Miss Bennet to leave the property. I have already instructed the servants not to let either of them out of their sight. Darcy tried to give consideration to his aunt's tumultuous emotions, but his blood boiled. She would hold them like criminals at Rosings, without offering any proof on which to base her suspicions, and she had called Elizabeth insolent. From the corner of his eye, he saw the set of Elizabeth's jaw and the tension in her squared shoulders. She looked every bit as determined as he felt. Darcy's motivation was high, for until he discovered the truth of Anne's final hours, Elizabeth was in danger, and they were prisoners at Rosings. Chapter 21 Elizabeth paced in her room until well past dark, she treasured her freedom too much to allow someone like Lady Catherine de Bourgh to jeopardise it. Who did she think she was, acting like a nougat guard? And then there was Mr Darcy. Elizabeth did not believe for a moment he had murdered his venomous cousin merely to escape from an unwanted match. For one, intelligent individuals would never murder someone after a verbal dispute with witnesses, and Mr Darcy was no fool. Second, had he held so little value for life, he would have found a way to dispose of Mr Wickham and forever silence the blackguard. The fact that Mr Wickham was still alive was, in Elizabeth's mind, a strong testimony to Mr Darcy's innocence. Well, Lady Catherine could regard them with all the suspicion she dared, which was quite a great deal given her blunt speech after services, but Elizabeth refused to twiddle her thumbs while her independence and reputation stood in the balance. The great lady may be content to watch her nephew hang to appease her own grief, but Elizabeth would not stand for it. She had a plan. Donning her darkest dress, she grabbed a hairpin and crept down the pitch-black corridor toward Mr Berg's bedchamber. If Lady Catherine would not provide any clues, Elizabeth saw no other option but to find them herself. Running her fingers over the wall, she felt for the intricate carvings on Mr Berg's door and then the cold iron of the knob. Carefully, she twisted it, only to have her suspicion confirmed. It was locked. It would be imprudent to leave a door unlocked with murderers in the house, Elizabeth thought saucily. But she was prepared. She had a hairpin. What she would give for a candle. Fumbling in the darkness, every scratch and scrape echoing down the empty hall, she wished she possessed the same level of talent her younger sisters had, when they broke into rooms they had been told to keep out of. No matter how many times Cook changed her method of securing the pantry, Kitty and Lydia always got the last of the treats hidden within. What are you doing here? Elizabeth pounced up to a standing position at the sound of the low baritone behind her and lashed out at the speaker with her hands. It was not until her hairpin-wielding hand made contact with something solid that she realised who the intruder was. He was close enough. His sandalwood and leather scent flirted with her senses. "'Mr Darcy, you startled me,' she said, retracting her hand from his person before she embarrassed herself further. It was not proper for a maiden to think of the contrast of a gentleman's chiselled form beneath the soft linen over which her fingers had brushed. Just the thought sent a shiver down her spine and momentarily shook all intelligent speech from her brain." I apologise, but that does not answer my question. What are you doing here? She was grateful for the darkness disguising her hot cheeks. She did not know how to reply until it occurred to her 
that Mr. Darcy had no more reason to be roaming the halls of Rosings in the wee hours of the morning than she had. Crossing her arms and recovering her wit, she said, I might perhaps answer your question if you will answer what you are doing here. The same thing you are, I fear, he whispered. She heard the displeasure in his tone, but what had he expected her to do? She felt something brush past her cheek and over her hair, and Mr. Darcy said, "'My apologies, Miss Elizabeth. "'Would you kindly step to the side so I may open the door?' "'His politeness did nothing to conceal his obvious desire for her to leave. "'She planted her feet wider. "'It is locked,' she said smugly. "'Unless he had a better plan, he needed her and her hairpin. "'I have the key,' he said. "'Well, so much for that.' "'The key?' she asked, as she stepped to the side, more out of astonishment than cooperation. I asked Mrs. Beaton for it. She is convinced of my innocence and did not hesitate to lend it to me, he said, the metal keys clicking in the door. Why had she not considered that? Of course, Mrs. Beaton had no reason to trust her, whereas she had probably known Mr. Darcy since he was in leading strings. Elizabeth was quick to reassure him. I know you did not do it just as certainly as I know I did not. But it was frustrating how Lady Catherine seemed so certain against you, and yet she offered no proof on which to base her suspicion. So you felt it appropriate to break into the scene where Anne was last known to be alive? Elizabeth huffed. You would bring up propriety at a time like this, when your aunt has threatened to watch you hang. Elizabeth felt a puff of draughty air wave past her. The door was open. Unwilling to turn away, she shoved the hairpin into her hair and charged forward before he could ask her to leave. Speaking of which, Mr Darcy said so near, she felt his breath ruffling her hair and the warmth from his body. She ought to have stepped away, but her feet refused to budge. Her muscles went limp, so that she thought it a miracle she did not melt into the carpet on Mr Berg's bedchamber floor. He continued his velvety baritone like smooth satin against her raised face. We must not be seen together. I will wait by the door while you search. How gentlemanly, and pleasantly unexpected. Elizabeth waited for him to step away, her limbs stubbornly stuck in place as she pondered Mr Darcy's finer points, and she waited some more, his breath puffing against her cheeks. Mr Darcy... Perhaps the darkness has disoriented you. The doorway is over there. She raised her hand to point, the linen of his shirt brushing over her knuckles and sending shivers down her arm, before she realised he could not see where she pointed. She really ought to have brought a candle. He caught her hand in his, pressing it to his chest so that his heartbeat pounded against her palm. Oh, my! she gasped the intimacy of her hand cradled between his bare hand and his chest, mesmerising her. She rose to her toes, pulled up by a force stronger than her logic and wobbly knees, a spell cast upon her by his nearness, and the essence she would forever associate with Mr Darcy. His breath tickled the hair by her ear. He leaned down to her, his smouldering eyes captivating her in their warming glow. Her every nerve was on fire and in a crash she jumped back at the realisation that the flame reflecting off his pupils was quite real. Someone had brought a candle. Colonel Fitzwilliam chuckled quietly, a lamp in one hand. Now that was a pleasant sight. I am sorry to have disturbed your... He waved his hand in the air, as if grasping for the right word. A moment, he concluded. Elizabeth wished the floor would open up and swallow her, she would have kissed Mr. Darcy in a dark bedchamber. No, she could no longer think of him so formally. Darcy? No, that was what his relations called him. Fitzwilliam? No, she did not wish to think of him and the Colonel at the use of their shared name. William? Ah, oh, she liked the sound of that. Both gentlemen stopped their discussion abruptly and stared at her. Dear Lord, had she voiced her thoughts aloud? What? she asked timidly. You said my name. You called me William. He did not seem displeased at her presumption, 
but, oh, the mortification. Elizabeth squeezed her eyes shut, like she used to do when she was a little girl and wanted to disappear, only she was old enough to know it did not work. She would hide her discomfort with humour, as she always did. With a shrug and a smile, she opened her eyes and said, "'What? It is a fine name. And how fortunate you should bring a lamp with you, Colonel. Your presence will make our search much easier, without having to worry about propriety.' William glared at his cousin, who would say what he wished, despite William's threatening looks. Colonel Fitzwilliam chortled. "'It did not appear to me that either of you were overly concerned about propriety, but I am happy to be of service all the same.' Elizabeth's face burned, but she kept her smile intact. Of what use was humour if she could not laugh at herself? Indeed, had the Colonel not given her an excuse to smile, she feared she would have grinned like a fool anyway.' William had almost kissed her. What was worse, she had wanted him to. More than she had ever wanted anything before in her life, she had wanted him to kiss her. She turned, occupying herself by removing cushions from a nearby settee and ensuring nothing out of place was tucked behind them. Colonel Fitzwilliam asked, "'For what are we searching?' William answered, "'Anything out of place,' at the same time she did. "'Awkward.' She turned back to the settee before the grin overtook her face again. Focus, Elizabeth, focus. She set the last cushion down and stood erect. Unless she found an empty poison bottle, she was wasting her time with the furniture. It had to have been some sort of poison, she said, adding, There would have been blood with a knife. We would have heard a pistol shot. There would have been bruises around her neck had she been strangled. Unless someone managed to enter her room and smother her with a pillow. She stopped herself, the images in her mind too grotesque to continue. The colonel said, I see someone enjoys reading gothic novels. I will attempt to discern if Aunt Catherine saw any marks on Anne, which might serve as a clue. She prepared the body and would have noticed anything out of the ordinary. William rubbed his fingers over his chin. That would mean that whoever killed Anne is someone who resides in the house. Someone with access to this room. Elizabeth sighed. With as many servants as her ladyship employs, that does not do much to limit our list of suspects. A list with only two names on it so far as Aunt Catherine is concerned, both of whom I am confident are innocent, Colonel Fitzwilliam said, folding his arms and scowling into a dark corner. Elizabeth followed his gaze to a small table with a silver tray filled with dark bottles covering the surface beside the bed. William said, Could it be so simple? His eyes fixed on the bottles of tonic. Elizabeth was already at the table. She counted eight glass bottles, with their contents clearly labelled, along with the name of the apothecary and his address in London glued to the glass. Most of them were nearly empty, with the exception of one. William picked up the bottle. It was full. Look at this, Elizabeth said, pointing at the tray, then swiping her fingers underneath the bottle to check for moisture. The silver is stained. Someone spilled liquid on it. William set the bottle back down, and Elizabeth reached for it, pulling the cork out of the top and raising it to her nose to smell. Do not drink of it, William said, attempting to remove the bottle from her hands. We do not know what it contains. Elizabeth pulled it out of his reach, and replaced the cork. Smell alone told her nothing about its contents. Thank you for your concern, Mr Darcy, but I am not accustomed to drinking unidentified liquids from medicine bottles, especially when I suspect it was used to poison Mr Berg. Her voice carried more bite than she had meant for it to, but there was little she disliked, more than having her intelligence questioned. William's eyebrows furled. What sort of gentleman would I be if I were not to express concern for your safety? He raised a hand to stave off her objection, even to a lady fully capable of taking care of herself. Having no further argument after that prettily delivered compliment, Elizabeth clamped her mouth shut. William continued, I sent for Anne's doctor. We should leave the bottles as we found them until he can discern if the contents have been tampered with. Colonel Fitzwilliam nodded. I will speak to Mrs. Beaton to ensure the bottles are not touched until he arrives. 
An uneasy feeling settled over Elizabeth. Poison. It will be difficult to eat or drink with the threat of it looming over us. William smiled, another surprising reaction given the gravity of the situation. I foresee several secret trips to the kitchen pantry in our near future, he said. The promise of venom-free victuals paled in comparison to the way her heart fluttered as William included her in his future. Chapter 22 The men carried Mr Berg's coffin to the family tomb on the north side of Huntsford's parish. The yellow parlour reeked of flowers. Elizabeth sat near a window, praising the heavens for every breath of fresh air sneaking through the draughty glass. Charlotte and Maria kept her company, while a scattered assortment of Lady Catherine's friends paid their respects, no doubt moved out of a sense of indebtedness and obligation than out of any real concern. Charlotte leaned forward and whispered, "'It is so odd Mr Berg is gone. I would not have believed it possible for her to have died of her illness when she was doing so well under the care of her doctor. But Mr Collins informed me that Lady Catherine refused to allow the coroner to examine the body, and so it must be true.' Elizabeth looked around to ensure no eavesdropper could overhear them. She's not convinced at all. In fact, I will not be able to call at the parsonage, as I am a prisoner here until the murderer is found. When Charlotte and Maria covered their mouths to stifle their gasps, Elizabeth realised how dramatic her news sounded. To be sure, it ought to have bothered her much more than it did. Perhaps it was the company she kept, trapped in a house with William. She shook her head. What a fool she was. There was a murderer on the loose, and she was dreaming about the number one suspect. Charlotte dropped her hand to her heart. Then Lady Catherine is most fortunate you were here, Lizzie. You are so clever. You will discover who the murderer is before the passing of a senite. I do not doubt your ability. I only pray you will do nothing to put yourself in danger, she said, reaching forward to grasp Elizabeth's hand. I promise, Elizabeth said, thinking how difficult it would be for her to place herself in danger with William and the Colonel watching her every step. Charlotte squeezed her hand. Good, now tell me how I may help. Elizabeth told her friends about the bottles in Mr Berg's room and their suspicion that poison was used. Maria gasped and clutched her stomach. What a pity you cannot visit us at the parsonage. I do not know how you will manage to eat or drink anything at all, knowing how someone poisoned Mr Berg. Elizabeth reassured her. The cook is a friendly woman who enjoys company and doles out samples from her kitchen freely. Like most of the servants at Rosings, she had nothing but kind things to say about William, and it pleasantly surprised Elizabeth to hear stories of him attempting to hide apples in his pockets to feed the horses, or gingerbread in his cap, for a family of tenants to celebrate the birth of a babe. Charlotte grew quiet, tapping her chin with the tips of her fingers. Elizabeth knew that look well. What is it, Charlotte? If Mr Berg was indeed poisoned, that means Maria and I ought to be under suspicion as well. Maria went pale, and Elizabeth opened her mouth to speak, but Charlotte continued. Do not dismiss us so quickly, Lizzie. I would rather my name and Mariah's be mentioned and excluded from guilt earlier rather than later. She had a point. How could you possibly be under suspicion? The very day Mr Berg died, Mariah and I had been only a few doors down in Mrs Jenkinson's room, practising on her pianoforte. I should think that anyone who might have had access to Mr Berg's bedchamber is under suspicion, and so I must make mention of it. I suppose you have a list of everyone who might have entered her room that day? She asked practically. I do, but I had not thought to put your name on it, knowing you to be in the company of Mrs Jenkinson the entire time. Maria's eyes widened. Charlotte was with Mrs Jenkinson, but I was with Mr Berg. She asked for me to join her in the library so that I might read aloud to her. Elizabeth asked, Did you set foot in Mr Berg's bedchamber? Maria shook her head emphatically. Only her sitting room. The girl looked so scared, Elizabeth patted her arm, as she would have done to one of her own sisters. I am certain the maid will confirm as much. Besides, 
What motive would you possibly have against Mr. Berg? None at all, Mariah answered, near tears. Charlotte acknowledged, You have nothing against her, but the same cannot be said of everyone. Mr. Berg was not well liked, and I fear you will have some difficulty sorting her friends from her enemies. Elizabeth mumbled, If she could claim any friends at all. Charlotte nodded in agreement. I think it best for my sister's safety that she should return home. That is, once she is absolved of any involvement and her ladyship is agreeable to her departure. If there is a murderer about, I do not wish for Maria to be exposed to such a wicked individual. Elizabeth would have done the same for her sisters. She would not rest easily until the villain had been captured and peace was restored. It was for that reason she had not made any mention to her family of Mr. Berg's sudden death. She did not want to give them cause to worry when she was confident that between herself, William and Colonel Fitzwilliam, they would catch the killer well before the end of her stay at Rosings. They simply had to. Darcy was ready to snap by the time they returned to Rosings. Five minutes in the company of Mr. Collins was sufficient for a lifetime, but an entire morning with him felt like purgatory. Five minutes in Elizabeth's company, on the other hand, had felt like what Darcy imagined heaven to be. He was both angry and relieved Richard had prevented him from showing Elizabeth how he loved her still, angry at a lost opportunity, relieved he had not made the ardour of his love known, lest she not receive his affection with the same care with which he freely gave it. He knew Elizabeth would not treat him cruelly, but indifference from her would be just as heartbreaking as an outright rejection. And so Richard's nose was spared. Taking a deep breath before he and the other gentlemen entered the yellow parlour, Darcy braced himself for the wave of nausea with which the odious flowers would rack him. Mr Collins took the shortest route to Aunt Catherine's side, his shiny face replete with practised sympathy. Darcy had never known any gentleman to bow so much as Mr Collins, nor anyone so able to effect such a pompous display of humility. Richard followed the clergyman, knowing his place to be beside Aunt Catherine. Darcy was grateful for his help, for the most part, serving as a buttress between him, Elizabeth and his aunt. Elizabeth stood in front of the draftiest window in the room, and Darcy needed no further excuse to join her and her friends there. She had stitched a black ribbon around the collar of what he supposed was her drabbest dress. Her thoughtful detail may have been overlooked by Aunt Catherine, but it was not lost on him. Not all the black crepe in the world could squelch Elizabeth's vibrancy. She was the rainbow after a downpour, a ray of sunshine peeking through storm clouds. She was hope, and as much as Darcy wished himself not to be susceptible to anyone, he was powerless to resist the influence she had over him. She blushed when he joined them. Did she realise how closely he had come to kissing her the night before? Had she wanted him to? or was he only making her uncomfortable? Oh, the torment of uncertainty! He bowed and exchanged sombre greetings with Mrs Collins and Miss Lucas. Just as he was about to inquire after his aunt, a gentleman carrying a black leather case entered the parlour. Elizabeth asked, Is he the doctor? Mrs Collins said, He is. What a pity he did not arrive before the burial. He may have offered some insight into Mr Berg's sudden death. As much as Darcy would have preferred to stay in Elizabeth's company, he dismissed himself to greet the doctor. Only she followed him. He ought to have known she would, and while he did not want her to draw more attention to herself than necessary, he was proud of her for taking an active role in her own life, when most ladies in Darcy's circles allowed others to guide them, out of fear of societal ridicule. Aunt Catherine treated him and Elizabeth civilly, as she welcomed Anne's doctor, no doubt to avoid appearing rude before the few gathered in her parlour. She struggled to keep her composure, however, when the doctor turned to Darcy and said, "'Thank you for sending for me when you did, Mr Darcy. I fear I've missed the burial, but I'm happy to assist where I might for the benefit of my practice and your own peace of mind.' Aunt Catherine scowled at Darcy, her black gloves squeaking as she gripped the top of her cane. Richard intervened before she dented the floor with it. There is a matter I am certain my aunt will have considered by now, but which has only now occurred to me. 
Darcy bit the sides of his cheeks to conceal his grin. Richard could lay on the charm when it was necessary, and with Aunt Catherine it was always necessary. Aunt Catherine arched her neck. Indeed, but let us not speak of it here, when such delicate matters require privacy. Let us discuss the matter in my drawing-room. Darcy followed them, giving his aunt little opportunity to dismiss him from their company without causing a scene. Mr. Collins, apparently, was of a similar mind, and deemed it appropriate to involve himself in familial affairs, a breach in propriety which did not go unnoticed by Aunt Catherine. "'Mr. Collins, why are you here?' she demanded, as soon as she had turned to face them in her sanctuary. The rector bowed acquiescently. "'I had thought to be of assistance to your ladyship during this grievous time of tribulation.' "'Where is your cousin? Where is Miss Bennet?' Aunt Catherine asked, with a crack of her cane against the floor. Mr Collins looked up from his obeisant posture. "'You wish for me to send for my dear cousin?' Darcy nearly rolled his eyes. Elizabeth certainly would have done so at Mr Collins's expression of endearment. The clergyman deepened his bow and continued. "'But of course a lady is more qualified to give consolation than—' Aunt Catherine interrupted. "'That is enough, Mr. Collins. "'You must leave this room and have Miss Bennet join us.' "'She lifted her chin. "'She is my guest here.' "'Guest? "'Darcy doubted the prisoners at Newgate would consider themselves guests.' "'Mr. Collins snapped to attention in a fashion worthy of an officer. "'Hand over his heart, he bowed repeatedly as he backed toward the door.' "'Of course, your ladyship. "'It is a duty to which I will give my utmost attention "'as you have requested my cousin Elizabeth's presence. "'I am certain she is aware of the great honour bestowed upon her "'to have your ladyship condescend to treat her as a guest "'during these tumultuous times. "'I pray my cousin will ease your burdens, your ladyship.' "'Finally he left, taking his myriad of compliments "'about a cousin he had snubbed multiple times, "'but was now his clear favourite, with him.' Darcy wanted to ask Aunt Catherine why she wished for Elizabeth to be present, but he knew she would not answer him with the doctor in the room. He could not divine her reasons, but knew he would not like her reply all the same. He read the same question on Elizabeth's open face when she stepped cautiously inside the drawing room. Chapter 23 Richard lost no time in suggesting that the medicine should be examined by the doctor since he had taken the trouble to travel from London, a suggestion the doctor was all too willing to agree with, if nothing else than to appease his own mind, and that of his living patients, that his treatment had not provoked Anne's death. Conveniently left out was any mention of their discovery of the night before, a tactical move of which Darcy approved. Aunt Catherine, of course, took credit for the idea, and Richard allowed it to encourage her cooperation. "'May I ask a few questions before we begin, your ladyship?' the doctor inquired, to which Aunt Catherine nodded her head for him to proceed. The doctor shuffled his feet and clasped his hands behind his back. "'Forgive me for asking such a delicate question, your ladyship, but might I inquire if in preparing Mr. Berg's body you found any questionable marks on her person?' Aunt Catherine's nostrils flared, and her chin jutted into the air. "'You may not!' Richard attempted to appease her. The doctor is not a fool, Aunt Catherine, and naturally he will attribute Anne's sudden death to a cause other than his medicine. We would do well to allow him to assist with your investigation. By asking indecorous questions, I refuse to honour vulgar inquiries with an answer, when all I require of him is to inspect my daughter's tonic bottles. Levelling her accusatory gaze at the doctor, she said, Perhaps the amount you suggested was too much for her constitution. As Richard had said, the gentleman was not a fool. The doctor visibly bristled at Aunt Catherine's suggestion, but he said nothing. Nobody said anything as they followed her upstairs to Anne's bedchamber. Aunt Catherine ordered the curtains to be pulled, flooding the room with sunlight, and then she dismissed the servants. She stood beside Darcy and Elizabeth, watching both of them intently, as the doctor crossed the room to examine the bottles. "'This bottle should be nearly empty like the others,' the doctor exclaimed. 
The cork squeaked in protest when he pulled it out and held it to his nose, his frown deepening. Darcy had to remind himself to breathe. Was the clue they needed contained within the tinted glass? The doctor smelled it again. Then he dipped the tip of his finger in the liquid and tasted it, his face contorting at the unexpected flavour. Richard handed him a silver flask, and he drank from it, swishing the spirits around in his mouth before swallowing. Breathe, Darcy, breathe. Wiping his mouth with his coat sleeve, the doctor set the bottle down with a resounding clank. I was very clear in my instructions to Mr. Berg that she not take laudanum with the remedies I gave her. She was aware of the danger of mixing sedatives. Aunt Catherine grasped her cane between both hands, leaning on it. She disposed of her laudanum bottle as you recommended. What did she do with it? Darcy asked, his nerves on point. She ignored him. There is nothing more to discover here, because the bottle belongs to me. Distress has made me forgetful. I requested some laudanum tea for my own use on the eve of Anne's death, and the maid must have left it here on Anne's tray. I will have to reprove her for her carelessness. We must thank the doctor for his trouble and send him on his way. Without so much as a rest from his travels or a repast, Aunt Catherine hurried the doctor out of Anne's bedchamber and closed the door firmly behind her with a steely look at Darcy and Elizabeth. Darcy would slip the doctor some coins for his trouble, enough to inspire forgiveness for his aunt's oversight and belief in her blatant lie. Mrs Beaton stood at the top of the landing as they filed out of Mr Berg's room, a hat-box in her hands. Lady Catherine arched her eyebrow. What is that, Mrs Beaton? Without pause, Mrs Beaton replied, The milliner requested we retrieve this for Miss Bennet a couple days ago, and I've only now been able to send someone for it. Elizabeth attempted to mask her surprise. Jane had said nothing in her last letter about a bonnet, and Elizabeth could think of nobody else thoughtful enough to have a bonnet made for her. Unless... Her breath caught in her throat. She dared not look at William. But while she could force her eyes away from the one person she suspected was responsible for the delivery, she could not prevent the heated blush from creeping up her neck. I wonder why they could not be troubled to deliver it themselves, and they wonder why I refuse to frequent their shop. With a huff and a nod, Lady Catherine dismissed Elizabeth from their group to accompany Mrs Beaton to her room. The housekeeper closed the door behind her, saying, I fear I've made a mess of things, Miss Bennet. Mrs Jenkinson saw me coming upstairs with the app box too. I should have hid it with Cook in the kitchen, but I worried how you would have managed to get it upstairs unseen. Elizabeth asked, Is this Mr Darcy's doing? Mrs Beaton smiled in answer. He is such a gentleman. He wished to replace it after the incident in the conservatory. It would have been done sooner, but I had some difficulty making arrangements after Mr Berg's death. Understandably, Mr Darcy could not see to it himself, or I am certain he would have received it sooner. Elizabeth opened the box and lifted the bonnet delicately between her fingers. It was an exact replication of the bonnet she had last worn in the conservatory, only the straw was of a better quality and the flowers were freshly picked. He had remembered every detail, down to the soft pink of the rosettes. It was perfect. Mr Darcy especially insisted on the rosettes. Did you know there is only one bush on the entire estate and its surrounding country with flowers of that particular colour? Mr Darcy scoured the entire property to find them, added Mrs Beaton. Elizabeth's elation was only tempered by the knowledge that she must maintain the utmost discretion if it became known he had given her a gift, even one his honour had bound him to give. Elizabeth dreaded to think of the consequences. She would have to go about the rest of the day, pretending as if she had not been the recipient of William's kindness. Uncertain whether or not she would have the opportunity to thank the originator of the gift, she embraced Mrs Beaton. Thank you. Mrs Beaton patted her back, then stepped out of the embrace. I'd best return to the parlour. If her ladyship sees a speck of dust after receiving so many visitors, it will be me to whom she speaks. She crossed the room, adding before she reached the door. I have a feeling things will work out well for you in the end, Miss Bennet. I'm happy for Mr Darcy. 
Elizabeth was happy too. She nestled the bonnet back inside the box, letting her fingers trail over the silky ribbons. She would not be able to wear it until she could leave Rosings. She could not wear the bright, happy colours while the household was in mourning. Nor would she replace the cheerful rosettes with a black ribbon when everything about that bonnet would forever remind her of William's smile and laughter. She would not alter it for the world. With every intention of entertaining herself in the library until the dreaded moment Lady Catherine should require her presence, Elizabeth went downstairs. She had not yet reached the door when Mrs Jenkinson appeared. Clasping onto Elizabeth's forearm with her shaky hand, the elderly companion said, "'What are you up to, miss? Not content to take my place. Have you set your sights on Mr Darcy as well? Catching him would be quite the feather in your cap.' A loud crack behind them echoed through the marble hall. Elizabeth looked over her shoulder to see Lady Catherine flanked by her two nephews. Had they heard Mrs Jenkinson's accusation? Their stern expressions suggested as much. On hand, Miss Elizabeth, and tell me where Anne's laudanum bottle is, Mrs Jenkinson, Lady Catherine ordered. Mrs Jenkinson lowered her hand and stepped away from Elizabeth. It is in my apothecary chest, your ladyship. Do you wish for me to fetch it? she asked, eager to please her patroness. Have you used any of it? It remains unopened, your ladyship. Elizabeth had not believed Lady Catherine's story that the bottle was hers. Given the esteem with which Lady Catherine regarded her own family, Elizabeth guessed she did not wish to see her name in the gossip section of the London newspapers. A murder in the de Bourg household would be the talk of the town. Lady Catherine demanded, "'Show it to me.' William asked, "'Why did you tell the doctor it was yours?' Lady Catherine gripped her cane. I am more certain now than ever before that someone killed my Anne. Do you think I would have him returning to London, where he would spread it in the newspapers? A pretty piece of news that would be. Colonel Fitzwilliam pointed out, It will happen anyway once you make an accusation. You cannot keep this a secret forever. If I am the one to give the information, I control what is revealed and how it is told. I will use my influence to garner support from my peers and sympathy from the public. A stranger would only drag my name through the mire. William folded his arms over his chest. And what if you determine that someone closer than you suppose is responsible for the crime? Lady Catherine snapped. Then God help him, for I will not. Justice is rarely merciful. Elizabeth was stunned. Was Lady Catherine so consumed with grief she would lash out at her remaining relatives? What of your family? Do you not feel it your duty to protect their interests too? Or would you make yourself the victim of their wickedness at the expense of your innocent relatives? She would not name Miss Darcy or mention the young lady's precarious future were Lady Catherine to condemn William, but it was foremost in her mind. Lady Catherine jabbed her cane against the marble. You, she said, stepping closer to Elizabeth. Why do you think I had you accompany us to Anne's room, if not to witness your reaction? Do not think I did not notice, Miss Bennet, how you did not act surprised when the doctor found the bottle of laudanum. Why is that, unless you already knew what was in the bottle? She paused long enough for her scorn to scorch Elizabeth's peace of mind. Lowering her voice, Lady Catherine added, Rest assured, I will uncover any secrets you have. If you are responsible for my daughter's early demise, you need not concern yourself with the consequences to my family when it will be your family to suffer from your unforgivable sin against me. I was not surprised because I had already drawn the conclusion that your daughter must have been poisoned. The doctor only confirmed what I had already suspected. Surely your ladyship suspected it before I did, Elizabeth answered, praying for the love of all that was holy and just that the lady asked no further questions. Elizabeth would not lie, but it would not help her or William for it to be revealed that they had inspected Mr Berg's room and seen the bottles the night before. Thankfully, Colonel Fitzwilliam intervened. I suggest we find Anne's laudanum bottle. There is no time to lose. Chapter 24 Darcy struggled to control himself. 
His mind ought to have been on the more urgent matter at hand, that of finding Anne's laudanum bottle. But what he most urgently wished to know was if Elizabeth liked the bonnet. It had been more difficult than he had supposed to have a replica of the original made, but the finished product was an exact copy of the image in his memory. He felt no remorse at the breach of propriety in replacing her bonnet. He had been the one to mangle it after all, and Mrs. Beaton was eager to assist him, having witnessed the unfortunate event. What proved surprising to Darcy was how much delight he took in picking out every detail, from the colour of the rosettes to the smoothness of the ribbon. It was only a pity he had to deprive himself of seeing Elizabeth's reaction on its receipt. They followed Mrs. Jenkinson into her bedchamber, a comfortably proportioned room, with ample space for a pianoforte near the door adjoining her room to Anne's. She opened the lid of a large mahogany chest on the opposite wall. The bottles tinkled as she searched through them, occasionally holding one up, to better see it in the light of the window above the apothecary chest. She took a long time about it. Darcy grew impatient. Aunt Catherine twisted her cane between her hands, and Richard shuffled his weight between his feet. Only then, after he had observed everyone else in the room, did Darcy indulge in a glance at Elizabeth. It would be more conspicuous for him to look at every other occupant of the room, with the exception of her. As a justification, it held up well. And his efforts were rewarded when she met his gaze, a smile turning up the corners of her eyes. Mrs Jenkinson turned to them, her hands fluttering over her breast and her mouth wide in astonishment. I do apologise. My eyes are not what they once were. I distinctly recall placing the bottle of laudanum in here, but I do not see it. Perhaps one of the young gentlemen will be able to see what I am unable to, if it pleases her ladyship. Darcy stepped forward before Aunt Catherine could prevent him. Fitzwilliam, she snapped, assist Darcy. Your confidence astounds me, thought Darcy. God forbid he attempt to tamper with the evidence or cast the blame off himself to Mrs Jenkinson by a sleight of hand. Richard must have had a similar thought. He said, I think it best for you to let me search through the bottles, so there is no doubt in Aunt Catherine's mind, on the chance we find some evidence. As much as Darcy detested standing aside while his cousin did all the work, he saw the wisdom in Richard's suggestion. He contented himself by reading every label aloud as Richard turned them over between his hands. As the amount of bottles searched became greater than the bottles remaining, Darcy's anxiety grew. If they did not find the bottle, they would not know where to begin to search for it. It could be anywhere by now. The last one was empty, but Richard lifted it to the light of the window anyway, and Darcy saw it. Richard gasped aloud. I would not have thought it true, but it would appear I was wrong. Laudanum, read Darcy. Aunt Catherine snatched the bottle away from Richard, and Darcy watched Mrs Jenkinson for a reaction. Had she murdered Anne? Well, she certainly had motive enough, and as much as he wished for himself and Elizabeth to be free from all accusation, her shock was either sincere, or she was the best actress Darcy had ever seen. Her face blanched, and he had to reach out to catch her before she swooned. Even when he had seen her safely to a chair, he maintained his hold on her arm lest she topple over. Aunt Catherine held the bottle out to Mrs Jenkinson impatiently. How do you explain this? Why is this bottle empty when you told me it had not been opened? Mrs Jenkinson's face bunched up like a pug dog and Elizabeth reached out to steady her on the other side of her chair. Richard handed her a handkerchief, which she fumbled in her trembling hands. Aunt Catherine jabbed her cane at the floor, clearly unimpressed with their ministrations. Did you murder my Anne? Violently shaking her head, Mrs Jenkinson denied it. Between heaving sobs, she said, When your ladyship has been so kind to take me in, how could I do such a thing when I am grateful to you for keeping your promise to my brother? In a kind but authoritative voice, Richard said, Come, Mrs Jenkinson, now is not the time for secrets. If you held anything against Anne, now is the time to reveal it. The elderly woman sniffed 
and dabbed at her nose. It will, will distress her ladyship to hear it. Darcy could understand her hesitancy. She would have to reveal Anne's selfish disregard for propriety and kindness, unladylike qualities to which Aunt Catherine had always turned a blind eye. Aunt Catherine said, I will hear what I must to discover the truth. If you will not tell me, I will find out by other means, and in doing so will have to add you to my list of suspects for the aggravation you have caused me. Mrs. Jenkinson's tears dried in an instant. If she had hoped for sympathy, she would not get it from Aunt Catherine. Grief had hardened her. I will own there were some hard feelings between me and Mr. Berg, but I did not end her life, she began. I first suspected she wished to replace me when I noticed how often she kept company with young Miss Lucas. But it was not until Mr. Berg invited Miss Bennet at Rosings as her guest that my suspicions were confirmed. My own miss wished to replace me with someone younger and livelier after all of my years caring for her in her illness. She wished to cast me off as of no value to her. Her chin trembled, and it occurred to Darcy that Mrs. Jenkinson had really cared for Anne. Aunt Catherine huffed. My daughter would never attempt to cast off a relation to whom she was well aware I had offered a place in my home. Sir Lewis made it plain to me I was to see to the needs of his sisters after his death, and I would never breach a promise made to him. Anne knew I would keep my word. Mrs. Jenkinson stood, her steps firm now. And yet that is precisely what she wished to do. She went so far as to offer my position to Miss Bennet. She pointed her finger at Elizabeth, who had helped her only moments before. If you ask me, it is she you should be looking at instead of me. So much for a reciprocating kindness. This turn in conversation was unacceptable. Darcy asked Mrs Jenkinson, do you have any idea how the laudanum ended up in one of Anne's bottles? And why would she not notice the difference? Richard added, no doubt to add emphasis to Darcy's question, and thus distract Aunt Catherine from Elizabeth. Yes, it is of the utmost importance we determine how the laudanum got from your apothecary chest to Anne's medicine tray without her noticing it. But it was too late. Aunt Catherine turned against Elizabeth. She would choose family over a lady she believed to be inferior. Aunt Catherine asked, Is this true? Did my daughter wish for you to take Mrs Jenkinson's place as her companion? She stepped closer to Mrs Jenkinson, giving visible proof of where her loyalty lay. Elizabeth answered, I refused her offer. And yet you accepted my hospitality. She gave me little choice in the matter. Mrs. Jenkinson sidled closer to Aunt Catherine. Darcy did not believe the former companion had killed her charge, but he despised her for casting the blame off herself and onto Elizabeth. It would serve the two ladies well if they were stuck with each other's miserable company for the rest of their days. Just when Darcy thought things could get no worse, Mrs. Jenkinson pointed her rheumatic finger at Elizabeth. "'She is a clever one, your ladyship,' She would have us believe she is here against her will, when it would be to any young lady's advantage to be a guest in your home. And if that was not enough, she secured a ball in her honour. Darcy said, A ball which will not come to fruition. If that was her goal, then Anne's death put an end to it and the motive is gone. Mrs Jenkinson's eyes darted between him and Richard. That is not all. There is the matter of the gift Miss Bennet received today. I find it difficult to believe one of her relatives arranged for her to receive a new bonnet from Hunsford's milliner when she is so soon to return to her family in London. Darcy gave his best disinterested look, lifting his chin and sighing in boredom. Normally the gesture came naturally to him, but not today. Aunt Catherine saw everything. Darcy could only hope she did not see how his cravat pulsed wildly over his chest. Aunt Catherine took a step toward Elizabeth. Who sent the bonnet? Mrs Beaton did not provide a name. Any suppositions I might have would be based merely on speculation 
and of no use to your ladyship. Excellent answer. Aunt Catherine, however, was not as pleased as Darcy was. She narrowed her eyes. You refuse to answer my question? I cannot answer what I do not know for a certainty to be true. There are enough mysteries surrounding us without me adding another one. Aunt Catherine's face turned red. You insolent girl! Darcy would praise Elizabeth's cleverness rather than deem it insolent. Aunt Catherine, does the appearance of a bonnet have any bearing on Anne's death? We must focus on the evidence before us. We know how she died, and now only require to determine at whose hands. Richard added, I hardly think it likely that an intelligent lady, as you have admitted Miss Bennet to be, would harm her hostess the very day of her arrival at Rosings. It is nonsensical. Aunt Catherine pinched her lips together, not once taking her eyes off Elizabeth. If you were not so clever, Miss Bennet, I could more easily dismiss you from guilt. However, you managed to secure a place in my household, as well as an admirer who has favoured you with gifts. Your apparent disinterest only makes me suspect you of using your feminine arts to secure the unknown gentleman's admiration on the basis of your association with my exalted household. Her belief that her exalted nephews would never deem to look twice at Miss Bennet was their saving grace. If she knew the truth, the consequences would be bad enough on a normal day, but with the poisonous need to avenge her daughter's death and appease her own grief, they would be disastrous. Elizabeth's voice trembled, but her appearance gave the semblance of control. I am well aware of the honour bestowed upon me by your ladyship, but may I remind you that it was Mr. Berg who extended the invitation to me, and it was you who demanded I prolong my stay. I am not here of my own free will. Is that so? And yet you accepted the gift, just as you accepted my hospitality. Had you no interest in receiving my patronage, or the inappropriate expression of admiration, you could have refused both. And yet here we are. Aunt Catherine turned to leave, calling for Richard and Mrs Jenkinson to follow with the empty laudanum bottle. Darcy hated how his thoughtful gesture had been turned into a weapon against Elizabeth. Aunt Catherine's argument that Elizabeth could have refused her hospitality was unreasonable to the extreme. He had been there and had seen how impossible a refusal had been. Elizabeth faced him before she departed from the room. Such a mixture of anger and sadness brimmed in her eyes he wanted nothing more than to wrap his arms around her and offer her what safety he could. And then a horrible thought struck him like a bullseye. She had not wished to receive the patronage of his aunt. He had given her no means to refuse his gift. What if she had not wished to accept his gift? Had he misjudged her and acted too swiftly as he had before at his proposal? Her whisper of, I'm sorry, before she swept out of the room, seemed to confirm it. Chapter 25 Darcy could not comprehend why he should feel guilty over replacing Elizabeth's bonnet. Was it not good and proper for him to have done so when he had been the cause of its ruination? He would have felt worse had he not replaced it. Around and around he argued in his own mind over the flimsy piece of straw, depriving himself of sleep. When the black night gave way to the grey dawn, he was awake to witness it. Kicking off the blankets, he rose to pace the length of his room. He would forever think of how the bonnet had brought him and Elizabeth together, as silly as it sounded. Perhaps that was why he could not dismiss it. They had shared laughter. It had started a friendship. He still loved her. There was no point in denying it. Was it possible to be both friends and lovers? That is if Elizabeth could ever return his affection. He shoved his hands through his hair and trudged a path across the floor. The night before, his body had responded to hers, and he had not doubted. Even Richard had recognised the scene for what it was, a hair's breadth from a compromise. He could still feel her fingertips fluttering against his shirt and her breath against his throat. She had been standing on her toes. She could have backed away, but she had not. But nothing had happened. 
The relief mixing with his regret only muddled his memory of the moment, giving way to the doubt tormenting him. Why had she apologised to him before she left Mrs Jenkinson's room? Had she regretted her reaction? Had his gesture been too much? Growing increasingly restless, his thoughts dense like the fog outside his window, Darcy dressed and went out of doors in the hope that the morning air would offer clarity. One of the gardeners brushed his knees from the flower bed he tended and followed Darcy. Aunt Catherine had made good on her threat to have the servants prevent any escape. He would not be able to walk far. Darcy squinted his eyes to see through the morning clouds. His heart thumped with the enthusiasm of a puppy wagging its tail every time he saw a figure in the distance, and then would droop in disappointment when he saw it was not Elizabeth, but another one of Aunt Catherine's watchmen, ensuring he stayed on the property. He explored every path he had ever met Elizabeth on as the sun's golden rays melted the fog around him, yielding to a cloudless sky so blue it hurt his eyes to contemplate. He needed to see her, to ask her once and for all if he had a chance, before vacillating uncertainty drove him to madness. He reached the lane separating Rosings from Huntsford Parsonage. Had she found a sympathetic servant to allow her to call on her long-time friend? Darcy turned to ask the gardener, "'Am I allowed to call at the parsonage?' with no small amount of sarcasm. The man grinned, his leathery face creasing with lines. "'I do as I am told by her ladyship. I was told to follow you, and I have lived up to my duty. If you wish to call on the rector's family, then who am I to prevent you from doing so? I will only wait until you have done, and be grateful for the rest, sir.' Darcy could appreciate how a sense of humour would be helpful for any servant in his aunt's employ, and he thanked the gardener before crossing the lane. Mr Collins was elated to receive him, and Mrs Collins sent for tea immediately. Nobody else was in the parlour. Darcy settled into the chair nearest to the door, determined to be polite but brief in his stay. The flattery began immediately. Mr Collins beamed as brightly as the sun, saying, we are honoured indeed to receive the nephew of our illustrious patroness in our home. Her ladyship recently made some improvements to the parsonage, and her generosity is clearly reflected in the proportion of the rooms and the shelves in the bedchamber closets. Darcy mumbled something agreeable, and Mr Collins continued. I am pleased my dear cousin Elizabeth is a source of comfort to her ladyship during her mourning. Darcy looked to Mrs Collins for an explanation, but she shrugged her shoulders, equally baffled as to the meaning of his comment. Fortunately, Mr Collins proceeded in his conversation without any encouragement from Darcy. He added, "'The loss of her only daughter will leave a void in her ladyship's affections, which my cousin seems to have filled.' "'What an incredible assertion!' Darcy looked in astonishment at the clergyman, to think that Aunt Catherine would see Elizabeth as a daughter was as ridiculous a claim as Mr Collins becoming the next Archbishop of Canterbury. Mrs Collins poured their tea. I'm not certain Miss Elizabeth and Lady Catherine will ever enjoy the close intimacy of a daughter and mother, but I suppose it is better for Lady Catherine not to be alone in that great house. Mr Collins patted his wife's hand. Of course you would say that, my darling. You were not there when Lady Catherine personally requested my cousin Elizabeth's presence yesterday during a matter of extreme delicacy and confidence, he said condescendingly. Mrs Collins' lips tightened into a thin smile and she handed Darcy his cup and saucer. Thank you, Mrs Collins, he said as kindly as he could. Where is Miss Lucas? he inquired preferring Mrs Collins' conversation to that of her husband's. That earned a genuine smile. You have a younger sister too, Mr Darcy. I'm certain you concern yourself over her safety as much as I do for my sister. Miss Elizabeth is a good friend to me, and I'm grateful she told me of the latest news from Rosings. Knowing there to be a murderer about, I felt it best for my sister's safety that she return home to Hertfordshire. Darcy knew Elizabeth's loyalty to her friends and family was strong, but he wished she had not been so forthright. 
You shall rest easier, knowing she is out of harm's way. He sipped from his teacup. Mrs. Collins leaned forward and set her tea aside. You and I both know how troublesome little sisters can be, she said conspiratorially. What could she possibly mean? So far as he knew, Mrs. Collins knew nothing of his sister. Mr. Collins chuckled. Oh, cousin Elizabeth ought to know about that. She has three younger sisters of her own, and they are quite troublesome indeed. I would hardly compare Miss Lucas or Miss Darcy to them, though, my dear. While Mr. Collins was mostly correct in his estimation of Elizabeth's younger sisters, it grated on Darcy's nerves to have them spoken against. With the villain about, we must see to their safety. I applaud Mrs. Collins' good sense in sending Miss Lucas away. Mrs. Collins sighed. Although, with the militia in Meryton, I do not know if she is any safer there either. Villains take on many forms, do they not, Mr. Darcy? She looked at him for confirmation, and all he could do was nod. First, she had implied that his sister might be troublesome. Now, she mentioned the militia in connection with the villain. She was already privy to information about their investigation that did not pertain to her. What else did she know? Mr. Collins, never one to be left out of the conversation, when he could impose his superior knowledge upon others, said, "'Ah, the militia, the protectors of our shores and shires. My cousins seem to be quite taken with one gentleman in particular, a charming fellow.' Mrs. Collins provided the name Darcy least wished to hear. "'Do you mean Mr. Wickham? He is not to be trusted. Miss Elizabeth warned me of him for my sister's sake.' No maiden is safe in his company, and we waste our breath speaking of him here. She shifted her weight in her seat, her eyes flicking over to Darcy. What did she tell you of Mr. Wickham? he asked. Oh, we keep no secrets from each other. She told me everything. Mrs. Collins raised an eyebrow and inclined her head toward her husband, as if to explain her motive for not revealing more in his presence. Darcy's heart plummeted down to his toes. Was that the reason why Elizabeth had apologised? It made much more sense than apologising over a stupid bonnet. Had Elizabeth told her dearest friend his sister's secret? Darcy drained his tea, burning his tongue and throat. By what justification had she thought it right to breach his trust when she had told him she had burned the letter and had sworn her silence? How could she do such a thing? He felt sick. Elizabeth had lied to him. The woman he had believed he could trust, who had won him over, was no different from anyone else who had attempted to use him for their own amusement and selfish gain, and he had allowed it to happen. Mrs. Collins asked, Mr. Darcy, are you well? Darcy forced a smile and tugged at his cravat. I only feel the warmth in the room after having walked a great deal this morning. I should take my leave. He set his empty cup and saucer on the table and rose to stand. Thank you for your hospitality. I wish you a good day. He departed, doing his best to keep his composure. If his manners seemed abrupt, he took bitter comfort in the fact that they did not expect any better from him. He had been a fool to believe he could ever care for someone in the manner in which he craved, that Elizabeth was different and deserving of his trust. Had he learned nothing from a lifetime of disappointment? He had known better. He ought not to have let his guard down. With each step closer to the great house, his heart grew colder until not even the sun warmed him. Elizabeth left the library at the promise of a beautiful spring day outside the window. She had hoped William might find her there, the morning mist being too heavy to enjoy the flowers in the garden completely. However, the morning had passed and she had yet to see him. She wanted to thank him for the bonnet. She ought not to have apologised the evening before, the mistake of being seen with the bandbox not being her own. The last thing she wanted was for him to believe her ungrateful, or worse, unwilling to accept his generous gift. Lady Catherine and Mrs Jenkinson could choke on their heightened sense of propriety. She walked around the house and was rewarded for her trouble when she saw William approaching the rose garden. He walked with purpose, and she flattered herself that his hurried clip was prompted by his eagerness to see her. Mr. Darcy, she called with a wave. 
His head snapped over to her, and his gait faltered, but he continued, his expression grim and hard. She drew closer to him. Something had troubled him, and she wanted to offer her friendship and a listening ear if he required it. They were friends, after all. When she was close enough she could speak without shouting, she said softly, "'William?' He stopped an arm's length away from her. He looked directly in front of him and said through clenched teeth, "'May I be of assistance to you, Miss Bennet?' She staggered back, the harshness in his tone distancing her from him. "'I had hoped I might be of assistance to you, Mr Darcy,' she answered in turn. He clenched his fists at his side as he turned to face her. "'Yes, I know how you like to help your friends. Well, you have done quite enough already. Now, if you will permit me, I will take my leave.' William walked away from her, and she stood stunned at the change in him. Chapter 26 There were several times during the course of the day when Elizabeth's path crossed William's, and her spirits waned every time he turned away from her. The afternoon lingered mercilessly. Being trapped at Rosings had been oppressive before, but now. Elizabeth had not realised how much she enjoyed William's company until he deprived her of it. That he did so deliberately was intolerable. Why this unbearable avoidance? What change had come over him? She dissected every conversation they had shared, and she picked at her every expression and action. But the more she pondered, the more baffled she became, and the stronger her frustration grew. Dinner was a frigid affair. What little conversation they had was forced and meaningless. By the end of the meal, Elizabeth's puzzlement had turned to anger. Who did Mr Darcy think he was to treat her with repulsion without so much as a hint to its cause? Oh yes, he was Mr Darcy once again. Insufferable man. Lady Catherine rose from the table. I am greatly fatigued and wish to retire for the evening, she declared, leaving Elizabeth... Mr. Darcy and the Colonel to see to their own entertainment. Elizabeth jumped at the opportunity presented to her. As soon as the door closed behind Lady Catherine, and Colonel Fitzwilliam had the good sense to dismiss the servants, she marched around the table to him. Forgoing niceties, she asked plainly, What has happened? He gave her a look of disgust, before turning his back and leaving the room without a word. She gasped, her hurt at his cut more easily borne in anger. Even Colonel Fitzwilliam's jaw dropped at his cousin's rudeness. Elizabeth crossed her arms over her stomach, wrapping her hands around her waist, and stewed at his retreating figure. Very well. Leave. It seemed to be his solution to inconveniences. It had worked well enough to separate Mr Bingley from Jane. If he was too proud to speak to her, then she did not want his company anyway. There was nothing he could say to explain his behaviour and justify his actions toward her. She must have been right about his character all along. Mr Darcy was nothing but an arrogant blackguard, and she had been right to hate him before. If only her eyes would stop prickling, she would glare at him properly. And as soon as her stomach ceased its nauseating twisting, she would laugh to make light of her mistake. If only the lump in her throat would clear... She would curse Fitzwilliam Darcy for making her feel so wretched, because it was not until this moment, the second his indifference had crushed her hopes and trampled on her vulnerable heart, she realised she loved him. Blast it all! Who was the fool now? Darcy stomped up the stairs, needing to distance himself from her. He reminded himself that the openness in her expression was not an honest one, her apparent ignorance was nothing more than an act. She had fooled him completely, but he would never allow it to happen again. His dear sister's reputation depended upon it, a reputation which she had claimed to protect with the same loyalty she extended to her own family. Her betrayal cut him to the core. He had been a fool to trust her so fully, to care. Darcy, he heard Richard call behind him, Darcy continued to his room. He did not want to hear what he knew Richard would say. Still, he left his bedchamber door open behind him and sat in a chair by the fire. Richard marched in behind him, as Darcy had supposed he would, and closed the door a touch too vigorously. 
Pointing his finger as if it were a dagger, Richard roared, "'What has come over you? You were abominably rude to Miss Bennet.' He would side with the manipulative maiden. He did not know of her treachery. With a scoff, Darcy said, "'You would not attempt to defend her if you knew how she has betrayed not only my confidence, but she has compromised Georgiana's future.' Richard's hand fell to his side, and he sat heavily in the nearest chair. "'That is a serious accusation, Darcy. What proof have you?' Darcy recited to the best of his ability the entire conversation from Huntsford Parsonage. Richard stared into the fire, his jaw moving from side to side in deep contemplation. In conclusion, Darcy said, "'Is it not as painfully obvious to you as it was to me?' that Miss Bennet chose to share a confidence I had entrusted to her with Mrs Collins. Darcy did not expect an answer, being so convinced of the conclusion he had drawn that it surprised him when Richard asked, Is that all? Darcy sat up in shock. All, you say? What else is there to add? The sequence with which Mrs Collins conversed of our younger sisters, her uncharacteristic comments about them being troublesome. Richard interrupted, is true of every little sister in creation. Are you so proud you would deny that a Darcy is incapable of causing trouble? Mrs Collins probably assumed your sister is as imperfect as any other sister on the face of the earth. It is a practical comment to make, and true to her character to mention. He was impossible. You are determined to defend Miss Bennet. Tell me, then, how you can explain the mention of Wickham directly after Mrs Collins' comment about troublesome younger sisters. I do not believe in coincidences, Richard. Perhaps you ought to, he countered, continuing, how can you know for a certainty that Miss Bennet told Mrs Collins about Georgiana? I will allow that it does look possible, but nothing you say Mrs Collins said leads me to the undeniable conclusion that Miss Bennet betrayed your trust either, what I wish to know is what made you jump to that conclusion so quickly. Darcy sneered. You would have thought the same after hearing how she informed Mrs Collins of all the goings on here. She had no right to repeat any of the happenings regarding Anne's death to an outsider. Richard pounded his fist against the arm of the chair. And why should she not? Whom else can Miss Bennet speak to with confidence other than her childhood friend? She has few enough friends here, I dare say he added with a pointed glare. Richard could glare all he wanted to. It would not change Darcy's mind. If you are so determined to defend Miss Bennet, then enlighten me as to how you suppose I could find out for a certainty whether or not she has placed Georgiana's happiness in danger. Richard had the audacity to roll his eyes. She is Miss Bennet to you now, eh? Dare I suggest you ask her directly? Of all the foolish suggestions and trust the word of an accomplished liar. You do not know that. You are basing your actions on an assumption, an incorrect one if I am to trust my gut instinct. Darcy laughed bitterly. Am I to rely on the discernment of your intestines over a lifetime of protecting myself and Georgiana from the likes of ladies such as Miss Bennet? Disappointment fueled the flames of his anger. He had wanted so badly for her to be different. Richard shook his head. Years in high society has jaded you to the goodness of people. I pity you, Darcy. Miss Bennet is as fine a woman as you are likely to ever find, and you are so scared to let your guard down enough to love her as thoroughly as a gentleman ought to love his lady. You are willing to let her slip through your fingers. You will live to regret it. Darcy did not know which to object to first. He was not scared. She does not love me like I... Those were not the words he had meant to say. Elizabeth was not his kindred soul. He could never love a liar who purposely put his sister's reputation at risk. But the damage was done. So you love her still. I'm happy you have the gumption enough to admit it. Darcy clamped his mouth shut. He did love her. Blast it all. And as much as he wanted to deny it, he could not in honesty's sake do so. Richard rose from his seat with a heavy sigh. Darcy did nothing to prevent him from leaving. He preferred his own company to Richard's unfounded babble anyway. Richard rested his hand on the doorknob and turned back to Darcy. She loves you, you obstinate curmudgeon. Do not let such a treasure escape you, Darcy. 
Few men are as blessed as you have been. The click of the door echoed through the room, reflecting the emptiness in Darcy's heart. Chapter 27 Darcy chose to break his fast in his room the following morning. Richard's doubts had infected him with festering uncertainty, but he had made his decision, and he would see it through. Not having much of an appetite, he sent for the newspaper and devoured its contents with a concentration born from avoidance. The morning still being early, he devoted an hour to the completion of a monumental letter to Georgiana, in which he wrote at great length about nothing of significance. She would sense something was wrong. He crumpled the papers up and tossed them into the dying fire. The knock at his door was almost welcome, but the originator of it was not. Richard opened the door and stepped inside. Come, Darcy, let us lay our differences aside. I am in grave need of your help. Aunt Catherine has asked me for advice on crop rotation, and I know nothing about it. Accompany me to the library for an adequate book on the subject, will you? Crop rotation? Darcy asked. You should tell her to speak with her steward. She wants another opinion, and has chosen the nephew who knows the least about the maintenance of an estate to ask, since her more qualified nephew is currently in her disfavour. Now will you help me or not? Richard's agitated tone and his own restlessness persuaded Darcy. Very well, but let us see to it quickly. It will take you all day to read and even longer to comprehend if your mind rebels at the task. The idea of Richard suffering through a lengthy tome of mind-numbing text on a subject of no interest to his cousin brought Darcy a morsel of cheer. Richard groaned. The sooner you are restored to Aunt Catherine's favour, the better. I'm not made out for this estate business. Darcy glanced at Richard as they went down the stairs. Aunt Catherine has implied she means for you to inherit Rosings in my stead. I would think a gentleman in your position would see the advantage. Richard's mouth twisted in disgust. Well, this place? Do you really think I would ever be happy living here? With the memory of my vile cousin taunting me at every turn, and Aunt Catherine's garish furniture reminding me of how much I despise pretension and improper ambition. No, Darcy, Aunt Catherine may think she can bend me to her will with such an offer, but I am not tempted. Seeing it from the point of view in which Richard presented it, Darcy understood his sentiments entirely. Truth be told, he had never wanted the estate either, not with the responsibilities he already had, and his aunt's motive for naming him in her will. She had intended to make him feel obligated to marry Anne. Unfortunately for Aunt Catherine, Darcy valued the prospect of marrying for love far more than wealth. A love to deepen over the years, with a lady he respected as his equal, and who loved him, not for what he possessed, but for himself. He had thought Elizabeth was such a woman. "'What do you want, Richard?' he asked. Darcy had thought he knew exactly what he wanted for himself— but it had been nothing more than an illusion, a tempting dream forever beyond his grasp. He rubbed his chest to ease the ache. Richard paused before the library door. I only want what most men do, satisfying work for the good of others, and a woman whom I adore to come home to, who makes the days that are harder than the rest bearable. I want to hear children's laughter in my home, and I want my love for my wife to grow with every tender touch she bestows upon our sons and daughters. I want the challenge of living up to their expectations of me, and to feel accepted, even when I fall short. It sounded like a dream. Darcy ran his hand over his face. Do you think such a blessed life is possible? Richard smacked him on the shoulder. You will have it harder than most of us, having learned at a young age to trust nobody and to believe the worst of everyone. But I believe in the power of love. I believe with all my heart that it is strong enough to cover over the greatest of our imperfections. Even yours, Darcy, he said with a grin. He opened the door before Darcy could retaliate, and he saw her standing with an open book in her hand in front of the window. The sun's rays bathed her in a golden glow, and Darcy's heart broke thoroughly and completely. She looked like an angel, but he knew better. Richard shoved him forward. You two need to talk. Darcy pulled his attention away from the ethereal lady who had bewitched him body and soul 
to glare at his interfering cousin. Crop rotation. You could think of no better excuse than that, he grumbled. Richard shrugged. It got you here, did it not? Darcy shook his head in disgust at his own gullibility. When would he learn? He could trust no one. But neither would he back down from a confrontation. He faced her. She stood before the window, clutching the book in front of her like a shield, just as she had the day he had proposed at the parsonage. Elizabeth had prepared her arguments. She had enumerated in her mind all the reasons why William's, uh, Mr Darcy's, arrogant indifference put him in the wrong of whatever he would accuse her. That she was innocent of the great sin he believed her to have committed added fuel to her righteous indignation on being unjustly accused. But all of her bluster and bravado faded like a hothouse flower in the sun when she saw him. He looked like a man broken, and she wanted to fix all his shattered pieces. He blinked, and his composed expression covered over his emotion. He glared at his cousin and said something about crop rotation, but Elizabeth saw through his act. She sensed how her presence disturbed him, and she longed to smooth over whatever had distanced him from her. Colonel Fitzwilliam, taking his duties as a chaperone seriously, proceeded to the farthest corner in the room, where he grabbed a random volume from the shelf and buried his face in the pages, making clear he was present in body only. Some chaperone. William had not moved from his position in the doorway, so Elizabeth crossed the floor to him. She would set matters straight between them, rather than accept the emptiness with which his absence overwhelmed her. "'Please tell me why you avoid me, so I may make it right,' she implored. His eyebrows knitted together, and he winced as if she had slapped him. "'I do not know if it is possible.' "'Not possible?' Her body went numb at the suggestion that all hope was lost. Only her stubborn refusal to believe it held her upright. "'If you do not tell me what is wrong, we will never know.' When he remained silent, she continued— then please, hear this, William. If I have done or said anything to merit your disapproval and scorn, it was unconsciously done. He breathed deeply. Did you, or did you not, tell Mrs Collins the details of Anne's murder? Yes, I did, she answered defiantly, though her conscience had bothered her since the telling. She ought to have kept that information to herself. But Charlotte's blunt admission had ultimately led to hers, and Maria's pardon from any involvement in Anne's death. Two maids and the butler had confirmed that Charlotte had spent the entire time in Mrs Jenkinson's room, and Mrs Beaton herself had confirmed along with a footman that Maria had spent the majority of her time in the library with Mr Berg. Neither of them had set foot in Mr Berg's bedchamber, but William already knew this. He nodded, as if she had answered the question correctly, as if she was participating in some sort of test, and failing. And did you, or did you not, tell Mrs Collins about Georgiana's near elopement with Wickham? No, she answered immediately. How could he even think such a dreadful thing? She had given him her promise of silence. I have never spoken of Miss Darcy with Charlotte. I did, however, warn her in the same fashion in which I warned my father, a warning you gave me leave to give, about Mr Wickham, for the benefit of her unmarried sister. She locked eyes with William, the distrust in his expression making her desperate that he believe her. How do I know I can trust you? He exhaled, shoving his hand through his curly hair. Elizabeth felt trapped. Asking Charlotte if she knew anything about Miss Darcy was out of the question. Charlotte was clever, and she would make the connection that there was indeed a secret in the young lady's past. And while Elizabeth trusted her friend to keep her peace, William had no grounds on which to base such an implicit trust. I have always spoken plainly to you, at times painfully so. If you do not trust my word now, I do not know how you ever shall, she whispered, past the lump of despair choking her throat. Her future with William crumbled before her. What was love without trust? She pressed the book in her hands against the empty pit in her stomach, she had thought she knew what loss felt like, but it paled in comparison to the loss of hope toward the one man to whom she had willingly given her heart. 
If you did not betray my trust, then why did you apologise? He asked, his voice tight. Apologise? As agitated as she was, she could not recall an apology, besides the one she had made in the conservatory, the apology on which they had built a friendship, a friendship which now lay in tatters. In Mrs Jenkinson's room. Oh, that. I realised how bad it would be for Lady Catherine to connect you with the bonnet in my room. I've not had an opportunity to thank you. I realise you may not wish to hear my gratitude, but it was one of the kindest and most thoughtful gifts ever given to me. I do not believe in a good deed going unrecognised. And so I thank you. How bitter and inappropriate her words sounded in her own ears. But she did not know if she would ever have another opportunity to acknowledge his kindness. If they were to be her last meaningful words to him, she wished for them to be good ones. Elizabeth shook her head in disgust. What was this dramatic prattle running through her head? She straightened her shoulders and controlled her thoughts. She had done nothing wrong. If he refused to trust her, there was little she could do to change his mind. But she refused to take the blame for an error she did not commit. When he did not say anything, and the silence grew as thick as a wall between them, she mustered her boldness and said, "'Believe of me what you will, but my conscience is at peace regarding you and your sister. I have said nothing, nor will I ever.' With that, she turned to the seat by the window, and tried with all her might not to give in to the tears flooding her eyes when he chose not to follow her. She heard his footsteps echo over the marble floor, the sound receding as he walked away. Chapter 28 Elizabeth's only consolation for the rest of that day, and most of the next, was the hope that he was every bit as miserable as she was. From the sympathetic glances Colonel Fitzwilliam gave her every time they crossed paths, she suspected as much. Even Mrs Beaton smiled tenderly when they saw each other, the melancholy in her eyes expressing she knew something awful had happened. Elizabeth spent a good deal of time out of doors in the gardens, but their beauty failed to distract her from her unhappiness. The sun failed to dry her tears, though it did give her an excuse for her ruddy complexion. A glutton for punishment, Elizabeth returned to her room and lifted the bonnet William had given her from its box. Running her fingers over the smooth straw and caressing the satiny ribbon against her cheek, she noticed how the rosettes had wilted. Their sweet perfume clung to the bonnet, a reminder of what had once been. William did his best to keep himself occupied, while avoiding all the places he knew Elizabeth to frequent. He could not account for the guilt she inspired within him. His caution had always served him well, and yet he took no comfort in his choice to cut off his affection for her. Richard scowled at him at every turn. Even Mrs Beaton shook her head and frowned at the sight of him. The only solace he could find was in work. He met with Aunt Catherine's steward and did his best to concentrate on every word the man had to say about every concern, from poachers to crop rotation. It was a game of tug-of-war in Darcy's brain, between what he attempted to give his attention to and the woman who had captivated his every thought months before. To his chagrin, she won every time. Returning to the house to change before dinner, an occasion Darcy dreaded, he was stopped in the entrance hall by the butler. And good afternoon, sir. Her ladyship wishes to see you. Aunt Catherine was the last person Darcy wished to see, besides her. Tell her ladyship I will attend to her as soon as I have changed. He continued toward the stairs. The butler called after him. Oh, she wishes to see you immediately, sir. Oh, she was rather explicit on that point. Darcy turned slowly, prompted by the panic tinging the butler's voice. His own anxiety grew when the butler led him upstairs instead of to the drawing-room Aunt Catherine preferred, and his astonishment increased further when Richard met them at the top of the landing. "'Were you summoned as well?' Darcy asked. Richard nodded. "'Do you know what this is about?' Darcy did not know, but he found it increasingly difficult to maintain a calm demeanour when the butler stopped in front of Aunt Catherine's rooms and knocked on the door. The room was stiflingly hot, with the fireplace offering the only light in the dark room. Aunt Catherine sat by the fire, her furniture arranged in such a way as to give the appearance of a magistrate presiding at an inquest. 
Elizabeth sat before her, her back stiff and her hands clasped together in her lap. Her cheeks were ruddier than normal and her eyes sparkled brightly. She did not look up at Darcy. Before the butler closed the door, Aunt Catherine instructed all of the servants to leave. Darcy took a deep breath and braced his feet firmly against the floor. Straightening his shoulders and lifting his chin, he waited for the door to close and for his aunt's assault to begin. He preferred to remain standing, but Aunt Catherine pointed at the chairs in front of her. Shadows crossed her face, filling Darcy with the dreadful presentiment that he was there to face some sort of judgment, a judgment involving Elizabeth. Aunt Catherine stared at him with pinched lips and twitching eyelids. He returned her firm gaze. "'Did you, or did you not, call at the parsonage on Thursday last?' she finally asked him. Darcy felt Richard's stare on him. A bead of sweat trickled down the middle of his back. The room was an inferno. Yes, I did. Aunt Catherine tapped her fingernails against the staff of her cane. Who else was at home? She very well knew the answer to that question. None of the residents. As you recall, Mr and Mrs Collins were invited here for tea along with Miss Lucas. She asked Elizabeth, Where were you that afternoon? If Elizabeth clasped her fingers together any tighter, she would crush her fingers. I had stayed behind with a headache. You were unattended? Aunt pressed. Elizabeth nodded. Speak up, girl! Aunt ordered. That is correct, your ladyship. I was alone. Until my nephew called. What was said? Aunt Catherine said, levelling her glare at Darcy. Darcy held his head erect. He was unashamed, though if he could turn back time, he would have spoken differently. I asked Miss Elizabeth Bennet to marry me. Out of the corner of his eye, Darcy saw Richard cross his arms and drop his chin to his chest. Aunt Catherine cracked her cane against the floor like a gavel on a judge's bench. Darcy had acted foolishly, and he was unafraid to face the consequences. He would accept responsibility for his actions as he always had. He only prayed Aunt Catherine would not unleash her fury against Elizabeth. Of that she was undeserving. Explain yourself, Aunt Catherine hissed, her knuckles white on her cane and her face red. The spy you employ at the parsonage must have explained everything worth hearing to you. I know very well there is nothing I can say to appease you. He ought to have taken greater care that the maid not overhear him. As controlling as Aunt Catherine was, he should have known she would have someone at the parsonage to report to her. She pointed her cane at him accusingly. I am ashamed to hear how this opinionated snipe had more sense than my own nephew, she said, flicking her cane over to Elizabeth. How dare you propose marriage to someone so far below our circles, and while engaged to my daughter? Would you bring ostracism on our name? Ostracism? Miss Bennet is a gentleman's daughter. He defended her as if he still had a chance. Realising how ridiculous he sounded, he added, And I was never engaged to Anne. Aunt scoffed. She is a calculating, manipulative young woman who has used her arts and allurements to make you forget what you owe to yourself and your family. She has drawn you in, but it is nothing more than an infatuation. Darcy heard a noise, like fingers crunching, coming from Elizabeth. Though he could never marry her, he could not allow his own relative to abuse her when he could prevent it. You speak of Miss Bennet as if she cannot hear you. Is that the accepted conduct of a lady in the first circles? Darcy parried. Richard cleared his throat and opened his mouth, but Aunt Catherine sliced her cane through the air to point at him. You are merely here to remind your errant cousin of his obligation toward his family. I trust you to help me save Darcy from the inconveniences of a most imprudent marriage. The very words he had used to separate Bingley from Miss Jane Bennet. He despised ever having uttered those detestable, interfering words. Darcy swore to himself he would never again involve himself in a decision not his own. Taking a deep breath, he said, I am capable of deciding with whom I wish to spend the rest of my life. You take too much concern in my interests, and I thank you to respect my choice and concern yourself no further. Woodhead Bingley said as much to him, 
He had always been too trusting of those whom he considered of a superior mind. Darcy didn't feel so superior now. I am almost the nearest relation you have in the world, and I'm entitled to know all your dearest concerns, Aunt Catherine snapped, as if she had ever cared about anything other than her own comfort and prestige. I am under no obligation to you. My happiness is dependent upon myself alone. Not that he had done well for himself on that score, but that did not mean he would surrender his freedom to his self-serving aunt. How convenient for you that Anne should die, she hissed. From infancy you were intended for Anne. It was the favourite wish of your mother. While in your cradles we planned the union. And now I learn that at the moment when the wishes of your dear departed mother would be accomplished in your marriage, it was to be prevented by a young woman of inferior birth, of no importance in the world, and wholly unattached to the family. No, I will not allow it. Do you pay no regard to the wishes of your friends? Are you lost to every feeling of propriety and delicacy? Darcy raised his voice. How is it improper for me to make an offer to the daughter of a gentleman? In birth we are equals. As for Anne, I have never made it a secret that I did not wish to marry her. I will not be interrupted. Hear me in silence. You and Anne are descended on the maternal side from the same noble line, and on the father's from respectable, honourable and ancient, though untitled, families. Your fortunes are splendid. You were destined for each other by the voice of every member of your respective houses. And what divided you? The avaricious pretensions of a young woman without family, connections or fortune. Is this to be borne? A division cannot be made where there was never an attachment, he answered, hearing Elizabeth's gasping breath and seeing her face pinch out of the corner of his eye. She looked about to burst. Aunt Catherine ignored him. It must not, shall not be. If you were sensible of your own good, you would not wish for Miss Bennet to quit to the lower sphere in which she has been brought up. In a flash, Darcy saw Mrs. Bennet in his mind, the daughter of a merchant who had the good fortune to marry a gentleman. He recalled Elizabeth's uncles, men in trade. Hearing the objection, the same as one he had presented before the woman he claimed to love in his proposal, come from his aunt's mouth, made his stomach churn. Darcy interrupted his aunt's speech before Elizabeth could say something she would later be made to regret. If I have no objections to her connections, what is it to society to forbid me from marrying for love? He felt Elizabeth's eyes on him. He had overspoken. Aunt Catherine said in an ear-piercing pitch, because honour, decorum, prudence, nay, interest, forbid it. Darcy could not believe his ears. Interest. How is it in my best interest or any young lady's to deny ourselves of the opportunity to live happily? He wanted to turn to Elizabeth, take her in his arms and kiss her until she promised to marry him. At the same time, he knew he could never act on the wishes of his traitorous heart. She had lied, he reminded himself. She was untrustworthy, though he defended her. Yes, Darcy, interest. Do not expect Miss Bennet to be noticed by your family or friends if you willfully act against the inclinations of all. She will be censured, slighted and despised by everyone connected with you. And it would be your doing. Your alliance would have been a disgrace. Had she accepted you? Aunt Catherine huffed. He replied as flippantly as he could to her jab. A heavy misfortune for a certainty. I would ensure my wife would have such extraordinary sources of happiness that she could, upon the whole, have no cause to repine the loss of society. Richard snorted, and Elizabeth stared into her lap. Aunt Catherine snapped. You are no different from your father, unwilling to see reason. My sister never neglected her duty nor troubled us by putting her own desires ahead of her family's. I am shocked and astonished at your replies thus far, Darcy. You have failed your family, and your ungentlemanly behaviour in my household will not go unpunished. Do not deceive yourself in believing that I will ever rescind. I will see you suffer for your disregard for Anne's memory. Her threat angered Darcy. I am not to be intimidated into anything so wholly unreasonable as a promise made by two sisters with more care for their ambitions than for their own children. 
you have gravely mistaken my character, if you think I can be worked on by such persuasions as these. I am sorry for your loss, Aunt Catherine, but your persistence in using Anne against me as if she were still alive is not only unreasonable, it is diseased. Allow us to mourn for her, grateful that we are still blessed with life. He rose to depart, as did Richard and Elizabeth. Not so hasty, if you please, his aunt called out. I have by no means done. Heaven and earth, of what are you thinking? Are the shades of Pemberley to be thus polluted? Darcy clenched his fists at his sides. How dare she insult Elizabeth, implying that she was a disgrace, a pollution. Every muscle in his body tensed as he struggled to justify his own accusations against Elizabeth, with his need to rise in her defence. But Elizabeth did not need him. She stood on her own before his aunt. You have insulted me to my face, and before witnesses, in every possible method, and can now have nothing further to say. As such, I will take my leave. She stepped toward the door, Darcy and Richard falling in behind her, a buffer between the two ladies at odds. You have no regard, then, for the honour and credit of our family. Do you not consider that a connection with her must disgrace you in the eyes of everybody? Aunt Catherine said. Darcy wished for nothing more than to distance himself from the woman who would speak ill of one whose conduct was above reproach. Or was it? With a frustrated sigh, he turned. Aunt Catherine, I have nothing more to say. You know my sentiments. You are resolved to have her? Darcy froze. Elizabeth paused in the doorway. His heart was resolved, where his mind firmly refused to bend, tearing at Darcy with a conflict of his own making. Dare he ignore the warnings plaguing his mind and expose himself to the painful impulses of his heart? Chapter 29 He spared Elizabeth's vanity without extending any false hope, saying with the deepest regret, as you have pointed out, she will not have me. Darcy watched Elizabeth pass through the door to the hall until she was out of his sight. If only he could know for a certainty she was trustworthy. She only refused you to increase your affection. It is the way a cold-hearted lady without means of her own secures a fortune, his aunt called out. If Darcy believed that to be true, he would not love her still. There had been no artful trickery in Elizabeth's firmness when she had refused him, and he would not do her the injustice of believing her dishonest. In every way, she had spoken honourably. He walked to the door. Aunt Catherine's voice cracked across the room. You refuse, then, to obey the claims of duty, honour and gratitude. You are determined to ruin yourself in the opinion of all your friends and make yourself the contempt of the world. Darcy felt absolutely defeated. But he could not allow his aunt to have the final say. I am not in the habit of giving consideration to what others think of me. In this matter, I will not budge. Just ahead, he saw Richard waiting for him in the corridor. Darcy could not bear to look at him just yet. This is your final reply. Very well. I shall now know how to act. Do not imagine, Darcy, that your dream of marrying for love will ever be gratified. I had hoped to find you reasonable, but depend upon it, I will carry my point. Do what you will. There is nothing left to say. Darcy's feet felt heavy, but he left the room and brushed past Richard toward his room. More than anything, he wanted to be alone. He craved silence and peace of mind. But it was not to be. Not five minutes after closing his bedchamber door, Richard informed him that their aunt insisted they wait for her in the second drawing room. Elizabeth was there too. Darcy made his way to the chimney, the one Mr Collins had impressed the people of Meryton with, by proclaiming its value to be over eight hundred pounds. He needed to act. He wanted to strike his insecurities with the energy of his doubts until his body could take no more. Then, maybe, his mind would stop tormenting him. Instead, he was trapped in a room guarded by footmen and the two people who could wreak the most havoc on him. How easily he had risen to Elizabeth's defence. He could not have acted any other way, though it had pained him to no end. And Richard. Darcy had meant to spare his own pride by not telling his cousin of his failed proposal, but he could see now what a great mistake that had been. 
his only trustworthy ally, had every reason to distrust him, which put Darcy in the same position as Elizabeth. He could easily justify her treachery had it not involved his beloved little sister, and yet Elizabeth had forgiven him for his interference in her dearest sister's future happiness. Could he not extend her the same kindness and forgive her? Darcy groaned and leaned against the chimney, burying his hands in his hair and resting his elbows on the mantelpiece. He needed some space to think, and with Aunt Catherine's resolve to keep them under lock and key together, he did not expect to be granted his wish any time soon. He sensed Richard's presence at his side before he tilted his head to see him. His cousin's customary jovial expression was gone, replaced with a deep furrow in his brow and an equally deep frown. "'You ought to have told me, Darcy,' he said. "'I know it. Never before have I suffered from my pride as much as I have this past week.' Richard harumphed. "'If your reason for not telling me of your proposal and its outcome was to spare your pride, I can assure you you acted as any man would have done under the same circumstances.' I would have teased and tormented you mercilessly over it. However, the moment Anne died, things changed. You ought to have told me of your history with Miss Bennet. Oh, did Darcy know it? His stomach roiled at the consequences. Aunt is intent on revenge, and she would sooner turn against a young woman who would interfere with her daughter's happiness than accuse her own nephew. I fear for Elizabeth. Richard's voice dropped. You still love her? Darcy squeezed his eyes shut. I do not know how to stop. And the only thing preventing you from loving her freely is your belief that she betrayed your confidence, thus putting Georgiana's reputation at risk. Darcy opened his eyes. If she has lost my trust, my respect is soon to follow. And with that, my love for her will eventually wither. It feels impossible now, but I know it will come, and I should very much like to marry for love even if it is nothing more than an impossible dream. Richard cracked a smile. I had not thought you to be such a romantic, Darcy. It does an old soldier's heart good to hear such poetic expressions. The door opened, and Mr Collins and his wife entered the drawing-room. Thankfully, Elizabeth intercepted the clergyman before he could make his way to Darcy. Richard greeted them briefly, but it was clear that Elizabeth and Mrs Collins had many things to discuss, things of interest to Mr. Collins. Returning to him, Richard looked between Elizabeth and Darcy with a puzzled expression. There is one thing I do not understand. I can see clearly that Miss Bennet admires you, and yet she refused your offer. I cannot believe Aunt Catherine's accusations against her, when I have observed her to be too honest in character to use feminine arts against you, and yet there seems to be no other explanation. Darcy levelled his eyes at Richard. Do you really wish to know? he asked. Of course. How am I to be of assistance to you if I am unaware of your strategy? Darcy scoffed at the irony of Richard's offer. You have been enough help already. The worry in Richard's face softened his reply. Shaking his head and relaxing his shoulders, Darcy said, Do not worry, Richard. There were other forces at play. My own abominable behaviour did little to recommend my suit, and had you heard my proposal, you would have wanted to run me through with your sword. Darcy continued hurriedly to avoid repeating the incident in detail to his curious cousin. Do you recall how I requested that you confirm my history with Wickham to Elizabeth? Richard frowned. I'd forgotten about that, ingrate. Already having a poor opinion of me, Elizabeth believed his story. She saw me as the worst sort of villain— depriving him of a living and condemning him to a life without the advantages my father had promised to him. That must have been a bitter tonic to swallow. Darcy continued. Had that been her only objection, I could have more easily overcome it. What? There's more? By God, Darcy, what else could you have done to make her detest you? Richard asked in astonishment. Poor Richard. He had no clue. Darcy told him plainly. An individual of noble character, whose charm inspired immediate trust in Elizabeth, informed her that I was the ruiner of her eldest sister's happiness. He told her how I had separated Mr Bingley from a young lady to whom I held strong objections. 
Richard's eyes grew, as his understanding did. That was her sister. Now I understand fully, he exclaimed, loudly enough to draw curious eyes over to them. Calming himself and hushing his voice, Richard said, I had no idea, Darcy, and I cannot tell you how sorry I am. However, it explains everything, does it not? If you were to learn the lady had interfered with the future happiness of your sister, you would have acted in the same manner. His face fell. Which is exactly what you have been doing. He shook his head as he scratched his chin in thought. This is a bad business, Darcy. I cannot say I agree with your decision, but it pains me to admit I can understand it. Having Richard's sympathy did little to ease the burden weighing on Darcy. In fact, he would have sooner kept his silence when Richard exclaimed, There is only one thing left to do. I must assist you once again. Pray do not trouble yourself, Darcy pleaded. It is no trouble at all. Richard clapped his hands and rubbed them together. Then, before Darcy could stop him, he joined the party conversing with Elizabeth, leaving Darcy little option but to join them. If nothing else he would attempt to control whatever damage his cousin caused this time. Elizabeth had hoped William would wish to speak with her, and so it was disheartening when he crossed to the opposite end of the room to stand before the chimney. Colonel Fitzwilliam had kept her company until she suggested she had much to think upon and he could depart from her in good conscience to attend to his cousin. She could not help but think that it was all some horrible misunderstanding. If only he would speak with her, she would gladly attempt to repeat to the best of her memory everything she had told Charlotte concerning Mr Wickham. Surely his defence of her character before Lady Catherine meant there was hope still. He had left her too breathless and confused to say more to the great lady than she had, and no doubt her uncustomary silence had been for the best. A footman opened the door, and Mr Collins entered the room with Charlotte closely following him. Elizabeth was delighted to see her friend, but at a loss as to why she was there, as to why any of them were there. Elizabeth received them, taking Charlotte's hands between her own. Charlotte looked around her, taking note of the footman standing guard at the door, and asked cautiously, "'Lizzie, what is this all about? Lady Catherine sent for Mr Collins, requesting that I join him, but she made no mention of her reason in sending for us.' Mr Collins said, "'Ah, I see, Mr Darcy and Colonel Fitzwilliam by the fireplace. Did you know the fireplace alone cost Lady Catherine eight hundred pounds?' "'I had heard,' Elizabeth said flatly. "'Everyone in Meryton knew about the expensive fireplace, "'as well as they knew the cost of the glazing "'and the number of servants in Lady Catherine's employ. "'It had long been Elizabeth's opinion "'that Mr Collins knew more about the running of Rosings "'than Lady Catherine did herself.' When it became apparent Mr Collins would interrupt the intense conversation between the Colonel and William, Elizabeth said, Please, Mr Collins, accompany Charlotte and myself. It appears as if the gentlemen are discussing a private matter, and I am in need of your counsel regarding Lady Catherine. There being no one else who is such an expert as you on her character and her ways, I trust I can rely on your discretion and advice. Her plea produced the expected results. Puffing out his chest until his corset creaked in complaint, Mr Collins said, "'I am delighted to be of assistance to you, Cousin Elizabeth. While her ladyship's manners are misunderstood by some, I will assist my dearest cousin, as well as my benevolent patroness, by humbly offering my correct interpretation.' As soon as they had sat, Elizabeth said, "'Perhaps you can explain to me the nature of Lady Catherine's relationship with Mr Darcy,' I understand her grief to be great at the loss of her only daughter, and I've witnessed a resentful behaviour, which I must credit to the intense grief she is experiencing. To put it plainly, do you believe Lady Catherine capable of accusing her own nephew of the murder of Mr Berg? Lady Catherine's threats had sent chills up Elizabeth's spine. Mr Collins' face scrunched in thought. It is true, her distress is great. "'greater than I have ever observed. "'Grief often makes people act as they would not normally do.' "'Mr Collins regaled Elizabeth and Charlotte "'with a full description of the various consequences of grief "'and its many displays, "'none of which offered any comfort "'or even remotely answered Elizabeth's question. "'When he paused for breath, Charlotte said, 
I would not concern myself over much, Lizzie. Lady Catherine detests gossip, and I'm sure my husband will agree she would avoid it at all costs. Then why does she forbid him from leaving the property? She's treating him the same as she does me, as a prisoner. This was news to Mr Collins, who appeared quite astonished, and at a loss for words, opening and closing his mouth like a trout. It pleased Elizabeth to know her confidence in Charlotte had not been betrayed, not even to her own husband. Charlotte considered Elizabeth's point, concluding, "'I have no reason to doubt things are as you say, Lizzie. If that is the case, then we can trust that Mr Darcy will not suffer much. Rich men have ways of avoiding the courts, and even if he is tried, he would never hang. It is simply not done.' Elizabeth exclaimed, "'But his character, his family and his reputation would be ruined.' Charlotte's eyebrows pinched together. "'A most unfortunate consequence. "'But have you not always believed his character to be haughty? "'Perhaps a blow to his pride might do him more good than harm.' "'Elizabeth's jaw dropped. "'You cannot believe that, Charlotte. "'You speak as if your opinion of Mr Darcy has changed. "'Did you not tell me he was the most disagreeable man "'you had ever been obliged to meet?' "'Elizabeth was prevented from answering "'when the Colonel boomed good-naturedly.' "'I have no doubt but that my cousin gave every reason "'for Miss Bennet to dislike him, Mrs Collins. "'He is as troublesome as a little brother to me most of the time.' "'Chapter 30 "'What was the Colonel about? "'He was in remarkably good humour, "'given the seriousness of their current circumstances, "'and the scowl William gave him. "'He asked, "'What news have you of Miss Lucas? "'Did she arrive home safely?' "'She did. I thank you for inquiring.' "'answered Charlotte. "'He continued, "'This horrible business has put me in the mind "'to visit my youngest cousin, Miss Darcy. "'You have not had the privilege of meeting her, have you?' "'Elizabeth looked at William. "'What was Colonel Fitzwilliam doing, "'mentioning Miss Darcy, "'when he very well knew the Collinses "'had never had occasion to meet her? "'He met her eyes and smiled. "'Mr Collins said, I am certain the niece of a family held in such high regard in society is the epitome of charm and accomplishment among her peers. Charlotte added, Oh, there is no doubt about it. Does Miss Darcy visit Rosings often? William finally spoke. Not very often. Pemberley is a great distance away. His participation in the conversation appeased Elizabeth's concern somewhat. "'Well, I do look forward to meeting her when she does make the journey to Kent. "'I've heard nothing but kind things about her from the Bingleys, as well as her ladyship. "'It seems to me she is the sort of young lady to exercise a wholesome influence on her friends. "'I should very much like for my sister to meet her, if the occasion arises. "'I dare say she will be presented at court and make her debut in society soon.' "'Colonel Fitzwilliam gave William a significant look, and Elizabeth understood.' Charlotte would never assume Miss Darcy would be presented at court or enter into society if she knew the young lady's reputation was questionable. Elizabeth could have embraced the colonel in her gratitude when William smiled, the solemnity in his manners evaporated by the truth. He said, "'Nay, Mrs Collins, my sister has enough to manage, living under the watchful eye of a society eager to find fault with the smallest flaw.' I would rather not place the burden of perfection on her shoulders just yet, but simply allow her to be the sweet young lady she is. He looked at Elizabeth, and she attempted to convey forgiveness to his silent plea, while also communicating that he not allow such a disagreement to repeat itself. She never wanted to suffer from a misunderstanding again. It was dreadful. Peace settled over the room until the door opened. Lady Catherine swooped in like a hawk, with her piercing eyes intent on her prey, intent on Elizabeth. Behind her was the blacksmith, a burly man with large arms, who did not look pleased in the least to be there. Elizabeth's heart leapt into her throat when she saw the pair of irons in his hand. Lifting her cane to point at Elizabeth, Lady Catherine said, "'Arrest this woman for the murder of Miss Anne de Burgh. Darcy placed himself between Elizabeth and his aunt, smacking the tip of her cane to the floor. Richard, Darcy was relieved to see, blocked the constable's path. Mr Collins was of no use at all. God forbid he protect a cousin accused by her ladyship. He fell back against his chair, 
his failure to offer any defence a clear demonstration of where his loyalties lay. Mrs Collins, however, spoke. It is a serious accusation you make, your ladyship. Pray, what evidence have you to offer as proof? Aunt Catherine looked as if she would object, but Richard appealed to her. Come, Aunt Catherine, if the constable is to make an arrest, he needs adequate proof to do so, or else risk the reputation and the life of Miss Bennet. If you truly wish for justice to be served, you must state your reasons for making such a bold accusation. Anne was doing well until she came, Aunt Catherine seethed. Darcy heard Elizabeth shuffle behind him, but he did not look away from his aunt or the constable. That is hardly condemning evidence. She had a motive, you know she did, his aunt exclaimed, her face glowing red. Then voice it before the constable, as you will have to do at the next assizes. William returned her stare, challenging her to speak the truth about her daughter before an outsider. She sniffed, raising her nose in the air. Miss Bennet felt that my daughter had insulted her vanity when she offered her a position as a companion in our household. The constable did not appear shocked. Instead, he loosened his hold on the irons, letting them dangle in his hand. Elizabeth now stood beside Darcy, her arm close enough to touch his. A position which I immediately refused, explaining my valid and unwavering reasons for doing so to Mr. Berg in no uncertain terms. And yet you were to be our guest for another three weeks. You feared she would convince you in that time, and so you took the easy path and got rid of her. The veins in Aunt Catherine's neck bulged in her ire. You are greatly mistaken, your ladyship, if you believe I could not have borne her constant humiliations for so short a time. Stabbing her cane against the floor, she said, And how can you explain your attempt to ruin an engagement established since her birth? From the beginning you have intended to steal Darcy away from her. When you found out their engagement was to be announced at the ball we planned to host, you killed her before any announcement could be made. Aunt Catherine shook in her passion. Darcy interfered. Aunt Catherine... You must calm yourself. Think of your health. I will not rest until I avenge Anne. Then make further inquiries, for Miss Bennet did not kill her. If Miss Bennet's intention was to steal me away from Anne, as you accuse, then why did she refuse my proposal? Your accusation has no foundation and you are grasping at straws. If her intention was to refuse, then why did she accept a gift from you only yesterday? Aunt Catherine snapped. That is the work of an ambitious miss, eager to marry above her station. Worry pounded through Darcy's head and hammered in his ears. Elizabeth had known the danger in accepting his gift, otherwise she would not have apologised to him. Would his kindness, and her appropriate acceptance of it, be rewarded with punishment? Never. If that is the only proof you can offer, you have nothing, he said. Aunt Catherine waved her cane in front of her. What further proof must I provide? As our guest, she had the means to slip into Mrs Jenkinson's room and steal her bottle of laudanum to pour into Anne's medicine. She had sufficient motive, given her quarrel with my daughter about her future, and her ambitious desire to become the next mistress of Pemberley above all else. She would have gained a fortune and a large estate, and Anne was the only one who stood in her way. She nodded to the constable, who stepped toward Elizabeth. Darcy instinctively hooked his arm around her, placing her behind his shoulder. Her icy fingers found their way into his hand, and he felt her face against the back of his arm as she pressed against him. He stood solid, giving her his full support. He would not allow any more harm to befall her. Mr Collins sprang to his feet. With a bow, he said, I do hope her ladyship will not withhold her magnanimous beneficence from a humble man in the service of God, merely because he has been so unfortunate to be attached by familial bonds to one accused. Darcy gawked at the despicable man, grovelling at the feet of his patroness. Nay, Mr Collins, rather I applaud your good sense in marrying the lady who became Mrs Collins in her stead. Had you acted otherwise... I would have insisted that the Archbishop of Canterbury remove your status as the rector of my estate, based on the unsuitability of your cousin. Darcy felt Elizabeth's weight against him, 
He grasped her hand tighter when he saw the heat in her cheeks, contrasted against her blanched skin. She mumbled into his sleeve. Will this nightmare never end? Darcy could end it, and he did. He spoke before he had time to convince himself to act more rationally, though he could not hear his own voice over the pounding of his own heart. You cannot arrest her. I will confess to the murder of my cousin, Miss Anderberg, if you will set Miss Bennet free and never approach her again. Chapter 31 Elizabeth felt as if all the air had been sucked out of her. Her legs felt weak under her when William was wrenched out of her arms. She reached out to steady herself against the door that separated her from him. He gave up everything he held dear, for me, repeated like a chant in her mind, over and over. While the clear proof of his love made her spirit soar, she would spare him, a man too honourable and good, from the loss of everything Lady Catherine had taunted him with only an hour before. She started out of the room, intent on chasing the constable down the stairs, where she would figure something out. Lizzie! exclaimed Charlotte. Elizabeth turned and saw the only thing that would prevent her from stopping the constable from taking William away. Lady Catherine slumped in a chair, her beloved cane fallen to the floor. Colonel Fitzwilliam held her head up, the look of concern on his face chilling Elizabeth to the bone and stopping her cold. Lady Catherine was not pretending. She has suffered an apoplexy, he said. Charlotte waved a vial of smelling salts in front of the great lady, who now looked fragile and harmless, with half of her face drooping and the other half stunned, as her eyes searched the room for something it frustrated her not to find. She exclaimed, but her speech was slurred and unintelligible. Elizabeth would not add the burden of William's aunt's health to the weight he took upon himself. Rushing over to them, Elizabeth picked the cane up from the floor and guided Lady Catherine's hand to the top, holding her hand in place with her own. She was dreadfully cold. Cold like death. Mr Collins, fetch the doctor immediately, she ordered, rubbing Lady Catherine's hand to restore some warmth and encouraging Charlotte to do the same with her other hand, when she saw how it calmed the elderly woman. Mr. Collins moved from the corner where he had hidden himself into action with impressive rapidity. Colonel Fitzwilliam said, She's unable to hold her head up on her own. We'd best see her to her bedchamber. Charlotte placed Lady Catherine's hand gently in her ladyship's lap. I will fetch her maid and a few footmen to help us and inform Mrs. Beaton of what has happened. She will see to her ladyship's room and comfort. She scurried away to make the needed arrangements. Lady Catherine attempted to say something which they could not understand. Whether it was as a result of the apoplexy or her own frustration, Elizabeth did not know. But a tear trickled down her ladyship's wrinkled face. Elizabeth dabbed it away with a handkerchief and wondered what her dear sister Jane would do in her situation. There now, your ladyship. We will take good care of you, until your doctor arrives and gives us instructions, Elizabeth said tenderly. She took no delight in the sudden illness to strike Lady Catherine. Seeing the grand lady looking so small in her chair made it easy for Elizabeth to forgive her patronising comments, at least temporarily. Lady Catherine attempted to speak again, huffing in frustration when only drunken gibberish escaped her. A thought occurred to Elizabeth and she asked Mr Collins, who had only recently returned, to fetch a slate. Perhaps her ladyship would have greater success writing than speaking. He returned with a slate in short time, eager to do anything to please her ladyship, even though he would have fed his own cousin to the dogs. Elizabeth was grateful he had not turned his attention to her other sisters when she had refused his offer of marriage, but she pitied Charlotte. She must be miserably unhappy. Lady Catherine struggled to hold on to the chalk, but with wobbly handwriting she was able to form her letters. Darcy, it read. Colonel Fitzwilliam asked, Do you wish for us to retrieve him? Her assent was clear, even without the why she scribbled on the slate. Finally Charlotte returned with a small army of footmen and maids headed by Mrs Beaton and the butler. Elizabeth knelt down beside Lady Catherine. We will bring him to you. We both know he would never have harmed your daughter. 
Another tear trickled down Lady Catherine's cheek, and Elizabeth dabbed it dry, gasping in shock when Lady Catherine dropped the chalk and grabbed Elizabeth's hand brusquely. She squeezed Elizabeth's hand, wrinkling the handkerchief horribly in their clasp, with the ferocity of one unable to voice what she so desperately wished to communicate. Her eyes swam with tears, and Elizabeth sensed her regret, one emotion short of an apology, which Elizabeth never dreamed of coming from her ladyship, as well as gratitude, another surprising emotion from her ladyship, especially given that Elizabeth was the recipient. Colonel Fitzwilliam ensured Lady Catherine was transferred to the cot the footman carried as gently as a father laying his newborn child down for a nap. But once he had seen to his aunt's comfort, he headed for the corridor in a flash, shouting for his horse to be made ready without delay. Elizabeth ran after him. There was no way she would not accompany him. Mrs Beaton held the bonnet out to Elizabeth. I had the groom ready two horses when Mr Collins asked for the doctor. Elizabeth fumbled with the ribbon on the bonnet, attempting to tie it with shaking fingers as she ran down the stairs and across the entrance hall. There was a reason she preferred to walk over the countryside rather than ride over it on a horse. Swallowing her panic and extracting her fingers from the mess of ribbon at her chin, she ran down the steps to the courtyard after Colonel Fitzwilliam. The groom had a mounting block ready for her. Elizabeth clambered up it and settled herself into the saddle before fear rendered her useless. She ought not to have done it, but she looked down. It was such a long way down to the ground, her head spun and her pulse raced. But it was too late to ask if Lady Catherine's stables housed another horse, a shorter horse. Nor would Elizabeth spare the precious minutes it would take to exchange mounts when it was clear her horse had been selected for the speed with which its long legs would take her to William. She swallowed hard and focused on her goal. She placed William firmly in her mind's eye and recited the Kings of England to calm her nerves before they fluttered and strained in a manner worthy of her mother. Ready, the colonel asked. Too scared to speak past the panic lodged in her throat, Elizabeth nodded and held on for dear life when her horse bolted after Colonel Fitzwilliam's mount at full speed. Her heart leapt up into her throat and she weaved her fingers through the horse's mane, gripping the reins so tightly she lost feeling in her hands. She trusted her horse to keep up with the colonel, since the speed at which they travelled pulled tears out of the corners of her eyes and blurred her vision. The hoofbeats of the groom following them with an extra horse faded as she raced forward. She knew she had done a horrible job of tying her bonnet down when it flew off somewhere between Rosings and a path Colonel Fitzwilliam cut through to get to the lane before the constable's cart could reach Huntsford. She gritted her teeth when branches scratched at her arms and pulled at her hair. Elizabeth prayed they had successfully intercepted the cart before it reached the village when they slowed to a bone-jarring trot, thus putting an end to her hair-raising gallop on the back of a rather tall horse. All she could see was a blob ahead of her, but when the colonel stopped, she breathed a sigh of relief and dried her eyes as she slipped down the side of the horse to fall in a heap at its hooves. Scrambling to her feet before she was noticed, she brushed the dust from her skirt and, by sheer force of will, walked upright to the back of the cart, to William. She prayed the cart did not move as she grasped onto the iron bars holding William inside. It was the only thing preventing her from falling over until her legs could carry her weight reliably. If Elizabeth lived one hundred years more, she would never forget the image of him. He was surrounded by bars and shackles, but the joy in his eyes on seeing her granted him a dignity and a beauty that took her recently recovered breath away. She pulled on the lock in the vain hope it would spring loose. She heard the colonel speaking rather forcefully with the constable. She reached through the bars, and William knelt down on the other side, cradling her hands between his own. She would ride a thousand horses, for the man kissing her scratch knuckles. You are too kind to trifle with me, Elizabeth. If your feelings remain the same as they were when I last spoke with you at the parsonage, then tell me immediately. Do I have any reason for hope? he asked, his breath tickling her palm and making her legs wobble worse than the horse had. The tension of Lady Catherine's accusations against her, William's arrest, her ladyship's apoplexy, and the sight of the only man she could ever love, wrongfully imprisoned, 
tightened around her so that she laughed to loosen its hold. I do not have the custom of declaring my love on a whim or fancy. I love you, Fitzwilliam Darcy. There exists no other man whom I admire and respect as I do you. I would spend every waking hour in your company and dream of you in my sleep, lest I miss your company. Will you marry me? he asked. Yes, she answered, without hesitation. They clasped each other's hands through the bars, what she would not give for him to hold her in his arms, to taste his lips and twine her fingers through the curls at his neck, as she longed to do. Chapter 32 The colonel stormed around the corner, his complexion as red as a regimental coat. The constable appeared as if he wished to toss Colonel Fitzwilliam into the back of the cart with William. Elizabeth was in too good a humour to allow their dark moods to spoil her moment. She had said yes to Fitzwilliam Darcy, and nothing, not even a murder accusation, would wedge itself between them. "'What is the problem, gentlemen?' she asked lightly. Colonel Fitzwilliam poked his thumb in the direction of the constable. "'He will not release Darcy until the magistrate returns on the morrow.' The constable tightened his arms across his chest. "'I take my orders from the magistrate. If he were to learn I allowed a prisoner who confessed to the worst crime known to man to go free, he would be greatly displeased. When the people of Huntsford find out, I will lose their trust and their business.' His reasoning was solid, but so was Elizabeth's. She tilted her chin and chewed on her lip before speaking. "'I wonder how you will manage when it becomes known that Lady Catherine blames you for causing her apoplexy.' The constable took a step back. She had him. Elizabeth shrugged her shoulders. "'I imagine the magistrate holds Lady Catherine in high regard,' and would not take kindly to the threats your actions have caused her ladyship by depriving her of her favourite nephew in her time of need. Colonel Fitzwilliam nodded gravely, though Elizabeth saw a twinkle of laughter in his eyes. He said, He is the only one who can bring her comfort in her distress. I do not think that would be the case if she believed him guilty of killing her only daughter. Do you, good sir? The constable contorted his face and punched his palm. Oh, you put me in a difficult place. I would never want it to be said that I caused any harm to her ladyship, and yet I cannot let the prisoner go free until the real culprit reveals himself. I have to fulfil my duties to the people of Unsford. They trust me. William said, If you will allow me to return to Rosings, and I make it known I am still under suspicion that my aunt's influence is the only reason for my release, the real criminal may make himself manifest. His confidence in getting away with his crime may grow, and we will be there to see any missteps, which we would report to you directly. You swear you will not leave Rosings? William placed his hand over his heart. On my honour, and before these witnesses, I swear it. The constable grumbled as he unlocked the cart, the hinges of the bars squeaking in protest. I will let you go on the understanding you do not leave Rosings until this sordid business is brought to a satisfying conclusion for all. You must catch the real killer. For her ladyship's sake, I will guard my silence, but I cannot keep it secret much longer. This cart does not get much use, and several villagers saw me driving it out to the estate. William reassured him. It is as her ladyship would wish it. I thank you, and I will alert you to any progress we make in the discovery of the murderer. Elizabeth felt William press his hand against the small of her back as he guided her to the horses held by one of Lady Catherine's grooms. The cart clattered away and the groom handed the reins of the horse Elizabeth had ridden to William. "'Have you sent for the doctor?' he asked, while Elizabeth stared at the top of the saddle and mustered her courage for the ride awaiting her. Colonel Fitzwilliam told him of the measures they had taken to care for their Aunt Catherine as he swung his leg over his horse with the ease of one much accustomed to riding, unlike herself. Elizabeth's heart was already racing before William wrapped his hands around her waist to assist her onto the side saddle. "'I did not know you were such an accomplished horsewoman. There are few who can keep up with Richard,' he said, bursting with pride. A pride she did not deserve. "'You greatly exaggerate my talent, for I assure you I have none where horses are concerned.' I have not ridden a horse these many years. It was only my desperation to see you that enabled me to hang on. 
but now that you are here, I fear my courage is failing me. Just looking up at the saddle makes me dizzy. Had they not been in such a hurry to return to Lady Catherine, she would have suggested they walk to Rosings. She hated to disappoint William, but when his pride turned to a look of admiration, her honesty was justly rewarded. Elizabeth had never been so beautiful to Darcy as she was at that moment, with her hair dishevelled and curling wildly around her face, her bright eyes and rosy cheeks, and even the dirt gracing the front of her gown. Miss Bingley would have been appalled. Elizabeth would never back down from a challenge, and Darcy loved her all the more for it. We cannot afford to lose any time returning to my aunt. I fear walking is out of the question, but under the circumstances it is proper for a gentleman to come to the assistance of his lady. To the groom, he said, You may return this horse back to the stables. I will ensure Miss Bennet's safe return to Rosings on my horse. He held the reins out for the man to take. Before Elizabeth could fully comprehend what he intended to do, he swooped her off her feet and carried her in his arms to the waiting horse. Her gasp of surprise soon turned to one of delight, and she nearly undid Darcy when she snuggled against his chest and buried her face against his neck. He heard her breathe in and felt her breath tickle the tender flesh around his ear. She tightened her grasp around his neck when he lifted her onto the saddle and swung up behind her, nestling her in his lap, where she sighed contentedly like one of Georgiana's kittens. Dear Lord, he was on fire. He followed Richard mindlessly, his thoughts too consumed with the vixen in his lap, to focus on anything other than her. Fortunately, his cousin adjusted his pace, so they did not fall too far behind, and his occasional glances kept Darcy from doing anything entirely inappropriate, when Elizabeth's fingers twirled around the hair at his neck and tugged. They passed a narrow thicket of trees, and Darcy's restraint weakened with every step of the horse rocking Elizabeth against him. Her fingers had moved from his hair to his cravat, where she stroked the soft fabric and rubbed her cheek against it until he thought he would burst into flames. He did not see Elizabeth's bonnet until the horse stopped to nibble at it on the tree limb it dangled from. He leaned over to pluck it away from the tree, tugging the ribbon free and disappointing the horse. Elizabeth gasped. My poor bonnet! It was far nicer than the original, but its superiority did not spare it from a similar fate. Shall we reward our noble steed with an apple for finding it? The horse seemed to understand a treat was in store for him, and walked with more enthusiasm. Darcy smiled. He would replace the bonnet as many times as it was required, for the joy of seeing Elizabeth receive it. It was not lost on him how she tenderly attempted to smooth over the frayed straw and the creases in the ribbon. She looked up at him, and he rubbed his chin against her forehead, where the fine hair had escaped the confines of her pins and braids. I am not sorry for it. Your hair smells divine. He closed his eyes and inhaled, only opening them again, when he felt the sun warming them from the other side of the thicket. They were near the house now. Would that the house was farther away, and Aunt Catherine was in better health. He could have carried Elizabeth cradled against his chest as she was, all day, and still missed the feel of her when they had to part. Wrapping his hands around her waist, he helped her down from the horse, without jarring her too badly when her feet touched the ground. He would have stood with his hands around her waist, ensuring she did not topple over, for much longer, had she not reminded him of his duty. "'Your aunt,' she whispered, tugging his hand as she turned toward the house, where Richard waited for them at the top of the steps. "'I hope you did not suffer too greatly on our return to Rosings, Miss Bennet,' Richard teased, winking at Darcy. Elizabeth grinned devilishly. "'I rather liked it, and look forward to repeating the activity.' "'Lord help me,' Darcy mumbled. If he had been free to travel to Longbourn, he would have galloped there on his aunt's fastest mount to ask Mr. Bennet for his permission to marry Elizabeth that same day. "'Lord help us catch the murderer and be free of this mess before the magistrate returns on the morrow. He may not be as reasonable as the constable,' added Richard, charging into the house, ready for battle. Chapter 33 Mr. and Mrs. Collins greeted them in Aunt Catherine's bedchamber, amongst the hustle and bustle of Mrs. Beaton, directing the maids. 
Mrs. Collins ran to Elizabeth's side. Lizzie, I'm so glad you've returned with Mr. Darcy. Her ladyship is greatly agitated. Nothing we do calms her. Mr. Collins joined them, his appalled expression at the dishevelled appearance of his cousin clearly distressing him. My dear cousin Elizabeth, I do hope you did not suffer an accident. Perhaps you would wish to look in a mirror before approaching her ladyship. We do not want your appearance to cause her further distress. Darcy wanted to growl at Mr. Collins and his self-serving concern. Elizabeth looked perfect. Mrs. Collins clucked her tongue at her husband and smoothed Elizabeth's hair. Her ladyship will not mind, so long as she is surrounded by family and friends to offer her comfort. It soon became clear to Darcy that his aunt's greatest source of discomfort was, in fact, Mr. Collins. And yet he dismissed every attempt by Mrs. Jenkinson, Richard, Darcy, and even Mrs. Beaton to get him to leave. Mrs. Collins, being of a more practical mind, took advantage of the doctor's arrival to suggest they depart for the parsonage to return at a more convenient time for her ladyship. Mr. Collins rebutted vehemently, "'How could we possibly leave Lady Catherine when it is our duty, nay, our great privilege, to bestow upon her the same kindness she has granted us with her patronage? No, my dear Mrs. Collins, we are to be at her ladyship's disposal at all hours of the day and night, so we might offer our humble comfort, and thus assist in her recovery.' Mrs. Collins replied, with a smile pasted on her face. "'Would it not be more convenient for Lady Catherine to send for us at her convenience, rather than impose on her hospitality?' Elizabeth agreed with her, but Mr. Collins disregarded their sensibleness. "'Surely it is not an imposition when we are more qualified than anyone else to see to her proper care, although I can understand why she would not wish for so many gentlemen to be present in her bedchamber.' He looked at Darcy and Richard, as if to suggest they were the imposition, not him. Mr. Collins' face lit up as an idea occurred to him, an idea with which Darcy would most assuredly disagree. Clasping his hands together, his face shining with delight, he said, "'I have the perfect solution, my dearest Mrs. Collins. You must stay here with her ladyship. There are several advantages to the arrangement.' You will have the reassurance of seeing to her ladyship's proper care, which will be a great source of relief to you, I am certain, and you will be able to send for me should her ladyship request my presence. Not that I presume Lady Catherine would honour me by calling me to her side during her time of illness, but I suggest the possibility out of my humble desire to be of service to her ladyship when she has been so kind as to bless me with her benevolence." Mrs. Collins seemed to be at a loss for words, but it was plain to everyone except her husband that she did not wish to stay on as a nursemaid. Elizabeth said, "'Her ladyship has a great number of maids to tend to her, as well as the company of Mrs. Jenkinson to offer her comfort. I also will stay until her ladyship wishes for me to leave. There is no need for Mrs. Collins—' Mr. Collins waved Elizabeth's suggestion away with a flutter of his hand. "'Nonsense, Cousin Elizabeth. "'There is no one better qualified than Mrs. Collins "'to ease Lady Catherine's discomfort.' "'Darcy was well aware Mr. Collins never lost an opportunity "'to gain favour in his patroness's eyes, "'but his insertion of his own wife into Aunt Catherine's household "'was no more than a shocking act of ambitious presumption. "'Elizabeth closed her eyes and shook her head. "'Darcy watched Mrs. Collins,' confident she would present an irrefutably sound reason not to stay, while still preserving a thread of her husband's dignity. "'Very well,' she said. "'Far be it from me to deny our esteemed patroness of the comfort with which I can provide her. But allow me to return to the parsonage, to fetch some items for my own use if I am to stay here. Is that agreeable to you, Mr. Darcy?' Taken aback by her willingness to comply with her husband's unreasonable wish, Darcy answered, "'You have always been welcome at Rosings, Mrs. Collins. I will not deprive my aunt of your company now.' Truth be told, he agreed more for Elizabeth's sake than for his aunt's. If Elizabeth planned to stay until the time agreed upon by herself and Aunt Catherine, then she would need a friend. And Darcy would need a more reliable chaperone than Richard, if he were to reside under the same roof 
with the woman who had agreed to become his wife, the woman who proved her superior character in the tender care and thoughtful entertainment of the woman who had only ever treated her with the greatest condescension and haughty disdain, the future Mrs. Darcy. Lady Catherine was restless all evening, only calming when Colonel Fitzwilliam agreed to stand guard in her room so she might attempt to sleep. It was early the following morning when Elizabeth tapped lightly on her door, bringing a tray of coffee and a light repast for the Colonel, Charlotte and Mrs. Jenkinson, who had insisted on remaining behind as well. Colonel Fitzwilliam answered the door, looking as alert at dawn as he had at dusk the day before. Mrs. Jenkinson stirred in her chair behind him, rising to check on her ladyship and joining them at the table where Elizabeth set the tray. Elizabeth asked, Was her ladyship able to rest during the night? Colonel Fitzwilliam said, well, She cried out several times, but I could not understand what she said. If she did rest, it was not the healing sleep from which she would most benefit. William entered the room, a maid bringing a heavily laden breakfast tray behind him. He stopped short when he saw them seated around the table. It appears Miss Elizabeth has already seen to your appetites. Well, allow me to add more delights from Cook's kitchen to the spread before you. He signalled for the maid to set the tray down. Clearly, Cook favoured Darcy over herself, if trays were to be compared. Lady Catherine rustled in her bed, and William went over to her, his low voice speaking gently to her. "'Is it time for her medicine?' Elizabeth asked. Mrs Jenkinson buttered the piece of bread she pinched between her fingers. "'Not for another two hours, miss.' She set the butter knife down, her mouth pinching together and relaxing several times before she added, "'Miss Bennet, I find it incumbent upon me to apologise to you.' "'Really?' Elizabeth asked in surprise. Colonel Fitzwilliam stirred sugar into his coffee and sat back in his chair as if he were watching an entertaining scene at the theatre. Charlotte sat quietly and observed over the cup of coffee from which she sipped. "'Whatever for, Mrs Jenkinson?' Elizabeth could venture why Mrs Jenkinson would apologise. It was not every day she was accused of murder and manipulation, but she asked all the same. To her credit, Mrs Jenkinson looked her squarely in the eye and spoke clearly. "'I assumed you would replace me, and I spoke bitterly to you when I felt myself threatened. I realise now that my anger was misdirected.' Elizabeth raised her eyebrows. She would have thought Mrs Jenkinson would apologise for accusing her of murder, rather than the matter that appeared like a trifle in comparison. But an apology was an apology, and Elizabeth accepted it. Mrs Jenkinson looked into the bottom of her cup, searching for something Elizabeth doubted she would find there, but hoped she discovered all the same. After a deep breath, the elderly woman added, it was very wrong of me to accuse you of any wrong against Mr. Berg. I acted out of an unjustified sense of vengeance, and I encouraged her ladyship to act against you as well. I am sorry. Now that was more like it. Elizabeth's heart softened toward Mrs. Jenkinson, who had no doubt suffered silently for decades in the company of Mr. Berg. Elizabeth said sincerely, Then it is forgotten as far as I am concerned. We have all suffered enough. Darcy met her gaze from across the room, and she recalled a comment he had made many months ago at Netherfield Park. It seemed as if her whole lifetime had passed since then. Elizabeth had commented on his resentful nature, and he had replied, My good opinion, once lost, is lost forever. Elizabeth may have extended her forgiveness to Mrs Jenkinson willingly, but she did not expect William to overlook the woman's faults. Nor would Elizabeth so easily forgive a sin committed against someone she loved as she could against herself. Then again, while she had forgiven Mrs Jenkinson, Elizabeth would never trust her. Was that what William had meant? She watched him treat his aunt, the very woman who had imprisoned them together at Rosings, and had been willing to send her away to the jail, with a kindness and decency born of a true gentleman, and Elizabeth understood him better, it was not so much resentment as deservedly withheld trust, and she respected him all the more for it. Lady Catherine was fully awake now, and kept looking toward the breakfast table, attempting to say something. 
Elizabeth went over to her. Looking at William, Elizabeth commented, Perhaps she is hungry. Let us prop her up on her pillows. The doctor said she could be spoon-fed broth and tea. She sent one of the maids to the kitchen for some bone broth. If Lady Catherine's huff was any indication, Elizabeth had misunderstood her disquietude. She muttered a string of gibberish, her eyes fixed toward the breakfast table. Elizabeth produced the slate and chalk, but Lady Catherine contrarily shoved it away with her good hand. She did not resist their efforts to prop her up in her bed, but her manner grew increasingly agitated as time passed. Mrs Jenkinson suggested, "'Her ladyship is a great lover of music. If the servants bring the pianoforte into the next room, perhaps one of you ladies would play for her.' In short order, the instrument was placed in Lady Catherine's sitting-room, and the door between the two rooms was left open. Elizabeth would not be able to escape making a performance, but she could delay it. With the delight Lady Catherine took in criticising her lack of skill on the instrument, it would not be calming to the lady anyway. Charlotte, will you please play for us? I have no doubt but that your steady and consistent practice on the instrument has improved your skills far beyond my own. I doubt that, but I have been known to calm my listeners to the point of slumber, and so I will indulge your request, Charlotte said with a smile, as she seated herself on the bench and placed her fingers on the ivory keys. Charlotte's words were prophetic. Within five minutes, Mrs Jenkinson's chin fell against her chest, and her lips puffed out the occasional deep breath of one in a sound sleep. A chilling sensation creeped up the back of Elizabeth's neck, and she turned to Lady Catherine. The lady's eyes glinted as she looked between Elizabeth and the open doorway leading to the performer who had charmed Mrs Jenkinson into a deep slumber with the stroke of a few keys. The lady whose alibi was no longer as solid as Elizabeth had believed it to be. A lady who had sense enough to know the evil works of Mr Berg and had endured listening to the high praise of the undeserving lady from the mouth of her own husband. A woman who had access to Mrs Jenkinson's apothecary chest and could have slipped away unnoticed to place the laudanum in Mr. Berg's medicine bottle. A thinking lady, who would never have agreed to her husband's unreasonable request that she care for Lady Catherine, unless she had her own reason to agree to stay. Charlotte. Chapter 34 The longer Elizabeth considered the possibility of Charlotte poisoning Mr. Berg, the more the clues added up, and the more Elizabeth wished to prove them wrong. Charlotte was her friend. Had Mr Collins made her so miserable in the few months they had been married that she would act against the principal source of her torment? Elizabeth did not want to believe it, but her desire to discover the truth was stronger than her need to conceal it for the sake of a friend. Lady Catherine knew, a fact of which, if it proved true, they would never hear the end. Until now she had refused to use the slate. Elizabeth guessed she did not wish to write where Charlotte could potentially see it, the effort to write taking her ladyship a good deal longer than normal. An idea formed in Elizabeth's mind, and she carried it out as soon as Charlotte finished playing her piece. Would it please her ladyship to have a book read? One of us could easily fetch one from the library. Both the Colonel and William rose to their feet, quick to offer their assistance. Elizabeth smiled at them. I do not believe your aunt trusts either of you to make a proper selection. Is that not so, your ladyship? Lady Catherine grunted, which was all the affirmation Elizabeth needed to continue. Would it please your ladyship for me to open the curtains to better see to read? And shall we entrust Mrs Collins with the task of selecting something appropriate? Charlotte nodded. I have just the thing in mind, she said, as she departed from the room. As soon as the door had clicked behind her, Elizabeth turned to Lady Catherine. Do you know who killed your daughter? William and Richard fell silent from their conversation, their complete attention on their aunt. Lady Catherine lifted her hand and waved it in the air. Elizabeth was ready. She held the slate in front of Lady Catherine, handing her the chalk. The letters were legible enough. Mrs Collins. Elizabeth's heart sank to her toes. A comment Charlotte had made earlier returned to her. She had implied that a gentleman being charged for the crime of murder would not be made to suffer much. 
knowing how disagreeable she believed William to be, how Elizabeth had despised him for reasons she had revealed to Charlotte. Had her friend thought to cast the blame away from herself and Mrs. Jenkinson onto William? There was only one way to find out. Who told you of Mr. Darcy's proposal at the parsonage? That had been the defining moment that had set Lady Catherine against her own nephew. Charlotte would have been well aware of how her ladyship would take his proposal to anyone other than Mr. Berg as a personal affront. Lady Catherine raised her quavering hand and tapped the slate. Elizabeth sighed. Mrs. Collins. Yes, is there any other task you wish for me to see to? Charlotte asked from the doorway, followed by the newly arrived Mr. Collins. In one smooth motion, Elizabeth rubbed her sleeve over the slate and prayed her friend had not seen it or heard more of their conversation than the mention of her name. Elizabeth forced a smile. You returned in good time, Charlotte. How could you possibly have made it down to the library and back so quickly? Mr. Collins was good enough to lend us his copy of Fordyce's sermons. Mr. Collins bowed. I would do anything to see to the pleasure of her ladyship. Charlotte grimaced as she watched her husband fawn over his patroness. William stood pulling out his timepiece. I shall send for my aunt's tea. It is nearly time for her to take her medicine. Charlotte handed the book of sermons to Elizabeth, interrupting Mr. Collins' soliloquy on Lady Catherine's improved state and praise for her strong constitution. You have a much better reading voice than I do, she explained. Elizabeth began reading from the first page, hoping she did the passages justice, while her mind was anywhere but on the print covering the page. When the maid entered the room with the tray, Charlotte rose to receive her, smoothing her apron and ensuring that her back was to them. If she was going to attempt to harm Lady Catherine, now was her perfect opportunity. Did she suspect her ladyship knew? William and the Colonel rose from their chairs, but Elizabeth motioned for them to sit back down. If Charlotte truly was a murderess, they had no option but to catch her red-handed. She was too clever to admit to a crime unless they had proof. With Lady Catherine's apoplexy, Charlotte would have a solid alibi were she to succeed in poisoning her with an overdose of laudanum, as it appeared she had done to Mr. Berg. Nobody would assume it was anything other than failing health and despair over the death of her own daughter. Charlotte could get away with it all, unless they caught her. Elizabeth continued reading, looking at William and nodding in an attempt to communicate that she did indeed have a plan. Charlotte turned toward them. Here, your ladyship, this will soon put you right, just as the doctor said. Elizabeth snapped her book closed and set it on the bed beside Lady Catherine. Holding her hand out, she said, Look at the steam rising off the tea. I do believe the doctor was explicit in his instructions that the tea not be overly hot, lest it diminish the effect of the medicine and burn her ladyship. Allow me, Charlotte, I will test to ensure it is the right temperature. It was not the best excuse, but it was the best she could conjure up in so short a time. Charlotte pulled the cup and saucer out of Elizabeth's reach. Uh-oh, so there was something in the tea. Elizabeth stretched forward. If you do not wish for me to do it, then perhaps you will? There is no need. If you believe it to be too hot, it will only need a couple of minutes to cool. Mr Collins offered his opinion. My dear, we must not do anything to exacerbate her ladyship's condition. It is not an unreasonable request, and I praise my dear cousin for her delicacy and consideration toward one so far superior to those entrusted with her care. Lady Catherine exclaimed, the features she could arrange frowning in a notably displeased expression. William translated for them. My aunt does not wish to wait. If you will not test it or permit Miss Elizabeth to, then perhaps you will allow me. Charlotte pulled away from them. Elizabeth could no longer deny the possibility of her friend's involvement in Anderberg's death. Now, all that remained for Charlotte was to claim it had been an accident. Although, with whatever Charlotte had added to Lady Catherine's cup, her friend was beyond that. Elizabeth stepped forward, her hand out. Come, Charlotte, this is silly. If you are concerned about my health, I only mean to test it against my lips. 
She reached forward to grab the saucer, the damning evidence within her reach. Elizabeth's fingers touched the smooth porcelain, and she only had to pinch her thumb on top of the saucer to hold it when Charlotte thrust it to the floor. The delicate cup shattered against the saucer, and their evidence disappeared into the carpet. Elizabeth's worst fear was confirmed, but now she had no proof. Mr Collins was all apologies for his clumsy wife, but one look from Charlotte miraculously silenced him. Why did you do it? Elizabeth asked, in the ensuing silence, her mercy tempered by the knowledge that her friend was willing to allow William to take the fall for her evil deed. Do what? Charlotte crossed her arms over her apron. She would play the innocent until the end, would she? Elizabeth was in no mood for games. Tell me it was an accident, and I will believe you, she implored. Lizzie, I have no clue what you mean. Charlotte patted her apron with one hand, just as Lydia had done as a child when she attempted to sneak a puppy into the house. Elizabeth wanted to believe Charlotte was innocent, but the woman standing before her was not the same girl with whom she had been raised. The lady she had known was kind and practical. She would never dream of taking someone's life, if for no other reason than for her incredible ability to foresee the consequences and wisely choose to avoid them. The woman before her was hard and unwilling to admit to the logical conclusion everyone else in the room had drawn, except her clueless husband. Elizabeth lunged forward, plunging her hand into Charlotte's apron and clasping her hand around a glass object in a manner that would have made Lydia proud. Turning away from Charlotte, she held the bottle up for everyone to see. It was an empty bottle of laudanum. Chapter 35 William took the bottle from Elizabeth. How do you explain this, Mrs Collins? he asked. Mr Collins visibly blanched. His eyes bulged in disbelief. Charlotte narrowed her eyes. I suffered from a headache last night. Elizabeth shook her head. That is your laudanum bottle. It has the label of the Meriton apothecary on it. It is the same one you offered to me a week ago when I suffered a headache. It was nearly full then. William said, You have not complained of a headache, nor has your behaviour suggested you took laudanum recently. Mr Collins, to your knowledge, has anyone in your household used the laudanum during this past week? Charlotte's head snapped over to William. That is not necessary. The Colonel said, I will send for the constable immediately. Mrs Collins, you have a great deal to answer for. Charlotte turned on Elizabeth. How could you do this to me, Lizzie? Mr Collins stood, balancing against the chair he had sat on to steady himself. Charlotte, my dear, tell them it is not true. My wife would never bring harm to a lady who has graced us with the benefit of her patronage when we are too humble for her to even notice. So kind and good was she, with all the airs of one born into the aristocracy. Charlotte cut him off. Mr Berg was a menace. Did you know she paid special attention to my little sister, with the intent of asking her to be her companion? Am I to be pleased with her attentions, when it would bring my sister lower than the station into which she was born? My sister! She stabbed her finger against her chest. Maria is young and has good prospects for making an excellent match. Mr Berg was nothing but a selfish, manipulative harpy. But she did not ask Maria to be her companion. She asked me argued Elizabeth, ignoring Mr Collins' gasps. Charlotte scoffed. I did you a favour. I did the world a favour. I did not think it would happen so quickly. I only wanted her to return to her sickly state. I never meant to kill her. But she was the one stupid enough not to notice how full her bottle was when the others were nearly empty. Elizabeth was furious, but Lady Catherine was as white as the sheets on her bed from where she glared at Charlotte. You did nobody any favours, Charlotte. It is not your duty to decide who lives and who dies. You would defend her when she's done nothing but connive against nearly everyone in this room. This is not like you, Charlotte. You have always been one to take responsibility for your own actions. But you were willing to allow Mr Darcy to take the blame for something you knew him not to have done. I could not allow Mrs Jenkinson to take the blame and she's done nothing but endure the condescension and haughty benefaction of the de Burgs for longer than me. 
You said it yourself, Lizzie. Mr. Darcy is every bit as haughty as his aunt. And it would do him a deal of good to be humbled before his peers. His suffering would only have been temporary. But he is innocent, Elizabeth exclaimed. Charlotte scoffed. What do you care about Mr. Darcy? My maid told me how firmly and thoroughly you refused his offer of marriage. The tenderness Elizabeth held for William calmed her. Appearances are deceiving, and first impressions are often wrong. You know that better than anyone, Charlotte, and you encourage me to be more reasonable in my judgments. It has not been my opinion for long, but I feel it so strongly now that it may as well be a lifelong belief that Mr. Darcy is the only man I could ever love, the only man I will marry. Mr. Collins interjected, "'And we are honoured to be attached to such an honourable family. "'Her ladyship is everything kind and beneficent and—' "'Charlotte scoffed, thrusting her fists up in the air. "'You cannot imagine what it has been like to hear my husband, "'my very own mate, belittle my looks, "'my abilities to run our home, "'and every aspect of my character, "'in comparison to the incomparable Mr. Berg. "'Sarcasm dripped from her tongue as she continued.' I have been shamed and humiliated at the hands of a man who promised before God to love and cherish me. As long as we are under Lady Catherine's patronage, I have no hope of an end to my torment. I only did what I had to. Elizabeth heard the chalk sliding over the slate. William read Lady Catherine's writing aloud. My aunt intends to write to the Archbishop of Canterbury immediately, to have Mr. Collins' position as the rector of her estate revoked. You will be tried at the Assizes, where your sin will be laid bare. However, while it would please my aunt to have you hang, I will use my influence to see you are transported far away from here, where your conscience will prevent you from acting in such a manner again, and the constant presence of Mr. Collins will remind you not to interfere in the lives of others, when you have been unsuccessful in procuring your own happiness. I believe that will be punishment enough. Mr. Collins sank onto his chair, for the first time in his life, unable to summon a compliment. It occurred to Elizabeth that Charlotte would have to find contentment in her situation, or else Mr. Collins had best be careful when taking his tea. Lady Catherine made her displeasure at William's addition to her plans known, but he paid her no heed, nor would he have bent to her will had she been in possession of her cane and had the strength to thrash it through the air in her normal fashion. Mr. Collins had the misfortune of being present to see his wife arrested. Instead of being interested in her welfare, as a good husband should, he feared the loss of his position more. Had he thought to take consolation in the ending of his marriage, he was assured that as the lawful husband of Mrs. Collins, he would have to accompany her wherever the court deemed to send her, where they would be forced to keep each other company and continue their miserable union. Longbourn would never belong to Mr. Collins. He wailed at the injustice of his changed fortune and humiliation, while Charlotte watched him with a cold, distant demeanour. Turning to Elizabeth, she said, "'I am not sorry I helped Mr. Berg out of this world. My decision was not as convenient to me as I had believed it would be.' She looked between Elizabeth and William, who glued himself to her side. "'I wish you all the happiness of which I have been deprived.' Her words were too bitter to be taken sincerely. With that, Charlotte went down the steps of Rosings and clambered into the cart that would take her to prison to await her trial. Elizabeth was grateful for William's understanding as she cried at the top of the steps for her friend. His warm arm wrapped around her shoulders and his heartbeat, so firm and steady under her ear, made her determine never to take one moment of her happiness for granted. It was a rare gift. They would not always see eye to eye. They would have struggles. But she would always remember Charlotte when they arose, and she would choose happiness over what she perceived as right every time. Colonel Fitzwilliam helped the constable calm Mr Collins enough to convince him to join them in the cart. Already Lady Catherine had ordered the Collinses' belongings to be packed in preparation for their long journey, wherever that may prove to be. The colonel rejoined them at the top of the steps, and the three of them stood in silence, while the best of spring displayed its beauty before them. "'Let us cross the courtyard before we return to our duties,' William suggested. 
holding his hand out for Elizabeth. Birds sang without a trouble in the world, and a soft breeze carried the gentle perfume of the season's early blooms through the air. The sun warmed Elizabeth as much as William's touch, melting her worries away until she could imagine a time in the not-so-distant future when she would feel free to enjoy the blessings bestowed upon her to the full, without loss or anxiety to lessen its potency. The conservatory stood before them, the sun glinting off the glass. Elizabeth smiled in pleasure when William altered their path to walk in its direction. It was the colonel who spoke first. Now that the mystery surrounding Anne's demise has been resolved, do you plan to return to your family, Miss Bennet? You are free to go. William's hand tightened around her fingers, and Elizabeth knew her answer. Stopping so she could see both gentlemen, she said, I do not wish to distress her ladyship further by failing to uphold the agreement we made and agreed upon. I will stay the additional fortnight I had promised her. Colonel Fitzwilliam laughed. You aim to benefit from your association with her household and her patronage, do you? It seems to me you have found an excellent match without the benefit of her ladyship's assistance. My decision is entirely self-serving, I assure you. She would not part from William's company a moment before she had to. Elizabeth's smile was not large enough to convey the immensity of her happiness when William wrapped his arms around her, enveloping her with all the qualities she now associated with him. Love, safety, acceptance, passion. He leaned down until his forehead touched hers, and she lost herself in the depths of his brown eyes. She said yes this time, Richard. Now... Kindly go away, so I may properly kiss my intended. Elizabeth heard the colonel's chuckle and the scuff of his boots as he departed from their company. William pulled her into the conservatory. The fountain trickled serenely, and the flowers surrounded them with bursts of colour, while the fruit trees tinged the air with citrus. As pleasant as the scene was to her senses, it paled in comparison to her anticipation of what she knew would come. William touched his lips against hers, and he tenderly, and then thoroughly, kissed her until she thought she would never catch her breath. Epilogue Colonel Fitzwilliam had his hands full over the next fortnight. His duties as a chaperone were his penitence for having caused, albeit inadvertently, the biggest bone of contention between the happily engaged couple, and Elizabeth took her role as the executor of his punishment as seriously as William did. To her credit, Lady Catherine merely looked the other way with pinched lips when William and Elizabeth would get lost in each other's eyes, smile at each other too long, or allow their fingers to linger over each other's every time they took turns passing the book to read to her ladyship. Her first coherent speech happened one week after her apoplexy. "'You are fools! You make my stomach ill with your sweet speeches and manners,' she had said in essence." Elizabeth had taken it as a compliment and had congratulated her ladyship on the improvement of her health, to which Lady Catherine rolled her eyes and huffed. The day to depart for London had finally arrived, and Lady Catherine sat in a chair in the entrance hall of her grand home to oversee the proceedings. Mrs Jenkinson stuck to her side like a burr, often annoying the nurse William had hired to oversee his aunt's care. Several times Lady Catherine had to restore order with her cane, which she now had strength enough to hold, although feebly. Her ladyship's voice did not carry the same bite it had previous to her apoplexy, but she still managed to make her demands and complaints heard and understood. She put her cane to good use, jabbing it against the floor to command attention, when her voice failed or she felt she was not the centre of attention. The final trunk was carried to William's carriage when Elizabeth heard the clack of Lady Catherine's cane echo through the hall. She turned to the great lady with a smile as William and the colonel stood before their aunt. Strangely enough, Elizabeth would miss the cantankerous woman. Slowly, Lady Catherine slurred, You will return soon. Her command was softened by the anxiety in her eyes. Elizabeth had learned that while Lady Catherine did not know how to show affection to her family, she did love them in her own way. She would be lonely in her empty house. It was, Elizabeth had deduced, the reason why her ladyship employed the unreasonable amount of servants she did. 
Elizabeth leaned closer to her ladyship. Never fear, Lady Catherine, we shall plague you with our presence before the end of the year, and we shall add Miss Darcy to our party. Would that please you? Lady Catherine huffed at the implication that she could be pleased by anything at all, much less anything suggested by Elizabeth. She replied, I suppose I cannot avoid it. With a mischievous crooked smile, William said, Georgiana wishes to congratulate her clever aunt for discerning the identity of the villain in our midst before anyone else. Elizabeth bit her lips together to keep from laughing at the haughty air Lady Catherine assumed at the compliment. She never lost an opportunity to point out how she had been the first to suspect Charlotte, although as the days passed, her memory had tricked her to believe she had known all along. It was only because of her insufferable nephews and that insolent girl that she had been prevented from capturing the culprit much sooner. It had nothing to do with the laudanum bottle she had seen Charlotte slip into her apron pocket, certainly not. Her insults no longer offended Elizabeth. In fact, she took them as permission to make her replies to the great lady bolder and shockingly more opinionated. The nephews kissed their aunt, as was their duty, and Elizabeth was only a little taken by surprise when Lady Catherine squeezed her hand before they finally departed. She noted how her ladyship remained in her chair at the top of the steps, smacking at the footman who approached to take her away, until their carriage disappeared from her view. William said, She likes you, you know. Elizabeth laughed. Despite herself, I dare say. The ride to London had never passed so quickly as that one did, and planning a wedding would do that. Before she was ready, the carriage lurched to a stop in front of her uncle's house, where she hoped she might be able to spend a few days while she spent countless hours planning her trousseau at the draper's, with Jane at her side. Uncle Gardiner, undoubtedly moved by the elegance of the carriage in front of his home, insisted the gentlemen inside partake of a repast so he could properly thank them for conveying his niece safely to London after introductions had been performed. Jane met Elizabeth at the gate, looking more beautiful than she ever had. She did not need to say anything for Elizabeth to know she bore the best of news. She whispered it into Elizabeth's ear while they embraced each other with an enthusiasm in proportion to the glad tidings they bore. "'I should have written to you, Lizzie, but I wanted to tell you in person.' She squeezed Elizabeth so tightly, something in her back popped. "'I am engaged to Charles Bingley.' They rocked each other back and forth and cried tears of delight. "'How did this happy end come about?' asked Elizabeth, stepping out of Jane's embrace and taking her hands as they followed the others inside the house. "'He said he received notice from a friend that I was in town. Can you imagine it, Lizzie? He did not even know I was here all this time.' Elizabeth looked at William, who had by now met Aunt Gardiner, and was discovering the many acquaintances they had in common from her years living near Pemberley. It filled her with pride to see how warmly he was received by her relatives, and to hear his charming replies and interested inquiries. How she adored him! Not only did he make her happier than she had ever been, but he had managed to reunite Jane with Mr Bingley. They were led into the parlour, where they were met with an extraordinary sight. Uncle Gardiner waved his arms over the room for them to greater appreciate the height and width of the bandboxes covering the table. "'Now that you have arrived, perhaps you can explain why I received this delivery today.' He wiggled his eyes at William, who coloured slightly. Uncle was no fool. Elizabeth clasped her hands together. "'Oh, William, you did not!' She rushed over to the table and opened the first box. With a hearty laugh, she held it up for all to see. Colonel Fitzwilliam understood the joke and explained for the benefit of Elizabeth's relatives. And my cousin had the misfortune of crushing one of Miss Elizabeth's bonnets. This is his way of recompensing for her loss. As Elizabeth opened another bandbox to display the same straw bonnet with primroses at the side, Uncle Gardiner said, Mr Darcy does not believe in doing anything in halves, I see. Uncle's merriment spurred him to invite William and Colonel Fitzwilliam to join them for dinner, and Elizabeth thought she would burst with gladness. After looking at three bonnets, she set them gently back inside their boxes and replaced the lids. Thank you, William. That got some looks. 
To be fair, she had been on the receiving end of several side glances since their arrival at her family's home, but she had not truly noticed them until then. Elizabeth blushed, while William explained, "'Miss Bennet is not the only one with good news. I have asked Miss Elizabeth for her hand in marriage, and she has accepted my offer. It is my intention to write to Longbourn on the morrow to ask Mr Bennet for his permission.' Uncle Gardiner smacked William on the back in his unbridled excitement. "'Where Mrs. Bennet will ensure you receive a favourable reply. There will be rejoicing at Longbourn such as you've never experienced, Mr. Darcy. And it will be a merry crowd around our dinner table tonight.' After the ensuing congratulatory remarks and happy chatter had subsided, William looked at her. "'You've not finished,' he said, his eyes flickering over to the bandboxes. Elizabeth was intrigued. There were twelve boxes in total, and every single one she had opened had contained the same straw bonnet with a blue ribbon and fresh primroses. Chewing on her lip, she resumed her search, uncertain what she looked for, but knowing it must be something special for William to suggest she continue looking. He was all surprises. It was in the last box. Tucked inside the bonnet was a velvet case. It was heavy, and she held it in her hands for several seconds, revelling in the anticipation of opening it. William approached her. You see, I seem to have acquired a talent for ruining your bonnets, and I wish to ensure you are always as beautifully adorned as I see you. She opened it, and gasped at the sapphires and diamonds sparkling in her hands. The perfect image of the rosettes on her bonnet, only these would never be crushed, nor fade in beauty with the passing of time. Had it been in the window of the shop, she would have envied the owner who would adorn her locks with such a beautiful arrangement. William took it from her hand and gently placed the comb in her hair, his fingers lingering to place it just so. Aunt Gardner and Jane rushed to her, their shared happiness branding this moment, this gift from William, forever on her heart and mind. They had a great deal to discuss in the time between their arrival and William's return with the Colonel to dine, time which they filled well, and during which Uncle Gardiner invited Mr Bingley to join them for dinner. Elizabeth had prepared herself to explain her change of heart regarding Mr Darcy to her family. They knew very well she had not approved of him. But the hours passed by, and she had begun to think nobody would ask, when Uncle Gardiner finally voiced the question she had known would come. "'There is one thing I do not understand,' he began." Pray forgive me for bringing up a delicate subject. I only ask because I'm convinced it has a satisfying and no doubt diverting reply. My dear niece, how is it possible for you to go from such an intense dislike of Mr Darcy to being engaged to him? Elizabeth looked at William with a large smile. William spoke through his grin. Perhaps I may offer a reply. It was a conspiracy of fate and misspeaking but well-meaning relatives. He looked directly at Colonel Fitzwilliam, who answered with a good-natured salute. Guilty as charged, but it would seem that despite my interference, the end result has worked toward their happiness, and so I cannot be very sorry for it, but will take credit for their joyous union. How very Lady Catherine of you, Elizabeth teased. William taunted him. I suppose you knew we were a match all along. There was no sound Elizabeth loved more than William's laughter when he surrendered to it. Soon, everyone at the table shared in his unbridled joy. It was, Elizabeth thought, as she smiled at the happy faces surrounding the dining-room table, a conspiracy. But if life conspired to match her with Mr Darcy, far be it from her to complain. This has been The Elizabeth Conspiracy, A Pride and Prejudice Variation, Mysteries and Matrimony. Written by Jennifer Joy. Narrated by Stevie Zimmerman. Copyright 2017 by Jennifer Joy Ramirez. Production copyright by Jennifer Joy Ramirez. Thank you for listening to The Elizabeth Conspiracy. Did it keep you on your toes? Did you guess who the culprit was? I just knew it was Mrs. Jenkinson until I got to the end. Then Bad Charlotte revealed herself in a shocking twist and it all clicked. The pianoforte, the bottles, Mr. Collins' incessant compliments to another woman. 
I had put them there without understanding why until Charlotte told me she was sick of playing second fiddle to evil Anne. I hope you were as surprised as I was. Every writing session is an opportunity for an author to sharpen their skills. And in this book, my 11th, I really wanted the setting to come alive so that you could feel like you were immersed in it. A lot of work went into describing Rosings and its surroundings. And it was during this research that I got to meet an interesting character, one Antonio Vario. He was an Italian Baroque artist who spent much of his life, over 30 years, working for English monarchs and the ruling classes. He was commissioned to paint murals on the walls and ceilings of some of England's most visited and celebrated historic houses, such as Chatsworth's house. Here's the great staircase at Chatsworth house and a closer look at the ceiling above painted in 1691. His work can still be seen at Windsor Castle and Hampton Court, like this staircase. Fit for a king, isn't it? Surely such a prominent figure of the time would have inspired exuberance and grandeur within Rosings halls. If it was grand enough for the king, then maybe it would be good enough for a great proficient like Lady Catherine de Bourgh. So what do you think of this ceiling painting at Windsor Castle? Does this project an image of pious magnificence? I can't help but think that Lady Catherine would approve. I hope you enjoyed the Elizabeth Conspiracy and this peek behind the scenes. If you did, then please click like on this video. Do you love Pride and Prejudice audiobooks? Then please subscribe so you're the first to know when I have a new audiobook available that you can listen to here for free. Until the next audiobook then, bye!